Chapter 1 of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Nelson. A Voyage to Arcturus. Chapter 1 The Seance. On a March evening, at eight o'clock, Backhouse, the medium, a fast-rising star in the psychic world, was ushered into the study at Prolance, the Hampstead residence of Montague Fall. The room was illuminated only by the light of a blazing fire. The host, eyeing him with indolent curiosity, got up and the usual conventional greetings were exchanged. Having indicated an easy-chair before the fire to his guest, the South American merchant sank back again into his own. The electric light was switched on. Fall's prominent, clear-cut features, metallic-looking skin, and general air of bored impassiveness did not seem greatly to impress the medium, who was accustomed to regard men from a special angle. Backhouse, on the contrary, was a novelty to the merchant. As he tranquilly studied him through half-closed lids and the smoke of a cigar, he wondered how this little, thick-set person with the pointed beard contrived to remain so fresh and sane in appearance in view of the morbid nature of his occupation. "'Do you smoke?' drawled Fall, by way of starting the conversation. "'No? Then will you take a drink?' "'Not at present, I thank you.' A pause. "'Everything is satisfactory. The materialization will take place.' I have no reason to doubt it. That's good, for I would not like my guest to be disappointed. I have your check written out in my pocket. Afterward will do quite well. Nine o'clock was the time specified, I believe. I fancy so. The conversation continued to flag. Fall sprawled in his chair and remained apathetic. Would you care to hear what arrangements I have made? I am unaware that any are necessary, beyond chairs for your guests. I mean the decoration of the séance room, the music, and so forth." Backhouse stared at his host. "'But this is not a theatrical performance.' "'That's correct. Perhaps I ought to explain. There will be ladies present, and ladies, you know, are aesthetically inclined.' "'In that case I have no objection. I only hope they will enjoy the performance to the end." He spoke rather dryly. "'Well, that's all right, then,' said Fall. Flicking his cigar into the fire, he got up and helped himself to whiskey. "'Will you come and see the room?' "'Thank you, no. I prefer to have nothing to do with it till the time arrives.' "'Then let's go to see my sister, Mrs. Jameson, who is in the drawing-room. She sometimes does me the kindness to act as my hostess, as I am unmarried." "'I will be delighted,' said Backhouse coldly. They found the lady alone, sitting by the open pianoforte in a pensive attitude. She had been playing Scriabin and was overcome. The medium took in her small, tight, patrician features and porcelain-like hands, and wondered how Fall came by such a sister. She received him bravely, with just a shade of quiet emotion. He was used to such receptions at the hands of the sex, and knew well how to respond to them. "'What amazes me,' she half-whispered, after ten minutes of graceful, hollow conversation, "'is, if you must know it, not so much the manifestation itself, though that will surely be wonderful, as your assurance that it will take place. Tell me the grounds of your confidence.' I dream with open eyes," he answered, looking around at the door, and others see my dreams. That is all." "'But that's beautiful,' responded Mrs. Jameson. She smiled rather absently, for the first guest had just entered. It was Kent Smith, the ex-magistrate, celebrated for his shrewd judicial humor which, however, he had the good sense not to attempt to carry into private life. Although well on the wrong side of seventy, his eyes were still disconcertingly bright. 
With the selective skill of an old man, he immediately settled himself in the most comfortable of the many comfortable chairs. "'So we are to see wonders to-night?' "'Fresh material for your autobiography,' remarked Fall. "'Ah, you should not have mentioned my unfortunate book. An old public servant is merely amusing himself in his retirement, Mr. Backhouse. You have no cause for alarm. I have studied in the school of discretion.' I am not alarmed. There can be no possible objection to your publishing whatever you please." "'You are most kind,' said the old man, with a cunning smile. "'Trent is not coming to-night,' remarked Mrs. Jameson, throwing a curious little glance at her brother. "'I never thought he would. It's not in his line.' "'Mrs. Trent, you must understand,' she went on, addressing the ex-magistrate has placed us all under a debt of gratitude. She has decorated the old lounge-hall upstairs most beautifully, and has secured the services of the sweetest little orchestra." "'But this is Roman magnificence!' "'Backhouse thinks the spirit should be treated with more deference,' laughed Fall. "'Surely, Mr. Backhouse, a poetic environment—' "'Pardon me. I am a simple man, and I always prefer to reduce things to elemental simplicity. I raise no opposition, but I express my opinion. Nature is one thing, and art is another." "'And I am not sure that I don't agree with you,' said the ex-magistrate. "'An occasion like this ought to be simple, to guard against the possibility of deception, if you will forgive my bluntness, Mr. Backhouse. We shall sit in full light," replied Backhouse, and every opportunity will be given to all to inspect the room. I shall also ask you to submit me to a personal examination." A rather embarrassed silence followed. It was broken by the arrival of two more guests, who entered together. These were Pryor, the prosperous city coffee importer, and Lang, the stock-jobber well known in his own circle as an amateur prestidigitator. Backhouse was slightly acquainted with the latter. Pryor, perfuming the room with the faint odor of wine and tobacco smoke, tried to introduce an atmosphere of joviality into the proceedings. Finding that no one seconded his efforts, however, he shortly subsided and fell to examining the watercolors on the walls. Lang, tall, thin, and growing bald, said little but stared at Backhouse a good deal. Coffee, liquors, and cigarettes were now brought in. Everyone partook, except Lang and the medium. At the same moment, Professor Halbert was announced. He was an eminent psychologist, the author and lecturer on crime, insanity, genius, and so forth, considered in their mental aspects. His presence at such a gathering somewhat mystified the other guests, but all felt as if the object of their meeting had immediately acquired additional solemnity. He was small, meager-looking, and mild in manner, but was probably the most stubborn-brained of all that mixed company. Completely ignoring the medium, he at once sat down beside Kent Smith, with whom he began to exchange remarks. At a few minutes past the appointed hour, Mrs. Trent entered, unannounced. She was a woman of about twenty-eight. She had a white, demure, saint-like face, smooth black hair, and lips so crimson and full that they seemed to be bursting with blood. Her tall, graceful body was almost expensively attired. Kisses were exchanged between her and Mrs. Jameson. She bowed to the rest of the assembly, and stole half a glance and a smile at fall. The latter gave her a queer look, and Backhouse, who lost nothing, saw the concealed barbarian in the complacent gleam of his eye. She refused the refreshment that was offered her, and Fall proposed that, as everyone had now arrived, they should adjourn to the lounge hall. Mrs. Trent held up a slender palm. "'Did you, or did you not, give me carte blanche, Montague?' "'Of course I did,' said Fall, laughing. "'But what's the matter?' "'Perhaps I have been rather presumptuous. I don't know. I have invited a couple of friends to join us. No, no one knows them. The two most extraordinary individuals you ever saw. And mediums, I am sure." It sounds very mysterious. 
Who are these conspirators?" "'At least tell us their names, you provoking girl,' put in Mrs. Jameson. "'One rejoices in the name of Maskell, and the other in that of Knightspore. That's nearly all that I know about them, so don't overwhelm me with any more questions. But where did you pick them up? You must have picked them up somewhere." But this is a cross-examination. Have I sinned against convention? I swear I will tell you not another word about them. They will be here directly, and then I will deliver them to your tender mercy." "'I don't know them,' said Fall, and nobody else seems to, but, of course, we will all be very pleased to have them. Shall we wait, or what?" I said nine, and it's past that now. It's quite possible they may not turn up after all. Anyway, don't wait." "'I would prefer to start at once,' said Backhouse. The lounge, a lofty room, forty feet long by twenty wide, had been divided for the occasion into two equal parts by a heavy brocade curtain drawn across the middle. The far end was thus concealed. The nearer half had been converted into an auditorium by a crescent of armchairs. There was no other furniture. A large fire was burning halfway along the wall, between the chair-backs and the door. The room was brilliantly lighted by electric bracket lamps. A sumptuous carpet covered the floor. Having settled his guests in their seats, Fall stepped up to the curtain and flung it aside. A replica, or nearly so, of the Drury Lane presentation of the temple scene in the magic flute was then exposed to view. The gloomy, massive architecture of the interior, the glowing sky above it in the background, and, silhouetted against the latter, the gigantic seated statue of the pharaoh. A fantastically carved wooden couch lay before the pedestal of the statue. Near the curtain, obliquely placed to the auditorium, was a plain oak armchair, for the use of the medium. Many of those present felt privately that the setting was quite inappropriate to the occasion, and savoured rather unpleasantly of ostentation. Backhouse in particular seemed put out. The usual compliments, however, were showered on Mrs. Trent, as the deviser of so remarkable a theatre. Fall invited his friends to step forward and examine the apartment as minutely as they might desire. Pryor and Lang were the only ones to accept. The former wandered about among the pasteboard scenery, whistling to himself and occasionally tapping a part of it with his knuckles. Lang, who was in his element, ignored the rest of his party and commenced a patient, systematic search, on his own account, for secret apparatus. Fall and Mrs. Trent stood in a corner of the temple, talking together in low tones, while Mrs. Jameson, pretending to hold back house in conversation, watched them as only a deeply interested woman knows how to watch. Lang, to his own disgust, having failed to find anything of a suspicious nature, the medium now requested that his own clothing should be searched. All these precautions are quite needless and beside the matter in hand, as you will immediately see for yourselves. My reputation demands, however, that other people who are not present would not be able to say afterward that trickery has been resorted to." Tu Lang again fell the ungrateful task of investigating pockets and sleeves. Within a few minutes he expressed himself satisfied that nothing mechanical was in Backhouse's possession. The guests reseated themselves. Fall ordered two more chairs to be brought for Mrs. Trent's friends, who, however, had not yet arrived. He then pressed an electric bell and took his own seat. The signal was for the hidden orchestra to begin playing. A murmur of surprise passed through the audience as, without previous warning, the beautiful and solemn strains of Mozart's temple music pulsated through the air. The expectation of everyone was raised, while beneath her pallor and composure it could be seen that Mrs. Trent was deeply moved. It was evident that aesthetically she was by far the most important person present. Fall watched her, with his face sunk on his chest, sprawling as usual. Backhouse stood up, with one hand on the back of his chair, and began speaking. 
The music instantly sank to pianissimo and remained so for as long as he was on his legs. Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to witness a materialization. That means you will see something appear in space that was not previously there. At first it will appear as a vaporous form, but finally it will be a solid body, which anyone present may feel and handle, and, for example, shake hands with. For this body will be in the human shape. It will be a real man or woman, which I can't say, but a man or woman without known antecedents. If, however, you demand from me an explanation of the origin of this materialized form, where it comes from, whence the atoms and molecules composing its tissues are derived, I am unable to satisfy you. I am about to produce the phenomenon. If anyone can explain it to me afterward, I shall be very grateful. That is all I have to say." He resumed his seat, half turning his back on the assembly, and paused for a moment before beginning his task. It was precisely at this minute that the manservant opened the door and announced in a subdued but distant voice, Mr. Maskell, Mr. Knightspore. Everyone turned round. Fall rose to welcome the late arrivals. Backhouse also stood up and stared hard at them. The two strangers remained standing by the door, which was closed quietly behind them. They seemed to be waiting for the mild sensation caused by their appearance to subside before advancing into the room. Maskell was a kind of giant, but of broader and more robust physique than most giants. He wore a full beard. His features were thick and heavy, coarsely modeled, like those of a wooden carving. But his eyes, small and black, sparkled with the fires of intelligence and audacity. His hair was short, black, and bristling. Knightsbor was of middle height, but so tough-looking that he appeared to be trained out of all human frailties and susceptibilities. His hairless face seemed consumed by an intense spiritual hunger, and his eyes were wild and distant. Both men were dressed in tweeds. Before any words were spoken, a loud and terrible crash of falling masonry caused the assembled party to start up from their chairs in consternation. It sounded as if the entire upper part of the building had collapsed. Fall sprang to the door and called to the servant to say what was happening. The man had to be questioned twice before he gathered what was required of him. He said he had heard nothing. In obedience to his master's order, he went upstairs. Nothing, however, was amiss there, neither had the maids heard anything. In the meantime, Backhouse, who was almost alone of those assembled, had preserved his sang-froid, went straight up to Knightsbor, who stood gnawing his nails. "'Perhaps you can explain it, sir?' "'It was supernatural,' said Knightsbor, in a harsh, muffled voice, turning away from his questioner. "'I guessed so. It is a familiar phenomenon, but I have never heard it so loud.' He then went among the guests, reassuring them. By degrees they settled down, but it was observable that their former easy and good-humoured interest in the proceedings was now changed to strained watchfulness. Maskell and Knightsbor took the places allotted to them. Mrs. Trent kept stealing uneasy glances at them. Throughout the entire incident Mozart's hymn continued to be played. The orchestra also had heard nothing. Backhouse now entered on his task. It was one that began to be familiar to him, and he had no anxiety about the result. It was not possible to effect the materialization by mere concentration of will, or the exercise of any faculty. Otherwise, many people could have done what he had engaged himself to do. His nature was phenomenal. The dividing wall between himself and the spiritual world was broken in many places. Through the gaps in his mind, the inhabitants of the invisible, when he summoned them, passed for a moment, timidly and awfully, into the solid, colored universe. He could not say how it was brought about. The experience was a rough one for the body, and many such struggles would lead to insanity and early death. That is why Backhouse was stern and abrupt in his manner. 
the coarse, clumsy suspicion of some of the witnesses, the frivolous aestheticism of others, were equally obnoxious to his grim, bursting heart. But he was obliged to live, and to pay his way, must put up with these impertinences. He sat down facing the wooden couch. His eyes remained open, but seemed to look inward. His cheeks paled, and he became noticeably thinner. The spectators almost forgot to breathe. The more sensitive among them began to feel, or imagine, strange presences all around them. Maskell's eyes glittered with anticipation, and his brows went up and down, but Knightspoor appeared bored. After a long ten minutes, the pedestal of the statue was seen to become slightly blurred, as though an intervening mist were rising from the ground. This slowly developed into a visible cloud, coiling hither and thither and constantly changing shape. The professor half rose and held his glasses with one hand further forward on the bridge of his nose. By slow stages the cloud acquired the dimensions and approximate outline of an adult human body, although all was still vague and blurred. It hovered lightly in the air, a foot or so above the couch. Backhouse looked haggard and ghastly. Mrs. Jameson quietly fainted in her chair, but she was unnoticed and presently revived. The apparition now settled down upon the couch, and at the moment of doing so seemed suddenly to grow dark, solid, and manlike. Many of the guests were as pale as a medium himself, but Fall preserved his stoical apathy and glanced once or twice at Mrs. Trent. She was staring straight at the couch and was twisting a little lace handkerchief through the different fingers of her hand. The music went on playing. The figure was by this time unmistakably that of a man lying down. The face focused itself into distinctness. The body was draped in a sort of shroud, but the features were those of a young man. One smooth hand fell over, nearly touching the floor, white and motionless. The weaker spirits of the company stared at the vision in sick horror. The rest were grave and perplexed. The seeming man was dead, but somehow it did not appear like a death succeeding life, but like a death preliminary to life. All felt that he might sit up at any minute. "'Stop that music!' muttered Backhouse, tottering from his chair and facing the party. Fall touched the bell. A few more bars sounded, and then total silence ensued. "'Anyone who wants to may approach the couch,' said Backhouse with difficulty. Lang at once advanced, and stared awestruck at the supernatural youth. "'You are at liberty to touch,' said the medium. But Lang did not venture to, nor did any of the others, who one by one stole up to the couch until it came to Fall's turn. He looked straight at Mrs. Trent, who seemed frightened and disgusted at the spectacle before her, but then not only touched the apparition, but suddenly grasped the drooping hand in his own and gave it a powerful squeeze. Mrs. Trent gave a low scream. The ghostly visitor opened his eyes, looked at Fall strangely, and sat up on the couch. A cryptic smile started playing over his mouth. Fall looked at his hand a feeling of intense pleasure passed through his body. Maskell caught Mrs. Jameson in his arms. She was attacked by another spell of faintness. Mrs. Trent ran forward and led her out of the room. Neither of them returned. The phantom body now stood upright, looking about him still with his peculiar smile. Pryor suddenly felt sick and went out. The other men more or less hung together, for the sake of human society. But Knightspore paced up and down like a man weary and impatient, while Maskell attempted to interrogate the youth. The apparition watched him with a baffling expression, but did not answer. Backhouse was sitting apart, his face buried in his hands. It was at this moment that the door was burst open violently, and a stranger, unannounced, half leaped, half strode a few yards into the room, and then stopped. None of Fall's friends had ever seen him before. He was a thick, shortish man, 
with surprising muscular development, and a head far too large in proportion to his body. His beardless yellow face indicated, as a first impression, a mixture of sagacity, brutality, and humor. Ahai, gentlemen! he called out loudly. His voice was piercing and oddly disagreeable to the ear. So, we have a little visitor here. Knightsport turned his back, but everyone else stared at the intruder in astonishment. He took another few steps forward, which brought him to the edge of the theatre. May I ask, sir, how I come to have the honour of being your host? asked Fall sullenly. He thought that the evening was not proceeding as smoothly as he had anticipated. The newcomer looked at him for a second, and then broke into a great, roaring guffaw. He thumped Fall on the back playfully, but the play was rather rough, for the victim was sent staggering against the wall before he could recover his balance. "'Good evening, my host. And good evening to you, too, my lad,' he went on, addressing the supernatural youth, who was now beginning to wander about the room, in apparent unconsciousness of his surroundings. I have seen someone very like you before, I think." There was no response. The intruder thrust his head almost to the phantom's face. "'You have no right here, as you know.' The shape looked back at him with a smile full of significance, which, however, no one could understand. "'Be careful what you are doing,' said Backhouse quickly. "'What's the matter, spirit usher?' I don't know who you are, but if you use physical violence toward that, as you seem inclined to do, the consequences may prove very unpleasant. And without pleasure, our evening would be spoiled, wouldn't it, my little mercenary friend? Humor vanished from his face, like sunlight from a landscape, leaving it hard and rocky. Before anyone realized what he was doing, he encircled the soft white neck of the materialized shape with his hairy hands, and with a double turn, twisted it completely round. A faint, unearthly shriek sounded, and the body fell in a heap to the floor. Its face was uppermost. The guests were unutterably shocked to observe that its expression had changed from the mysterious but fascinating smile to a vulgar, sordid, bestial grin which cast a cold shadow of moral nastiness into every heart. The transformation was accompanied by a sickening stench of the graveyard. The features faded rapidly away, the body lost its consistence, passing from the solid to the shadowy condition, and before two minutes had elapsed the spirit form had entirely disappeared. The short stranger turned and confronted the party, with a long, loud laugh like nothing in nature. The professor talked excitedly to Kent Smith in low tones. Fall beckoned Backhouse behind a wing of scenery and handed him his check without a word. The medium put it in his pocket, buttoned his coat, and walked out of the room. Lang followed him in order to get a drink. The stranger poked his face up to Maskell's. "'Well, giant, what do you think of it all?' Wouldn't you like to see the land where this sort of fruit grows wild?" "'What sort of fruit?' "'That specimen goblin.' Maskell waved him away with his huge hand. "'Who are you, and how did you come here?' "'Call up your friend. Perhaps he may recognize me.' Knightspore had moved a chair to the fire, and was watching the embers with a set, fanatical expression. Let Cragg come to me if he wants me," he said in his strange voice. "'You see, he does know me,' uttered Cragg, with a humorous look. Walking over to Knightspore, he put a hand on the back of his chair. "'Still the same old gnawing hunger?' "'What is doing these days?' demanded Knightspore disdainfully, without altering his attitude. "'Serter has gone, and we are to follow him.' "'How do you two come to know each other, and of whom are you speaking?' asked Maskell, looking from one to the other in perplexity. "'Crag has something for us. Let us go outside,' replied Knightspore. He got up and glanced over his shoulder. Maskell, 
following the direction of his eye, observed that the few remaining men were watching their little group attentively. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus, Chapter Two In the Street. The three men gathered in the street outside the house. The night was slightly frosty, but particularly clear, with an east wind blowing. The multitude of blazing stars caused the sky to appear like a vast scroll of hieroglyphic symbols. Maskell felt oddly excited. He had a sense that something extraordinary was about to happen. "'What brought you to this house tonight, Cragg? And what made you do what you did? How are we to understand that apparition?' "'That must have been Crystalman's expression on its face,' muttered Knightspore. We have discussed that, haven't we, Maskell? Maskell is anxious to behold that rare fruit in its native wilds." Maskell looked at Cragg carefully, trying to analyze his own feelings toward him. He was distinctly repelled by the man's personality, yet side by side with his aversion a savage living energy seemed to spring up in his heart that in some strange fashion was attributable to Cragg. "'Why do you insist on this simile?' he asked. "'Because it is apropos. Nightspore is quite right. That was Crystalman's face, and we are going to Crystalman's country.' "'And where is this mysterious country?' "'Tormance.' "'That's a quaint name. But where is it?' Cragg grinned, showing his yellow teeth in the light of the street lamp. "'It is the residential suburb of Arcturus. What is he talking about, Knightspore? Do you mean the star of that name? He went on to Cragg. Which you have in front of you at this very minute, said Cragg, pointing a thick finger toward the brightest star in the southeastern sky. There you see Arcturus, and Tormans is its one inhabited planet. Maskell looked at the heavy, gleaming star, and again at Cragg. Then he pulled out a pipe and began to fill it. "'You must have cultivated a new form of humor, Cragg. "'I am glad if I can amuse you, Maskell, if only for a few days. "'I meant to ask you, how do you know my name?' "'It would be odd if I didn't, seeing that I only came here on your account. "'As a matter of fact, Nightspore and I are old friends.' Maskell paused with his suspended match. "'You came here on my account?' "'Surely. On your account and Nightspore's. We three are to be fellow travellers. Maskell now lit his pipe and puffed away coolly for a few moments. "'I'm sorry, Cragg, but I must assume you are mad.' Cragg threw back his head and gave a scraping laugh. "'Am I mad, Nightspore?' "'Has Sir Tur gone to torments?' ejaculated Nightspore, in a strangled voice, fixing his eyes on Cragg's face. "'Yes, and he requires that we follow him at once.' Maskell's heart began to beat strangely. It all sounded to him like a dream conversation. "'And since how long, Cragg, have I been required to do things by a total stranger? Besides, who is this individual?' Cragg's chief," said Knightspore, turning his head away. "'The riddle is too elaborate for me. I give up.' "'You are looking for mysteries,' said Cragg. "'So, naturally, you are finding them. Try and simplify your ideas, my friend. The affair is plain and serious.' Maskell stared hard at him and smoked rapidly. "'Where have you come from now?' demanded Nightspore suddenly. "'From the old observatory at Starkness. Have you heard of the famous Starkness Observatory, Maskell?' "'No. Where is it?' "'On the northeast coast of Scotland, 
curious discoveries are made there from time to time. As, for example, how to make voyages to the stars. So this Surtur turns out to be an astronomer. And you too, presumably? Cragg grinned again. How long will it take you to wind up your affairs? When can you be ready to start? You are too considerate, said Maskell, laughing outright. I was beginning to fear that I would be hauled away at once. However, I have neither wife, land, nor profession, so there's nothing to wait for. What is the itinerary? You are a fortunate man, a bold, daring heart, and no encumbrances. Cragg's features became suddenly grave and rigid. Don't be a fool and refuse a gift of luck. A gift declined is not offered a second time. Cragg, replied Maskell simply, returning his pipe to his pocket, I ask you to put yourself in my place. Even if were a man sick for adventures, how could I listen seriously to such an insane proposition as this? What do I know about you, or your past record? You may be a practical joker, or you may have come out of a madhouse. I know nothing about it. If you claim to be an exceptional man, and want my cooperation, you must offer me exceptional proofs. And what proofs would you consider adequate, Maskell? As he spoke, he gripped Maskell's arm. A sharp, chilling pain immediately passed through the latter's body, and at the same moment his brain caught fire. A light burst in upon him like the rising of the sun. He asked himself for the first time if this fantastic conversation could by any chance refer to real things. "'Listen, Cragg,' he said slowly, while peculiar images and conceptions started to travel in rich disorder through his mind. You talk about a certain journey. Well, if that journey were a possible one, and I were given the chance of making it, I would be willing never to come back. For twenty-four hours on that Arcturian planet I would give my life. That is my attitude toward that journey. Now prove to me that you're not talking nonsense. Produce your credentials." Cragg stared at him all the time he was speaking his face gradually resuming its jesting expression. "'Oh, you will get your twenty-four hours, and perhaps longer, but not much longer. You're an audacious fellow, Maskell, but this trip will prove a little strenuous, even for you. And so, like the unbelievers of old, you want a sign from heaven?' Maskell frowned. "'But the whole thing is ridiculous.' Our brains are overexcited by what took place in there. Let us go home and sleep it off." Cragg detained him with one hand, while groping in his breast pocket with the other. He presently fished out what resembled a small folding lens. The diameter of the lens did not exceed two inches. First, take a peep at Arcturus through this, Maskell. It may serve as a provisional sign. It's the best I can do, unfortunately. I am not a traveling magician. Be very careful not to drop it. It's somewhat heavy." Maskell took the lens in his hand, struggled with it for a minute, and then looked at Cragg in amazement. The little object weighed at least twenty pounds, though it was not much bigger than a crown piece. What stuff can this be, Cragg? Look through it, my good friend. That's what I gave it to you for. Maskell held it up with difficulty, directed it toward the gleaming Arcturus, and snatched as long and as steady a glance at the star as the muscles of his arm would permit. What he saw was this. The star, which to the naked eye appeared as a single yellow point of light, now became clearly split into two bright but minute suns, the larger of which was still yellow, while its smaller companion was a beautiful blue. But this was not all. Apparently circulating around the yellow sun was a comparatively small and hardly distinguishable satellite, which seemed to shine, not by its own, but by reflected light. Maskell lowered and raised his arm repeatedly. The same spectacle revealed itself again and again, but he was able to see nothing else. 
Then he passed back the lens to Cragg without a word, and stood chewing his underlip. "'You take a glimpse, too,' scraped Cragg, proffering the glass to Knightsbor. Knightsbor turned his back and began to pace up and down. Cragg laughed sardonically and returned the lens to his pocket. "'Well, Maskell, are you satisfied?' Arcturus, then, is a double sun. And is that third point the planet torments? Our future home, Maskell. Maskell continued to ponder. You inquire if I am satisfied. I don't know, Cragg. It's miraculous, and that's all I can say about it. But I'm satisfied of one thing. There must be very wonderful astronomers at Starkness, and if you invite me to your observatory, I will surely come. I do invite you. We set off from there. And you, Knightsbor? demanded Maskell. The journey has to be made, answered his friend in indistinct tones, though I don't see what will come of it. Cragg shot a penetrating glance at him. More remarkable adventures than this would need to be arranged before we could excite Knightsbor. Yet he is coming. But not Canamore. He is coming merely to bear you company. Maskell again sought the heavy, somber star, gleaming in solitary might in the southeastern heavens. And as he gazed, his heart swelled with grand and painful longings, for which, however, he was unable to account to his own intellect. He felt that his destiny was in some way bound up with this gigantic, far-distant sun. But still, he did not dare to admit to himself Cragg's seriousness. He heard his parting remarks in deep abstraction, and only after the lapse of several minutes, when, alone with Knightsbor, did he realize that they referred to such mundane matters as traveling routes and times of trains. Does Cragg travel north with us, Knightsbor? I didn't catch that. No, we go on first, and he joins us at Starkness on the evening of the day after tomorrow. Maskell remained thoughtful. What am I to think of that man? For your information, replied Knightsbor wearily, I have never known him to lie. End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of A Voyage to Arcturus » by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus » Chapter 3 « Starkness » A couple of days later, at two o'clock in the afternoon, Maskell and Knightsbor arrived at Starkness Observatory, having covered the seven miles from Halar Station on foot. The road, very wild and lonely, ran for the greater part of the way near the edge of rather lofty cliffs, within sight of the North Sea. The sun shone, but a brisk east wind was blowing and the air was salt and cold. The dark green waves were flecked with white. Throughout the walk they were accompanied by the plaintive, beautiful crying of the gulls. The observatory presented itself to their eyes as a self-contained little community, without neighbors, and perched on the extreme end of the land. There were three buildings, a small stone-built dwelling-house, a low workshop, and, about two hundred yards farther north, a square tower of granite masonry, seventy feet in height. The house and the shop were separated by an open yard, littered with waste. A single stone wall surrounded both, except on the side facing the sea, where the house itself formed a continuation of the cliff. No one appeared. The windows were all closed, and Maskell could have sworn that the whole establishment was shut up and deserted. He passed through the open gate, followed by Knightsbor, and knocked vigorously on the front door. The knocker was thick with dust, and had obviously not been used for a long time. He put his ear to the door, but could hear no movements inside the house. He then tried the handle. The door was locked. 
They walked around the house looking for another entrance, but there was only the one door. "'This isn't promising,' growled Maskell. "'There's no one here. Now you try the shed, while I go over to that tower.' Knightsbor, who had not spoken half a dozen words since leaving the train, complied in silence, and started off across the yard. Maskell passed out of the gate again. When he arrived at the foot of the tower, which stood some way back from the cliff, he found the door heavily padlocked. Gazing up, he saw six windows, one above the other at equal distances, all on the east face, that is, overlooking the sea. Realizing that no satisfaction was to be gained here, he came away again, still more irritated than before. When he rejoined his friend, Knightsbor reported that the workshop was also locked. "'Did we, or did we not, receive an invitation?' demanded Maskell energetically. "'The house is empty,' replied Knightspore, biting his nails. "'Better break a window.' "'I certainly don't mean to camp out till Cragg condescends to come.' He picked up an old iron bolt from the yard, and retreating to a safe distance, hurled it against a sash window on the ground floor. The lower pane was completely shattered. Carefully avoiding the broken glass, Maskell thrust his hand through the aperture and pushed back the frame fastening. A minute later they had climbed through and were standing inside the house. The room, which was a kitchen, was in an indescribably filthy and neglected condition. The furniture scarcely held together, broken utensils and rubbish lay on the floor instead of on the dust heap, everything was covered with a deep deposit of dust. The atmosphere was so foul that Masco judged that no fresh air had passed into the room for several months. Insects were crawling on the walls. They went into the other rooms on the lower floor, a scullery, a barely furnished dining room, and a storing place for lumber. The same dirt, mustiness, and neglect met their eyes. At least half a year must have elapsed since these rooms were last touched, or even entered. "'Does your faith in Cragg still hold?' asked Maskell. "'I confess mine is at a vanishing point. If this affair isn't one big practical joke, it has every promise of being one. Cragg never lived here in his life.' "'Come upstairs first, said Knightsbor. The upstairs rooms proved to consist of a library and three bedrooms. All the windows were tightly closed, and the air was insufferable. The beds had been slept in, evidently a long time ago, and had never been made since. The tumbled, discolored bed linen actually preserved the impressions of the sleepers. There was no doubt that these impressions were ancient, for all sorts of floating dirt had accumulated on the sheets and coverlets. "'Who could have slept here, do you think?' interrogated Maskell. "'The observatory staff?' More likely, travelers like ourselves. They left suddenly. Maska flung the windows wide open in every room he came to, and held his breath until he had done so. Two of the bedrooms faced the sea, the third, the library, the upward-sloping moorland. This library was now the only room left unvisited, and unless they discovered signs of recent occupation here, Masco made up his mind to regard the whole business as a gigantic hoax. But the library, like all the other rooms, was foul with stale air and dust-laden. Masco, having flung the window up and down, fell heavily into an armchair and looked disgustedly at his friend. "'Now what is your opinion of Cragg?' Knightspoor sat on the edge of the table which stood before the window. He may still have left a message for us. What message? Why? Do you mean in this room? I see no message. Knightspoor's eyes wandered about the room, finally seeming to linger upon a glass-fronted wall cupboard, which contained a few old bottles on one of the shelves and nothing else. Masco glanced at him and at the cupboard. Then, without a word, he got up to examine the bottles. There were four altogether, one of which was larger than the rest. The smaller ones were about eight inches long. All were torpedo-shaped, but
but had flattened bottoms, which enabled them to stand upright. Two of the smaller ones were empty and unstoppered, the others contained a colorless liquid, and possessed queer-looking, nozzle-like stoppers that were connected by a thin metal rod with a catch halfway down the side of the bottle. They were labeled, but the labels were yellow with age and the writing was nearly undecipherable. Masco carried the filled bottles with him to the table in front of the window in order to get better light. Knightsbor moved away to make room for him. He now made out on the larger bottles the words, Solar Back Rays, and on the other one, after some doubt, he thought that he could distinguish something like Arcturian Back Rays. He looked up to stare curiously at his friend. Have you been here before, Knightsbor? I guessed Cragg would leave a message. Well, I don't know. It may be a message, but it means nothing to us, or at all events to me. What are back rays? Light that goes back to its source, muttered Knightspore. And what kind of light would that be? Knightspore seemed unwilling to answer, but, finding Maskell's eyes still fixed on him, he brought out, Unless light pulled, as well as pushed, how would flowers contrive to twist their heads around after the sun? I don't know, but the point is, what are these bottles for? While he was still talking, with his hand on the smaller bottle, the other, which was lying on its side, accidentally rolled over in such a manner that the metal caught against the table. He made a movement to stop it. His hand was actually descending, when— the bottle suddenly disappeared before his eyes. It had not rolled off the table, but had really vanished. It was nowhere at all. Maskell stared at the table. After a minute he raised his brows and turned to Knightsbor with a smile. The message grows more intricate. Knightsbor looked bored. The valve became unfastened. The contents have escaped through the open window toward the sun, carrying the bottle with them. But the bottle will be burned up by the earth's atmosphere, and the contents will dissipate and will not reach the sun." Maskell listened attentively, and his smile faded. "'Does anything prevent us from experimenting with this other bottle?' "'Replace it in the cupboard,' said Knightspore. "'Arcturus is still below the horizon and you would succeed only in wrecking the house." Maskell remained standing before the window, pensively gazing out at the sunlit moors. "'Cragg treats me like a child,' he remarked presently. "'And perhaps I really am a child. My cynicism must seem most amusing to Cragg. But why does he leave me to find out all this by myself? For I don't include you, Knightsbor. But what time will Cragg be here?' Not before dark, I expect, his friend replied. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of a Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus. Chapter 4 The Voice. It was by this time past three o'clock. Feeling hungry, for they had eaten nothing since early morning, Maskell went downstairs to forage, but without much hope of finding anything in the shape of food. In a safe in the kitchen he discovered a bag of moldy oatmeal which was untouchable, a quantity of quite good tea in an airtight caddy, and an unopened can of ox tongue. Best of all, in the dining-room cupboard he came across an uncorked bottle of first-class Scotch whiskey. He at once made preparations for a scratch meal. A pump in the yard ran clear after a good deal of hard working at it, and he washed out and filled the antique kettle. For firewood, one of the kitchen chairs was broken up with a chopper. The light, dusty wood made a good blaze in the grate. The kettle was boiled, and cups were procured and washed. Ten minutes later the friends were dining in the library. Knightsport ate and drank little, but Maskell sat down with good appetite. There being no milk, whiskey took the place of it. The nearly black tea was mixed with an equal quantity of the spirit. 
Of this concoction, Maskell drank cup after cup, and after the tongue had disappeared, he was still imbibing. Nightspore looked at him queerly. Do you intend to finish the bottle before Cragg comes? Cragg won't want any, and one must do something. I feel restless. Let us take a look at the country. The cup, which was on its way to Maskell's lips, remained poised in the air. Have you anything in view, Nightspore? Let us walk out to the Gap of Sorgi. What's that? A show-place, answered Nightspore, biting his lip. Maskell finished off the cup and rose to his feet. Walking is better than soaking at any time, and especially on a day like this. How far is it? Three or four miles each way. You probably mean something, said Maskell, for I'm beginning to regard you as a second crag. But if so, so much the better. I am growing nervous and need incidents. They left the house by the door, which they left ajar, and immediately found themselves again on the moorland road that had brought them from Haler. This time they continued along it past the tower. Maskell, as they went by, regarded the erection with puzzled interest. "'What is that tower, Knightsbore?' "'We sail from the platform on the top.' "'Tonight?' throwing him a quick look. "'Yes.' Maskell smiled, but his eyes were grave. "'Then we are looking at the gateway of Arcturus, and Cragg is now travelling north to unlock it.' "'You no longer think it impossible, I fancy,' mumbled Knightsbore. After a mile or two, the road parted from the seacoast and swerved sharply inland across the hills. With Knightsbore as guide, they left it and took to the grass. A faint sheep-path marked the way along the cliff-edge for some distance, but at the end of another mile it vanished. The two men then had some rough walking up and down hillsides and across deep gullies. The sun disappeared behind the hills, and twilight imperceptibly came on. They soon reached a spot where further progress appeared impossible. The buttress of a mountain descended at a steep angle to the very edge of the cliff, forming an impassable slope of slippery grass. Maskell halted, stroked his beard, and wondered what the next step was to be. "'There's a little scrambling here,' said Knightsbore. "'We are both used to climbing, and there is not much in it.' He indicated a narrow ledge, winding along the face of the precipice a few yards beneath where they were standing. It averaged from fifteen to thirty inches in width. Without waiting for Maskell's consent to the undertaking, he instantly swung himself down and started walking along this ledge at a rapid pace. Maskell, seeing that there was no help for it, followed him. The shelf did not extend for above a quarter of a mile, but its passage was somewhat unnerving. There was a sheer drop to the sea four hundred feet below. In a few places they had to sidle along without placing one foot before another. The sound of the breakers came up to them in a low, threatening roar. Upon rounding a corner, the ledge broadened out into a fair-sized platform of rock, and came to a sudden end. A narrow inlet of the sea separated them from the continuation of the cliffs beyond. "'As we can't get any further,' said Maskell, "'I presume this is your gap of Sorgi?' "'Yes,' answered his friend first dropping on his knees and then lying at full length, face downward. He drew his head and shoulders over the edge and began to stare straight down at the water. "'What is there interesting down there, Knightsbore?' Receiving no reply, however, he followed his friend's example, and the next minute was looking for himself. Nothing was to be seen, the gloom had deepened, and the sea was nearly invisible." But while he was ineffectually gazing, he heard what sounded like the beating of a drum on the narrow strip of shore below. It was very faint, but quite distinct. The beats were in four-four time, with the third beat slightly accented. He now continued to hear the noise all the time he was lying there. 
The beats were in no way drowned by the far louder sound of the surf, but seemed somehow to belong to a different world. When they were on their feet again, he questioned Knightsbor. We came here solely to hear that? Knightsbor cast one of his odd looks at him. It's called, locally, the Drum Taps of Sorgi. You will not hear that name again, but perhaps you will hear the sound again." "'And if I do, what will it imply?' demanded Maskell, in amazement. "'It bears its own message. Only try always to hear it more and more distinctly. Now it is growing dark, and we must get back.' Maskell pulled out his watch automatically, and looked at the time. It was past six. But he was thinking of Night Spore's words, and not of the time. Night had already fallen by the time they regained the tower. The black sky was glorious with liquid stars. Arcturus was a little way above the sea, directly opposite them in the east. As they were passing the base of the tower, Maskell observed with a sudden shock that the gate was open. He caught hold of Night Spore's arm violently. Look. Crag is back. Yes, we must make haste to the house. And why not the tower? He's probably in there, since the gate is open. I'm going up to look." Knightspoor grunted, but made no opposition. All was pitch black inside the gate. Maskell struck a match, and the flickering light disclosed the lower end of a circular flight of stone steps. "'Are you coming up?' he asked. No, I'll wait here." Maskell immediately began the ascent. Hardly had he mounted half a dozen steps, however, before he was compelled to pause to gain breath. He seemed to be carrying upstairs not one Maskell, but three. As he proceeded, the sensation of crushing weight, so far from diminishing, grew worse and worse. It was nearly physically impossible to go on. His lungs could not take in enough oxygen, while his heart thumped like a ship's engine. Sweat coursed down his face. At the twentieth step he completed the first revolution of the tower, and came face to face with the first window, which was set in a high embrasure. Realizing that he could go no higher, he struck another match and climbed into the embrasure, in order that he might at all events see something from the tower. The flame died, and he stared through the window at the stars. Then, to his astonishment, he discovered that it was not a window at all, but a lens. The sky was not a wide expanse of space containing a multitude of stars, but a blurred darkness, focused only in one part, where two very bright stars, like small moons in size, appeared in close conjunction, and near them a more minute planetary object, as brilliant as Venus and with an observable disk. One of the suns shone with a glaring white light, the other was a weird and awful blue. Their light, though almost solar in intensity, did not illuminate the interior of the tower. Maskell knew at once that the system of spheres at which he was gazing was what is known to astronomy as the star Arcturus. He had seen the sight before, through Cragg's glass, but then the scale had been smaller, the colors of the twin suns had not appeared in their naked reality. These colors seemed to him most marvelous, as if, in seeing them through earth eyes, he was not seeing them correctly. But it was at torments that he stared the longest and the most earnestly. On that mysterious and terrible earth, countless millions of miles distant, it had been promised him that he would set foot, even though he might leave his bones there. The strange creatures that he was to behold and touch were already living at this very moment. A low, sighing whisper sounded in his ear, from not more than a yard away. "'Don't you understand, Maskell, that you are only an instrument, to be used and then broken?' Nightspore is asleep now, but when he wakes, you must die. You will go, but he will return." 
Maskell hastily struck another match, with trembling fingers. No one was in sight, then all was quiet as the tomb. The voice did not sound again. After waiting a few minutes, he redescended to the foot of the tower. On gaining the open air, his sensation of weight was instantly removed, but he continued panting and palpitating, like a man who has lifted a far too heavy load. Nightspore's dark form came forward. Was Cragg there? If he was, I didn't see him, but I heard someone speak. Was it Cragg? It was not Cragg, but a voice warned me against you. Yes, you will hear these voices too, said Nightspore enigmatically. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus. Chapter Five The Night of Departure. When they returned to the house, the windows were all in darkness, and the door was ajar, just as they had left it. Cragg, presumably, was not there. Maskell went all over the house, striking matches in every room. At the end of the examination he was ready to swear that the man they were expecting had not even stuck his nose inside the premises. Groping their way into the library, they sat down in the total darkness to wait, for nothing else remained to be done. Maskell lit his pipe and began to drink the remainder of the whiskey. Through the open window sounded in their ears the train-like grinding of the sea at the foot of the cliffs. "'Cragg must be in the tower, after all,' remarked Maskell, breaking the silence. "'Yes, he is getting ready.' "'I hope he doesn't expect us to join him there. It was beyond my powers. But why, heaven knows. The stairs must have a magnetic pull of some sort.' It is tormented gravity," muttered Knightsbor. I understand you, or rather I don't, but it doesn't matter. He went on smoking in silence, occasionally taking the mouthful of the neat liquor. Who is Surtur? he demanded abruptly. We others are gropers and bunglers, but he is a master. Maskell digested this. I fancy you are right, for though I know nothing about him, his mere name has an exciting effect on me. Are you personally acquainted with him?" "'I must. I forget,' replied Knightspor in a choking voice. Maskell looked up, surprised, but could make nothing out in the blackness of the room. "'Do you know so many extraordinary men that you can forget some of them? Perhaps you can tell me this. Will we meet him where we are going? You will meet death, Maskell. Ask me no more questions. I can't answer them. Then let us go on waiting for Cragg," said Maskell coldly. Ten minutes later the front door slammed, and a light, quick footstep was heard running up the stairs. Maskell got up with a beating heart. Cragg appeared on the threshold of the door, bearing in his hand a feebly glimmering lantern. A hat was on his head, and he looked stern and forbidding. After scrutinizing the two friends for a moment or so, he strode into the room and thrust the lantern on the table. Its light hardly served to illuminate the walls. "'You have got here, then, Maskell?' "'So it seems, but I shan't thank you for your hospitality, for it has been conspicuous by its absence.' Cragg ignored the remark. Are you ready to start? By all means, when you are. It is not so entertaining here." Cragg surveyed him critically. I heard you stumbling about in the tower. You couldn't get up, it seems. It looks like an obstacle, for Knightsbor informs me that the start takes place from the top. But your other doubts are all removed? So far, Cragg, that I now possess an open mind. I am quite willing to see what you can do." "'Nothing more is asked. But this tower business, you know that until you are able to climb to the top, 
You are unfit to stand the gravitation of torments?" Then I repeat, it's an awkward obstacle, for I certainly can't get up. Craig hunted about in his pockets, and at length produced a clasp-knife. "'Remove your coat, and roll up your shirt-sleeve,' he directed. "'Do you propose to make an incision with that?' "'Yes, and don't start difficulties, because the effect is certain, and you can't possibly understand it beforehand.' "'Still, a cut with a pocket-knife,' began Maskell, laughing. "'It will answer, Maskell,' interrupted Knightspoor. "'Then bear your arm, too, you aristocrat of the universe,' said Cragg. "'Let us see what your blood is made of.' Knightspoor obeyed. Cragg pulled out the big blade of the knife, and made a careless and almost savage slash at Maskell's upper arm. The wound was deep, and blood flowed freely. "'Do I bind it up?' asked Maskell, scowling with pain. Cragg spat on the wound. "'Pull your shirt down. It won't bleed any more.' He then turned his attention to Knightspoor, who endured his operation with grim indifference. Cragg threw the knife on the floor. An awful agony, emanating from the wound, started to run through Maskell's body, and he began to doubt whether he would not have to faint but it subsided almost immediately, and then he felt nothing but a gnawing ache in the injured arm, just strong enough to make life one long discomfort. "'That's finished,' said Cragg. "'Now you can follow me.' Picking up the lantern, he walked toward the door. The others hastened after him, to take advantage of the light, and a moment later their footsteps, clattering down the uncarpeted stairs, resounded through the deserted house. Cragg waited till they were out, and then banged the front door after them with such violence that the window shook. While they were walking swiftly across to the tower, Maskell caught his arm. I heard a voice up those stairs. What did it say? That I am to go, but Knightspoor is to return. Cragg smiled. The journey is getting notorious, he remarked after a pause. There must be ill-wishers about. Well, do you want to return?" I don't know what I want. But I thought the thing was curious enough to be mentioned. "'It is not a bad thing to hear voices,' said Cragg. "'But you mustn't for a minute imagine that all is wise that comes to you out of the night world.' When they had arrived at the open gateway of the tower, he immediately set foot on the bottom step of the spiral staircase and ran nimbly up, bearing the lantern. Maskell followed him with some trepidation, in view of his previous painful experience on these stairs, but when, after the first half-dozen steps, he discovered that he was still breathing freely, his dread changed to relief and astonishment, and he could have chattered like a girl. At the lowest window, Cragg went straight ahead without stepping, but Maskell clambered into the embrasure, in order to renew his acquaintance with the miraculous spectacle of the Arcturian group. The lens had lost its magic property. It had become a common sheet of glass, through which the ordinary sky-field appeared. The climb continued, and at the second and third windows he again mounted and stared out, but still the common sights presented themselves. After that he gave up and looked through no more windows. Cragg and Knightspoor, meanwhile, had gone on ahead with the light, so that he had to complete the ascent in darkness. When he was near the top, he saw yellow light shining through the crack of a half-open door. His companions were standing just inside a small room, shut off from the staircase by rough wooden planking. It was rudely furnished and contained nothing of an astronomical interest the lantern was resting on a table. Maskell walked in and looked around him with curiosity. "'Are we at the top?' "'Except for the platform over our heads,' replied Cragg. "'Why didn't that lowest window magnify, as it did earlier in the evening?' "'Oh, you missed your opportunity,' said Cragg, grinning. "'If you had finished your climb then, you would have seen heart-expanding sights.' From the fifth window, for example, you would have seen torments like a continent in relief. From the sixth, you would have seen it like a landscape. 
but now there's no need. Why not? And what has need got to do with it? Things have changed, my friend, since that wound of yours. For the same reason that you have now been able to mount the stairs, there was no necessity to stop and gape at illusions en route." "'Very well,' said Maskell, not quite understanding what he meant. "'But is this Surtur's den? He has spent time here. I wish you would describe this mysterious individual, Crag. We may not get another chance.' "'What I said about the windows also applies to Surtur. There's no need to waste time over visualizing him, because you are immediately going on to the reality." "'Then let us go,' he pressed his eyeballs wearily. "'Do we strip?' asked Knightspore. "'Naturally,' answered Crag, and he began to tear off his clothes with slow, uncouth movements. "'Why?' demanded Maskell, following, however, the example of the other two men. Craig thumped his vast chest, which was covered with thick hairs, like an ape's. "'Who knows what the Torman's fashions are like? We may sprout limbs. I don't say we shall.' "'Aha!' exclaimed Maskell, pausing in the middle of his undressing. Craig smote him on the back. "'New pleasure organs possible, Maskell. You like that?' The three men stood as nature made them. Maskell's spirits rose fast as the moment of departure drew near. "'A farewell drink to success!' cried Craig, seizing a bottle and breaking its head off between his fingers. There were no glasses, but he poured the amber-colored wine into some cracked cups. Perceiving that the others drank, Maskell tossed off his cupful. It was as if he had swallowed a draft of liquid electricity. Craig dropped onto the floor and rolled around on his back, kicking his legs in the air. He tried to drag Maskell down on top of him, and a little horseplay went on between the two. Knightsbor took no part in it, but walked to and fro like a hungry, caged animal. Suddenly, from out of doors, there came a single, prolonged, piercing wail, such as a banshee might be imagined to utter. It ceased abruptly and was not repeated. "'What's that?' called out Maskell, disengaging himself impatiently from Crag. Crag rocked with laughter. "'A Scottish spirit trying to reproduce the bagpipes of its earth life, in honor of our departure.' Knightsport turned to Crag. "'Maskell will sleep throughout the journey.' "'And you too, if you wish, my altruistic friend. I am pilot, and you passengers can amuse yourselves as you please.' "'Are we off at last?' asked Maskell. "'Yes, you are about to cross your Rubicon, Maskell. But what a Rubicon! Do you know that it takes light a hundred years or so to arrive here from Arcturus? Yet we shall do it in nineteen hours.' "'Then you assert that Surtur is already there?' "'Surtur is where he is. He is a great traveller. "'Won't I see him?' Craig went up to him and looked him in the eyes. "'Don't forget that you have asked for it and wanted it. Few people in Tormans will know more about him than you do, but your memory will be your worst friend.' He led the way up a short iron ladder, mounting through a trap to the flat roof above. When they were up, he switched on a small electric torch. Maskell beheld with awe the torpedo of crystal that was to convey them through the whole breadth of visible space. It was forty feet long, eight wide, and eight high. The tank containing the Arcturian back-rays was in front, the car behind. The nose of the torpedo was directed toward the southeastern sky. The whole machine rested upon a flat platform, raised about four feet above the level of the roof so as to encounter no obstruction on starting its flight. Craig flashed the light onto the door of the car to enable them to enter. Before doing so, Maskell gazed sternly once again at the gigantic, far-distant star, which was to be their sun from now onward. He frowned, shivered slightly, and got in beside Knightsbor. Craig clambered past them onto his pilot's seat. 
he threw the flashlight through the open door, which was then carefully closed, fastened, and screwed up. He pulled the starting lever. The torpedo glided gently from its platform, and passed, rather slowly, away from the tower seaward. Its speed increased sensibly, though not excessively, until the approximate limits of the Earth's atmosphere were reached. Cragg then released the speed valve, and the car sped on its way with a velocity more nearly approaching that of thought than of light. Maskell had no opportunity of examining through the crystal walls the rapidly changing panorama of the heavens. An extreme drowsiness oppressed him. He opened his eyes violently a dozen times, but on the thirteenth attempt he failed. From that time forward he slept heavily. The bored, hungry expression never left Nightspore's face. The alterations in the aspect of the sky seemed to possess not the least interest for him. Cragg sat with his hand on the lever, watching with savage intentness his phosphorescent charts and gauges. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of a Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus. Chapter Six Joy Wind. It was dense night when Maskell awoke from his profound sleep. A wind was blowing against him, gentle but wall like, such as he had never experienced on earth. He remained sprawling on the ground, as he was unable to lift his body because of its intense weight. A numbing pain, which he could not identify with any region of his frame, acted from now onward as a lower, sympathetic note to all his other sensations. It gnawed away at him continuously. Sometimes it embittered and irritated him, at other times he forgot it. He felt something hard on his forehead. Putting his hand up, he discovered there a fleshy protuberance the size of a small plum, having a cavity in the middle, of which he could not feel the bottom. Then he also became aware of a large knob on each side of his neck, an inch below the ear. From the region of his heart a tentacle had budded. It was as long as his arm, but thin, like whipcord, and soft and flexible. As soon as he thoroughly realized the significance of these new organs, his heart began to pump. Whatever might or might not be their use, they proved one thing, that he was in a new world. One part of the sky began to get lighter than the rest. Maskell cried out to his companions, but received no response. This frightened him. He went on shouting out at irregular intervals equally alarmed at the silence and at the sound of his own voice. Finally, as no answering hail came, he thought it wiser not to make too much noise, and after that he lay quiet, waiting in cold blood for what might happen. In a short while he perceived dim shadows around him, but these were not his friends. A pale, milky vapor over the ground began to succeed the black night while in the upper sky rosy tints appeared. On earth one would have said that day was breaking. The brightness went on imperceptibly increasing for a very long time. Maskell then discovered that he was lying on sand. The color of the sand was scarlet. The obscure shadows he had seen were bushes, with black stems and purple leaves. So far nothing else was visible. The day surged up. It was too misty for direct sunshine, but before long the brilliance of the light was already greater than that of the midday sun on earth. The heat, too, was intense, but Maskell welcomed it. It relieved his pain and diminished his sense of crushing weight. The wind had dropped with the rising of the sun. He now tried to get onto his feet, but succeeded only in kneeling. He was unable to see far. The mists had no more than partially dissolved, and all that he could distinguish was a narrow circle of red sand dotted with ten or twenty bushes. He felt a soft, cool touch on the back of his neck. 
He started forward in nervous fright, and in doing so tumbled over onto the sand. Looking up over his shoulder quickly, he was astounded to see a woman standing beside him. She was clothed in a single flowing pale green garment, rather classically draped. According to earth standards she was not beautiful, for, although her face was otherwise human, she was endowed, or afflicted, with the additional disfiguring organs that Maskell had discovered in himself. She also possessed the heart tentacle. But when he sat up, and their eyes met and remained in sympathetic contact, he seemed to see right into a soul that was the home of love, warmth, kindness, tenderness, and intimacy. She was the noble familiarity of that gaze that she thought he knew her. After that he recognized all the loveliness of her person. She was tall and slight. All her movements were as graceful as music. Her skin was not of a dead, opaque color like that of an earth beauty, but was opalescent. Its hue was continually changing with every thought and emotion, but none of these tints was vivid. All were delicate, half-toned, and poetic. She had very long, loosely plaited flaxen hair. The new organs, as soon as Maskell had familiarized himself with them, imparted something to her face that was unique and striking. He could not quite define it to himself, but subtlety and inwardness seemed added. The organs did not contradict the love of her eyes or the angelic purity of her features but nevertheless sounded a deeper note, a note that saved her from mere girlishness. Her gaze was so friendly and unembarrassed that Maskell felt scarcely any humiliation at sitting at her feet, naked and helpless. She realized his plight, and put into his hands a garment that she had been carrying over her arm. It was similar to the one she was wearing, but of a darker, more masculine color. Do you think you can put it on by yourself?" He was distinctly conscious of these words, yet her voice had not sounded. He forced himself up to his feet, and she helped him to master the complications of the drapery. "'Poor man, how you are suffering!' she said in the same inaudible language. This time he discovered that the sense of what she said was received by his brain through the organ on his forehead. Where am I? Is this torments? he asked. As he spoke, he staggered. She caught him and helped him to sit down. Yes, you are with friends. Then she regarded him with a smile and began speaking aloud in English. Her voice somehow reminded him of an April day. It was so fresh, nervous, and girlish. I can now understand your language. It was strange at first. In the future I'll speak to you with my mouth." "'This is extraordinary. What is this organ?' he asked, touching his forehead. "'It is named the Breve. By means of it we read one another's thoughts. Still speech is better, for then the heart can be read too.' He smiled. "'They say that speech is given us to deceive others. One can deceive with thought, too, but I'm thinking of the best, not the worst. Have you seen my friends?" She scrutinized him quietly before answering. Did you not come alone? I came with two other men, in a machine. I must have lost consciousness on arrival, and I haven't seen them since. That's very strange. No, I haven't seen them. They can't be here, or we would have known it, my husband and I. What is your name and your husband's name? Mine is Joywind. My husband's is Panaw. We live a very long way from here. Still, it came to us both last night that you were lying here insensible. We almost quarreled about which of us should come to you, but in the end I won. Here she laughed. I won because I am the stronger-hearted of the two. He is the purer in perception." "'Thanks, Joywind,' said Maskell, simply. The colors chased each other rapidly beneath her skin. "'Oh, why do you say that? 
What pleasure is greater than loving-kindness? I rejoice at the opportunity. But now we must exchange blood." "'What is this?' he demanded, rather puzzled. "'It must be so. Your blood is far too thick and heavy for our world. Until you have an infusion of mine, you will never get up.' Maskell flushed. "'I feel like a complete ignoramus here. Won't it hurt you? If your blood pains you, I suppose it will pain me, but we shall share the pain." "'This is a new kind of hospitality to me,' he muttered. "'Wouldn't you do the same for me?' asked Joywind, half smiling, half agitated. "'I can't answer for any of my actions in this world. I scarcely know where I am. Why, yes, of course I would, Joywind. While they were talking it had become full day. The mists had rolled away from the ground, and only the upper atmosphere remained fog-charged. The desert of scarlet sand stretched in all directions except one, where there was a sort of little oasis, some low hills, clothed sparsely with little purple trees, from base to summit. It was about a quarter of a mile distant. Joywind had brought with her a small flint knife. Without any trace of nervousness she made a careful, deep incision on her upper arm. Maskell expostulated. "'Really, this part of it is nothing,' she said, laughing. "'And if it were, a sacrifice that is no sacrifice, what merit is there in that? Come now, your arm.' The blood was streaming down her arm. It was not red blood, but a milky, opalescent fluid. Not that one," said Maskell, shrinking. I have already been cut there. He submitted the other, and his blood poured forth. Joywind delicately and skillfully placed the mouths of the two wounds together, and then kept her arm pressed tightly against Maskell's for a long time. He felt a stream of pleasure entering his body through the incision. His old lightness and vigor began to return to him. After about five minutes a duel of kindness started between them. He wanted to remove his arm, and she to continue. At last he had his way, but it was none too soon. She stood there, paled and dispirited. She looked at him with a more serious expression than before, as if strange depths had opened up before her eyes. "'What is your name? Maskell. Where have you come from?' with this awful blood. From a world called Earth. The blood is clearly unsuitable for this world, Joywind, but after all, that was only to be expected. I am sorry I let you have your way." Oh, don't say that. There was nothing else to be done. We must all help one another. Yet, somehow, forgive me, I feel polluted. And well you may for it's a fearful thing for a girl to accept in her own veins the blood of a strange man from a strange planet. If I had not been so dazed and weak I would never have allowed it. But I would have insisted. Are we not all brothers and sisters? Why did you come here, Maskell?" He was conscious of a slight degree of embarrassment. "'Will you think it foolish if I say I hardly know? I came with those two men. Perhaps I was attracted by curiosity, or perhaps it was the love of adventure." Perhaps, said Joywind. I wonder. These friends of yours must be terrible men. Why did they come? That I can tell you. They came to follow Surtur. Her face grew troubled. I don't understand it. One of them at least must be a bad man, and yet if he is following Surtur, or shaping, as he is called here, he can't be really bad." "'What do you know of Surtur? asked Maskell, in astonishment. Joywind remained silent for a time, studying his face. His brain moved restlessly, as though it were being probed from outside. "'I see, and yet I don't see,' she said at last. "'It is very difficult. Your god is a dreadful being bodiless, unfriendly, invisible. Here we don't worship a god like that. Tell me, 
Has any man set eyes on your god? What does all this mean, Joywind? Why speak of God? I want to know. In ancient times, when the earth was young and grand, a few holy men are reputed to have walked and spoken with God, but those days are past. Our world is still young, said Joywind. Shaping goes among us and converses with us. He is real and active, a friend and lover. Shaping made us, and he loves his work. Have you met him? demanded Maskell, hardly believing his ears. No, I have done nothing to deserve it yet. Some day I may have an opportunity to sacrifice myself, and then I may be rewarded by meeting and talking with shaping. I have certainly come to another world. But why do you say he is the same as Surtur? Yes, he is the same. We women call him shaping, and so do most men, but a few name him Surtur. Maskell bit his nail. Have you ever heard of Crystalman? That is shaping once again. You see, he has many names, which shows how much he occupies our minds. Crystalman is a name of affection. It's odd, said Maskell. I came here with quite different ideas about Crystalman. Joywind shook her hair. In that grove of trees over there stands a desert shrine of his. Let us go and pray there, and then we'll go on our way to Pooling Dread. That is my home. It is a long way off, and we must get there before Blood Somber. Now, what is Blood Somber? For about four hours in the middle of the day, Branch Spell's rays are so hot that no one can endure them. We call it Blood Somber. Is Branch Spell another name for Arcturus? Joy Wind threw off her seriousness and laughed. Naturally, we don't take our names from you, Maskell. I don't think our names are very poetic, but they follow nature. She took his arm affectionately and directed their walk towards the tree-covered hills. As they went along, the sun broke through the upper mists and a terrible gust of scorching heat, like a blast from a furnace, struck Maskell's head. He involuntarily looked up, but lowered his eyes again like lightning. All that he saw in that instant was a glaring ball of electric white, three times the apparent diameter of the sun. For a few minutes he was quite blind. "'My God!' he exclaimed. "'If it's like this in early morning, you must be right enough about blood somber. When he had somewhat recovered himself, he asked, "'How long are the days here, Joywind?' Again he felt his brain being probed. "'At this time of the year, for every hour's daylight that you have in summer, we have two. The heat is terrific, and yet somehow I don't feel so distressed by it as I would have expected. I feel it more than usual. It's not difficult to account for it. You have some of my blood, and I have some of yours. Yes, every time I realize that I... Tell me, Joywind, will my blood alter if I stay here long enough? I mean... Will it lose its redness and thickness, and become pure and thin and light-colored like yours? Why not? If you live as we live, you will assuredly grow like us. Do you mean food and drink? We eat no food, and drink only water. And on that you manage to sustain life? Well, Maskell, our water is good water, replied Joywind, smiling. As soon as he could see again, he stared around at the landscape. The enormous scarlet desert extended everywhere to the horizon, except where it was broken by the oasis. It was roofed by a cloudless, deep blue, almost violet sky. The circle of the horizon was far larger than on earth. On the skyline, at right angles to the direction in which they were walking, appeared a chain of mountains, apparently about forty miles distant. One which was higher than the rest, was shaped like a cup. Maskell would have felt inclined to believe he was traveling in dreamland, but for the intensity of the light which made everything vividly real. Joy Wind pointed to the cup-shaped mountain. That's Pooling Dread. You didn't come from there! he exclaimed, quite startled. Yes, I did indeed, and that is where we have to go now. 
with the single object of finding me? Why, yes. The color mounted to his face. Then you are the bravest and noblest of all girls, he said quietly after a pause. Without exception. Why, this is a journey for an athlete. She pressed his arm, while a score of unpaintable, delicate hues stained her cheeks in rapid transition. "'Please, don't say any more about it, Masco. It makes me feel unpleasant.' "'Very well. But can we possibly get there before midday?' "'Oh, yes. And you mustn't be frightened at the distance. We think nothing of long distances here. We have so much to think about and feel. Time goes all too quickly.' During their conversation they had drawn near the base of the hills, which sloped gently and were not above fifty feet in height. Maskell now began to see strange specimens of vegetable life. What looked like a small patch of purple grass, above five feet square, was moving across the sand in their direction. When it came near enough he perceived that it was not grass. There were no blades, but only purple roots. The roots were revolving, for each small plant on the whole patch, like the spokes of a rimless wheel. They were alternately plunged in the sand and withdrawn from it, and by this means the plant proceeded forward. Some uncanny, semi-intelligent instinct was keeping all the plants together, moving at one pace in one direction, like a flock of migrating birds in flight. Another remarkable plant was a large feathery ball resembling a dandelion fruit, which they encountered sailing through the air. Joy Wind caught it with an exceedingly graceful movement of her arm, and showed it to Maskell. It had roots, and presumably lived in the air and fed on the chemical constituents of the atmosphere. But what was peculiar about it was its color. It was an entirely new color, not a new shade or combination, but a new primary color as vivid as blue, red, or yellow, but quite different. When he inquired, she told him that it was known as Ulfire. Presently he met with a second new color. This she designated Jail. The sense impressions caused in Maskell by these two additional primary colors can only be vaguely hinted at by analogy. Just as blue is delicate and mysterious, yellow, clear and unsubtle, and red, sanguine and passionate, so he felt Ulfire to be wild and painful, and Jail dreamlike, feverish and voluptuous. The hills were composed of a rich, dark mold. Small trees, of weird shapes, all differing from each other but all purple-colored, covered the slopes and top. Maskell and Joy when climbed up and through. Some hard fruit, bright blue in color, of the size of a large apple and shaped like an egg, was lying in profusion underneath the trees. "'Is the fruit here poisonous, or why don't you eat it?' asked Maskell. She looked at him tranquilly. "'We don't eat living things. The thought is horrible to us.' "'I have nothing to say against that theoretically. But do you really sustain your bodies on water?' "'Supposing you could find nothing else to live on, Maskell, would you eat other men?" I would not. Neither will we eat plants and animals, which are our fellow creatures. So nothing is left to us but water, and as one can really live on anything, water does very well." Masco picked up one of the fruits and handled it curiously. As he did so, another of his newly acquired sense organs came into action. He found that the fleshy knobs beneath his ears were in some novel fashion acquainting him with the inward properties of the fruit. He could not only see, feel, and smell it, but could detect its intrinsic nature. This nature was hard, persistent, and melancholy. Joy Wind answered the questions he had not asked. Those organs are called poins. Their use is to enable us to understand and sympathize with all living creatures. What advantage do you derive from that, Joy Wind? The advantage of not being cruel and selfish, dear Maskell. He threw the fruit away and flushed again. Joy Wind looked into his swarthy, bearded face without embarrassment and slowly smiled. 
Have I said too much? Have I been too familiar? Do you know why you think so? It's because you are still impure. By and by you will listen to all language without shame." Before he realized what she was about to do, she threw her tentacle around his neck, like another arm. He offered no resistance to its cool pressure. The contact of her soft flesh with his own was so moist and sensitive that it resembled another kind of kiss. He saw who it was that embraced him, a pale, beautiful girl. Yet, oddly enough, he experienced neither voluptuousness nor sexual pride. The love expressed by the caress was rich, glowing, and personal, but there was not the least trace of sex in it, and so he received it. She removed her tentacle, placed her two arms on his shoulders, and penetrated with her eyes right into his very soul. "'Yes, I wish to be pure,' he muttered. "'Without that, what can I ever be but a weak, squirming devil?' Joy Wynn released him. This we call the magan, she said, indicating her tentacle. By means of it, what we love already we love more, and what we don't love at all we begin to love. A godlike organ! It is the one we guard most jealously, said Joywind. The shade of the trees afforded a timely screen from the now almost insufferable rays of branch spell, which was climbing steadily upward to the zenith. On descending the other side of the little hills, Maskell looked anxiously for traces of night spore and crag, but without result. After staring about him for a few minutes he shrugged his shoulders, but suspicions had already begun to gather in his mind. A small, natural amphitheatre lay at their feet, completely circled by the tree-clad heights. The centre was of red sand. In the very middle shot up a tall, stately tree with a black trunk and branches, and transparent crystal leaves. At the foot of this tree was a natural circular well, containing dark green water. When they reached the bottom, Joy Wynn took him straight over to the well. Masco gazed at it intently. "'Is this the shrine you talked about?' "'Yes. It's called Shaping's Well. The man or woman who wishes to invoke shaping must take up some of the null water and drink it. Pray for me, said Maskell. Your unspotted prayer will carry more weight. What do you wish for? For purity, answered Maskell in a troubled voice. Joywin made a cup of her hand and drank a little of the water. She held it up to Maskell's mouth. You must drink too. He obeyed. She then stood erect closed her eyes, and in a voice like the soft murmurings of spring, prayed aloud. Shaping, my father, I am hoping you can hear me. A strange man has come to us weighed down with heavy blood. He wishes to be pure. Let him know the meaning of love. Let him live for others. Don't spare him pain, dear Shaping, but let him seek his own pain. Breathe into him a noble soul." Maskell listened, with tears in his heart. As Joywin finished speaking, a blurred mist came over his eyes, and, half buried in the scarlet sand, appeared a large circle of dazzlingly white pillars. For some minutes they flickered to and fro, between distinctness and indistinctness, like an object being focused. Then they faded out of sight again. "'Is that a sign from shaping?' asked Maskell in a low, awed tone. "'Perhaps it is. It is a time mirage.' "'What can that be, Joywind?' "'You see, dear Maskell, the temple does not yet exist, but it will do so, because it must. What you and I are now doing in simplicity, wise men will do hereafter in full knowledge.' "'It is right for man to pray,' said Maskell. Good and evil in the world don't originate from nothing. God and devil must exist, and we should pray to one and fight the other. Yes, we must fight Crag. What name did you say? asked Maskell in amazement. Crag, 
the author of evil and misery, whom you call devil." He immediately concealed his thoughts. To prevent Joywin from learning his relationship to this being, he made his mind a blank. "'Why do you hide your mind from me?' she demanded, looking at him strangely and changing color. In this bright, pure, radiant world, evil seems so remote, one can scarcely grasp its meaning. But he lied. Joywin continued gazing at him, straight out of her clean soul. The world is good and pure, but many men are corrupt. Panaw, my husband, has traveled, and he has told me things I would almost rather have not heard. One person he met believed the universe to be, from top to bottom, a conjurer's cave. I should like to meet your husband. Well, we are going home now. Maskell was on the point of inquiring whether she had any children, but was afraid of offending her, and checked himself. She read the mental question. What need is there? Is not the whole world full of lovely children? Why should I want selfish possessions? An extraordinary creature flew past, uttering a plaintive cry of five distinct notes. It was not a bird, but had a balloon-shaped body, paddled by five webbed feet. It disappeared among the trees. Joy Wind pointed to it as it went by. I love that beast, grotesque as it is, perhaps all the more for its grotesqueness. But if I had children of my own, would I still love it? Which is best, to love two or three, or to love all? Every woman can't be like you, Joy Wind, but it is good to have a few like you. Wouldn't it be as well, he went on, since we've got to walk through that sun-baked wilderness, to make turbans for our heads out of some of those long leaves?" She smiled rather pathetically. "'You will think me foolish, but every tearing off of a leaf would be a wound in my heart. We have only to throw our robes over our heads.' "'No doubt that will answer the same purpose. But tell me, weren't those very robes once part of a living creature?' "'Oh, no, no! They are the webs of a certain animal, but they have never been in themselves alive." "'You reduce life to extreme simplicity,' remarked Maskell meditatively. "'But it is very beautiful.'" Climbing back over the hills, they now, without further ceremony, began their march across the desert. They walked side by side. Joywind directed their course straight toward Poolingdred. From the position of the sun, Masco judged their way to lie due north. The sand was soft and powdery, very tiring to his naked feet. The red glare dazed his eyes and made him semi-blind. He was hot, parched, and tormented with the cravings to drink. His undertone of pain emerged into full consciousness. "'I see my friends nowhere, and it is very queer.' Yes, it is queer, if it is accidental," said Joywind, with a peculiar intonation. Exactly, agreed Maskell. If they had met with a mishap, their bodies would still be there. It begins to look like a piece of bad work to me. They must have gone on and left me. Well, I am here, and I must make the best of it. I will trouble no more about them. I don't wish to speak ill of anyone said Joywind, but my instinct tells me that you are better away from those men. They did not come here for your sake, but for their own." They walked on for a long time. Maskell was beginning to feel faint. She twined her magan lovingly around his waist, and a strong current of confidence and well-being instantly coursed through his veins. "'Thanks, Joywind. But am I not weakening you?' Yes she replied with a quick, thrilling glance, but not much, and it gives me great happiness." Presently they met a fantastic little creature, the size of a newborn lamb, waltzing along on three legs. Each leg in turn moved to the front, so the little monstrosity proceeded by means of a series of complete rotations. It was vividly colored as though it had been dipped into pots of bright blue and yellow paint. It looked up with small shining eyes as they passed. 
Joy Wynne nodded and smiled to it. "'That's a personal friend of mine, Maskell. Whenever I come this way, I see it. It's always waltzing and always in a hurry, but it never seems to get anywhere.' It seems to me that life is so self-sufficient here that there is no need for anyone to get anywhere. What I don't quite understand is how you manage to pass your days without ennui. That's a strange word. It means, does it not, craving for excitement? Something of the kind, said Maskell. That must be a disease brought on by rich food. But are you never dull? How could we be? Our blood is quick and light and free, our flesh is clean and unclogged, inside and out. Before long, I hope you will understand what sort of question you have asked." Farther on, they encountered a strange phenomenon. In the heart of the desert, a fountain rose perpendicularly fifty feet into the air, with a cool and pleasant hissing sound. It differed, however, from a fountain in this respect that the water of which it was composed did not return to the ground, but was absorbed by the atmosphere at the summit. It was, in fact, a tall, graceful column of dark green fluid, with a capital of coiling and twisting vapors. When they came closer, Maskell perceived that this water column was the continuation and termination of a flowing brook, which came down from the direction of the mountains. The explanation of the phenomenon was evidently that the water at this spot found chemical affinities in the upper air, and consequently forsook the ground. "'Now let us drink,' said Joywind. She threw herself unaffectedly at full length on the sand, face downward by the side of the brook, and Masco was not long in following her example. She refused to quench her thirst until she had seen him drink. He found the water heavy, but bubbling with gas. He drank copiously. It affected his palate in a new way. With the purity and cleanness of water was combined the exhilaration of a sparkling wine, raising his spirits. But somehow the intoxication brought out his better nature, not his lower. "'We call it gnawl water,' said Joywind. "'This is not quite pure, as you can see by the color. At pooling dread it is crystal clear. But we would be ungrateful if we complained. After this you'll find we'll get along much better." Maskell now began to realize his environment, as it were for the first time. All his sense organs started to show him beauties and wonders that he had not hitherto suspected. The uniform glaring scarlet of the sands became separated into a score of clearly distinguished shades of red. The sky was similarly split up into different blues. The radiant heat of Branspell he found to affect every part of his body with unequal intensities. His ears awakened. The atmosphere was full of murmurs. The sands hummed. Even the sun's rays had a sound of their own, a kind of faint Aeolian harp. Subtle, puzzling perfumes assailed his nostrils. His palate lingered over the memory of the gnaw water. All the pores of his skin were tickled and soothed by hitherto unperceived currents of air. His poems explored actively the inward nature of everything in his immediate vicinity. His magan touched joy-wind and drew from her person a stream of love and joy. And lastly, by means of his breve, he exchanged thoughts with her in silence. This mighty, sense symphony stirred him to the depths, and throughout the walk of that endless morning he felt no more fatigue. When it was drawing near to Bloodsomber, they approached the sedgy margin of a dark green lake, which lay underneath pooling dread. Panna was sitting on a dark rock, waiting for them. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus 
Chapter 7 Panaw The husband got up to meet his wife and their guest. He was clothed in white. He had a beardless face, with breve and poins. His skin, on face and body alike, was so white, fresh, and soft that it scarcely looked like skin at all. It rather resembled a new kind of pure, snowy flesh, extending right down to his bones. It had nothing in common with the artificially whitened skin of an over-civilized woman. Its whiteness and delicacy aroused no voluptuous thoughts. It was obviously the manifestation of a cold and almost cruel chastity of nature. His hair, which fell to the nape of his neck, also was white, but again from vigor, not decay. His eyes were black, quiet, and fathomless. He was still a young man, but so stern were his features that he had the appearance of a lawgiver, and this in spite of their great beauty and harmony. His magan and joy winds intertwined for a single moment, and Maskell saw his face soften with love, while she looked exultant. She put him in her husband's arms with gentle force, and stood back, gazing and smiling. Maskell felt rather embarrassed at being embraced by a man, but submitted to it. A sense of cool, pleasant languor passed through him in the act. "'The stranger is red-blooded, then?' He was startled by Panaw speaking in English, and the voice, too, was extraordinary. It was absolutely tranquil, but its tranquillity seemed in a curious fashion to be an illusion proceeding from a rapidity of thoughts and feelings so great that their motion could not be detected. How this could be, he did not know. "'How do you come to speak in a tongue you have never heard before?' demanded Maskell. "'Thought is a rich, complex thing. I can't say if I am really speaking your tongue by instinct, or if you yourself are translating my thoughts into your tongue as I utter them.' Already you see that Panaw is wiser than I am," said Joywind gaily. "'What is your name?' asked the husband. "'Maskell.' "'That name must have a meaning, but again thought is a strange thing. I connect that name with something, but with what?' "'Try to discover,' said Joywind. Has there been a man in your world who stole something from the Maker of the universe in order to ennoble his fellow creatures? There is such a myth. The hero's name was Prometheus. Well, you seem to be identified in my mind with that action. But what it all means, I can't say, Maskell. Accept it as a good omen, for Panon never lies and never speaks thoughtlessly. There must be some confusion. These are heights beyond me," said Maskell calmly, but looking rather contemplative. "'Where did you come from?' "'From the planet of a distant sun called Earth.' "'What for?' "'I was tired of vulgarity,' returned Maskell laconically. He intentionally avoided mentioning his fellow voyagers, in order that Cragg's name should not come to light. "'That's an honorable motive said Panaw. And what's more, it may be true, though you spoke it as a prevarication." "'As far as it goes, it's quite true,' said Maskell, staring at him with annoyance and surprise. The swampy lake extended for about a half a mile from where they were standing to the lower buttresses of the mountain. Feathery purple reeds showed themselves here and there through the shallows. The water was dark green. Maskell did not see how they were going to cross it. Joywin caught his arm. "'Perhaps you don't know that the lake will bear us?' Panna walked on to the water. It was so heavy that it carried his weight. Joywin followed with Maskell. He instantly started to slip about. Nevertheless, the motion was amusing, and he learned so fast, by watching and imitating Panna, that he was soon able to balance himself without assistance. After that, he found the sport excellent. For the same reason that women excel in dancing, Joy Wynne's half-falls and recoveries were far more graceful and sure than those of either of the men. 
her slight, draped form, dipping, bending, rising, swaying, twisting, upon the surface of the dark water, this was a picture Maskell could not keep his eyes away from. The lake grew deeper. The null water became green-black. The crags, gullies, and precipices of the shore could now be distinguished in detail. A waterfall was visible, descending several hundred feet. The surface of the lake grew disturbed, so much so that Maskell had difficulty in keeping his balance. He therefore threw himself down and started swimming on the face of the water. Joywin turned her head and laughed so joyously that all her teeth flashed in the sunlight. They landed in a few more minutes on a promontory of black rock. The water on Maskell's garment and body evaporated very quickly. He gazed upward at the towering mountain, but at that moment some strange movements on the part of Panaw attracted his attention. His face was working convulsively, and he began to stagger about. Then he put his hand to his mouth and took from it what looked like a bright-colored pebble. He looked at it carefully for some seconds. Joy went also looked, over his shoulder, with quickly changing colors. After this inspection, Panaw let the object, whatever it was, fall to the ground and took no more interest in it. "'May I look?' asked Maskell, and without waiting for permission he picked it up. It was a delicately beautiful egg-shaped crystal of pale green. "'Where did this come from?' he asked queerly. Panaw turned away, but Joywind answered for him. "'It came out of my husband.' "'That's what I thought, but I couldn't believe it. But what is it?' "'I don't know that it has either name or use. It is merely an overflowing of beauty.' "'Beauty?' Joywind smiled. "'If you were to regard nature as the husband and Panaw as the wife, Maskell, Perhaps everything would be explained. Maskell reflected. On earth, he said after a minute, men like Panaw are called artists, poets, and musicians. Beauty overflows into them, too, and out of them again. The only distinction is that their productions are more human and intelligible. Nothing comes from it but vanity said Panaw, and taking the crystal out of Maskell's hand, he threw it into the lake. The precipice they now had to climb was several hundred feet in height. Maskell was more anxious for Joywin than for himself. She was evidently tiring, but she refused all help, and was in fact still the nimbler of the two. She made a mocking face at him. Panaw seemed lost in quiet thoughts. The rock was sound, and did not crumble under their weight. The heat of branch bell, however, was by this time almost killing, the radiance was shocking in its white intensity, and Maskell's pain steadily grew worse. When they got to the top, a plateau of dark rock appeared, bare of vegetation, stretching in both directions as far as the eye could see. It was of a nearly uniform width of five hundred yards from the edge of the cliffs to the lower slopes of the chain of hills inland. The hills varied in height. The cup-shaped pooling dread was approximately a thousand feet above them. The upper part of it was covered with a kind of glittering vegetation which he could not comprehend. Joywin put her hand on Maskell's shoulder and pointed upward. "'Here you have the highest peak in the whole land, that is, until you come to the Ifdon Marist, on hearing that strange name, he experienced a momentary unaccountable sensation of wild vigor and restlessness, but it passed away. Without losing time, Panaw led the way up the mountainside. The lower half was of bare rock, not difficult to climb. Halfway up, however, it grew steeper, and they began to meet bushes and small trees. The growth became thicker as they continued to ascend, and when they neared the summit, tall forest trees appeared. These bushes and trees had pale, glassy trunks and branches, but the small twigs and leaves were translucent and crystal. They cast no shadows from above, but still the shade was cool. Both leaves and branches were fantastically shaped. 
What surprised Masco the most, however, was the fact that, as far as he could see, scarcely any two plants belonged to the same species. "'Won't you help Maskell out of his difficulty?' said Joywind, pulling her husband's arm. He smiled. "'If he'll forgive me for again trespassing in his brain. But the difficulty is small. Life on a new planet, Maskell, is necessarily energetic and lawless, and not sedate and imitative. Nature is still fluid, not yet rigid, and matter is plastic.' The will forks and sports incessantly, and thus no two creatures are alike. "'Well, I understand all that,' replied Maskell, after listening attentively. "'But what I don't grasp is this. If living creatures hear sport so energetically, how does it come about that human beings wear much the same shape as in my world?' "'I'll explain that, too,' said Panaw. All creatures that resemble shaping must of necessity resemble one another. Then sporting is the blind will to become like shaping? Exactly. It is most wonderful, said Maskell. Then the brotherhood of man is not a fable invented by idealists, but a solid fact. Joywin looked at him and changed color. Panaw relapsed into sternness. Maskell became interested in a new phenomenon. The jail-colored blossoms of a crystal bush were emitting mental waves, which, with his breathe, he could clearly distinguish. They cried out silently, To me! To me! While he looked, a flying worm guided itself through the air to one of these blossoms, and began to suck its nectar. The floral cry immediately ceased. They now gained the crest of the mountain, and looked down beyond. A lake occupied its crater-like cavity. A fringe of trees partly intercepted the view, but Maskell was able to perceive that this mountain lake was nearly circular, and perhaps a quarter of a mile across. Its shore stood a hundred feet below them. Observing that his hosts did not propose to descend, he begged them to wait for him, and scrambled down to the surface. When he got there, he found the water perfectly motionless and of a colorless transparency. He walked on to it, lay down at full length, and peered into the depths. It was weirdly clear. He could see down for an indefinite distance, without arriving at any bottom. Some dark, shadowy objects, almost out of reach of his eyes, were moving about. Then a sound, very faint and mysterious, seemed to come up through the knoll water from an immense depth. It was like the rhythm of a drum. There were four beats of equal length, but the accent was on the third. It went on for a considerable time, and then ceased. The sound appeared to him to belong to a different world from that in which he was traveling. The latter was mystical, dreamlike, and unbelievable. The drumming was like a very dim undertone of reality. It resembled the ticking of a clock in a room full of voices, only occasionally possible to be picked up by the ear. He rejoined Panaw and Joywind, but said nothing to them about his experience. They all walked round the rim of the crater and gazed down on the opposite side. Precipices similar to those that had overlooked the desert here formed the boundary of a vast moorland plain, whose dimensions could not be measured by the eye. It was solid land, yet he could not make out its prevailing color. It was as if made of transparent glass, but it did not glitter in the sunlight. No objects in it could be distinguished, except a rolling river in the far distance and farther off still, on the horizon, a line of dark mountains of strange shapes. Instead of being rounded, conical, or hog-backed, these heights were carved by nature into the semblance of castle battlements, but with extremely deep indentations. The sky, immediately above the mountains, was of a vivid, intense blue. It contrasted in a most marvelous way with the blue of the rest of the heavens. It seemed more luminous and radiant, 
and was in fact like the afterglow of a gorgeous blue sunset. Maskell kept on looking. The more he gazed, the more restless and noble became his feelings. What is that light? Panaw was sterner than usual, while his wife clung to his arm. It is Alpain, our second son, he replied. Those hills are the if don merest. Now let us get to our shelter. Is it imagination, or am I really being affected, tormented by that light? No, it's not imagination, it's real. How can it be otherwise when two sons, of different natures, are drawing you at the same time? Luckily, you are not looking at Alpine itself. It's invisible here. You would need to go at least as far as Ifdon to set eyes on it. Why do you say luckily? Because the agony caused by those opposing forces would perhaps be more than you could bear, but I don't know. For the short distance that remained of their walk, Maskell was very thoughtful and uneasy. He understood nothing. Whatever object his eye chanced to rest on changed immediately into a puzzle. The silence and stillness of the mountain peak seemed brooding, mysterious, and waiting. Panaw gave him a friendly, anxious look, and without further delay led the way down a little track, which traversed the side of the mountain and terminated in the mouth of a cave. This cave was the home of Panaw and Joywind. It was dark inside. The host took a shell, and filling it with a liquid from a well, carelessly sprinkled the sandy floor of the interior. A greenish, phosphorescent light gradually spread to the furthest limits of the cavern, and continued to illuminate it for the whole time they were there. There was no furniture. Some dried, fern-like leaves served for couches. The moment she got in, Joy Wind fell down in exhaustion. Her husband tended her with calm concern. He bathed her face, put drink to her lips, energized her with his magan, and finally laid her down to sleep. At the sight of the noble woman thus suffering on his account, Maskell was distressed. Panaw, however, endeavored to reassure him. It's quite true, this has been a very long, hard double journey, but for the future it will lighten all her other journeys for her, such is the nature of sacrifice. I can't conceive how I have walked so far in a morning, said Maskell, and she has been twice the distance. Love flows in her veins instead of blood, and that's why she is so strong. You know she gave me some of it? Otherwise you couldn't have even started. I shall never forget that. The languorous heat of the day outside, the bright mouth of the cavern, the cool seclusion of the interior, with its pale green glow, invited Maskell to sleep. But curiosity got the better of his lassitude. Will it disturb her if we talk? No. But how do you feel? I require little sleep. In any case, it's more important that you should hear something about your new life. It's not all as innocent and idyllic as this. If you intend to go through, you ought to be instructed about the dangers. Oh, I guessed as much. But how shall we arrange? Shall I put questions, or will you tell me what you think is most essential? Panaw motioned to Maskell to sit down on a pile of ferns, and at the same time reclined himself, leaning on one arm with outstretched legs. I will tell you some incidents of my life. You will begin to learn from them what sort of place you have come to. I shall be grateful, said Maskell, preparing himself to listen. Panaw paused for a moment or two, and then started his narrative in tranquil, measured, yet sympathetic tones. Panaw's Story My earliest recollection is of being taken, when three years old, that's equivalent to fifteen of your years, but we develop more slowly here, by my father and mother, to see Broodviol, the wisest man in torments. 
he dwelt in the great womb-flash forest. We walked through trees for three days, sleeping at night. The trees grew taller as we went along, until the tops were out of sight. The trunks were of a dark red color, and the leaves were of pale ulfire. My father kept stopping to think. If left uninterrupted, he would remain for half a day in deep abstraction. My mother came out of pooling dread and was of a different stamp. She was beautiful, generous, and charming, but also active. She kept urging him on. This led to many disputes between them, which made me miserable. On the fourth day we passed through a part of the forest which bordered on the sinking sea. This sea is full of pouches of water that will not bear a man's weight and as these light parts don't differ in appearance from the rest, it is dangerous to cross. My father pointed out a dim outline on the horizon and told me it was Swaylone's island. Men sometimes go there, but none ever return. In the evening of the same day we found Broodviol standing in a deep, miry pit in the forest, surrounded on all sides by trees three hundred feet high. He was a big, gnarled, rugged, wrinkled, sturdy old man. His age at that time was a hundred and twenty of our years, or nearly six hundred of yours. His body was trilateral. He had three legs, three arms, and six eyes, placed at equal distances all around his head. This gave him an aspect of great watchfulness and sagacity. He was standing in a sort of trance. I afterward heard this saying of his, To lie is to sleep, to sit is to dream, to stand is to think. My father caught the infection and fell into meditation, but my mother roused them both thoroughly. Broodviel scowled at her savagely and demanded what she required. Then I too learned for the first time the object of our journey. I was a prodigy that is to say, I was without sex. My parents were troubled over this, and wished to consult the wisest of men. Old Broodviel smoothed his face and said, This perhaps will not be so difficult. I will explain the marvel. Every man and woman among us is a walking murderer. If male, he has struggled with and killed the female, who was born in the same body with him. If a female, she has killed the male. But in this child the struggle is still continuing." "'How shall we end it?' asked my mother. "'Let the child direct its will to the scene of the combat, and it will be of whichever sex it pleases.' "'You want, of course, to be a man, don't you?' said my mother to me earnestly. "'Then I shall be slaying your daughter, and that would be a crime.' Something in my tone attracted Broodweil's notice. That was spoken not selfishly, but magnanimously. Therefore the male must have spoken it, and you need not trouble further. Before you arrive home the child will be a boy." My father walked away out of sight. My mother bent very low before Broodweil for about ten minutes and he remained all the time looking kindly at her. I heard that, shortly afterward, Alpine came into that land for a few hours daily. Broodviol grew melancholy and died. His prophecy came true. Before we reached home I knew the meaning of shame. But I have often pondered over his words since, in later years, when trying to understand my own nature, and I have come to the conclusion that, wisest of men as he was, he still did not see quite straight on this occasion. Between me and my twin sister, enclosed in one body, there never was any struggle, but instinctive reverence for life withheld both of us from fighting for existence. Hers was the stronger temperament, and she sacrificed herself, though not consciously, for me. As soon as I comprehended this, I made a vow never to eat or destroy anything that contained life, and I have kept it ever since. While I was still hardly a grown man, my father died. 
My mother's death followed immediately, and I hated the associations of the land. I therefore made up my mind to travel into my mother's country, where, as she had often told me, nature was most sacred and solitary. One hot morning I came to Shaping's Causeway. It is so called either because Shaping once crossed it, or because of its stupendous character. It is a natural embankment, twenty miles long, which links the mountains bordering my homeland with the Ifdon Marist. The valley lies below at a depth varying from eight to ten thousand feet, a terrible precipice on either side. The knife edge of the ridge is generally not much over a foot wide. The causeway goes due north and south. The valley on my right hand was plunged in shadow, that on my left was sparkling with sunlight and dew. I walked fearfully along this precarious path for some miles. Far to the east the valley was closed by a lofty tableland, connecting the two chains of mountains, but overtopping even the most towering pinnacles. This is called the Sant Levels. I was never there, but I have heard two curious facts concerning the inhabitants. The first is that they have no women. The second, that, though they are addicted to traveling in other parts, they never acquire habits of the peoples with whom they reside. Presently I turned giddy, and lay at full length for a great while, clutching the two edges of the path with both hands, and staring at the ground I was lying on with wide open eyes. When that passed, I felt like a different man, and grew conceited and gay. About halfway across, I saw someone approaching me a long way off. This put fear into my heart again, for I did not see how we could very well pass. However, I went slowly on, and presently we drew near enough together for me to recognize the walker. It was Slowfork, the so-called sorcerer. I had never met him before, but I knew him by his peculiarities of person. He was of a bright gamboge color and possessed a very long, proboscis-like nose, which appeared to be a useful organ, but did not add to his beauty, as I knew beauty. He was dubbed sorcerer from his wondrous skill in budding limbs and organs. The tale is told that one evening he slowly sawed his leg off with a blunt stone and then lay for two days in agony while his new leg was sprouting. He was not reputed to be a consistently wise man, but he had periodical flashes of penetration and audacity that none could equal. We sat down and faced one another, about two yards apart. "'Which of us walks over the other?' asked Slowfork. His manner was as calm as the day itself but to my young nature terrible with hidden terrors. I smiled at him, but did not wish for this humiliation. We continued sitting thus in a friendly way for many minutes. "'What is greater than pleasure?' he asked suddenly. I was at an age when one wishes to be thought equal to any emergency, so, concealing my surprise, I applied myself to the conversation as if it were for that purpose we had met. "'Pain,' I replied, "'for pain drives out pleasure.' "'What is greater than pain?' I reflected. "'Love, because we will accept our loved one's share of pain.' "'But what is greater than love?' he persisted. "'Nothing, Slowfork.' "'And what is nothing?' That you must tell me. Tell you I will. This is Shaping's world. He that is a good child here knows pleasure, pain, and love, and gets his rewards. But there is another world, not Shaping's, and there all this is unknown, and another order of things reigns. That world we call nothing, but it is not nothing, but something." there was a pause. "'I have heard,' said I, "'that you are good at growing and ungrowing organs?' "'That's not enough for me. Every organ tells me the same story. 
I want to hear different stories. Is it true, what men say, that your wisdom flows and ebbs in pulses? Quite true, replied Slowfork. But those you had it from did not add that they have always mistaken the flow for the ebb. My experience is, said I sententiously, that wisdom is misery. Perhaps it is, young man, but you have never learned that and never will. For you, the world will continue to wear a noble, awful face. You will never rise above mysticism. But be happy in your own way." Before I realized what he was doing, he jumped tranquilly from the path down into the empty void. He crashed with ever-increasing momentum toward the valley below. I screeched, flung myself down on the ground, and shut my eyes. Often have I wondered which of my ill-considered, juvenile remarks it was that caused this sudden resolution on his part to commit suicide. Whichever it might be, since then I have made it a rigid law never to speak for my own pleasure, but only to help others. I came eventually to the Marist. I threaded its mazes in terror for four days. I was frightened of death but still more terrified at the possibility of losing my sacred attitude toward life. When I was nearly through, and was beginning to congratulate myself, I stumbled across the third extraordinary personage of my experience, the grim mirror-maker. It was under horrible circumstances. On an afternoon, cloudy and stormy, I saw suspended in the air without visible support, a living man. He was hanging in an upright position in front of a cliff. A yawning gulf, a thousand feet deep, lay beneath his feet. I climbed as near as I could and looked on. He saw me and made a wry grimace, like one who wishes to turn his humiliation into humor. The spectacle so astounded me that I could not even grasp what had happened. I am your maker," he cried in a scraping voice which shocked my ears. All my life I have sorbed others. Now I am sorbed. New Clamp and I fell out over a woman. Now New Clamp holds me up like this. While the strength of his will lasts, I shall remain suspended. But when he gets tired, and it can't be long now, I drop into those depths." Had it been another man, I would have tried to save him, but this ogre-like being was too well known to me as one who passed his whole existence in tormenting, murdering, and absorbing others, for the sake of his own delight. I hurried away and did not pause again that day. In Pooling Dread I met Joywind. We walked and talked together for a month, and by that time we found that we loved each other too well to part." Panaw stopped speaking. "'That is a fascinating story,' remarked Maskell. "'Now I begin to know my way around better. But one thing puzzles me.' "'What's that?' "'How it happens that men here are ignorant of tools and arts and have no civilization, and yet contrive to be social in their habits and wise in their thoughts. Do you imagine, then, that love and wisdom spring from tools? But I see how it arises. In your world you have fewer sense-organs, and to make up for the deficiency you have been obliged to call in the assistance of stones and metals. That's by no means a sign of superiority. No, I suppose not," said Maskell. But I see I have a great deal to unlearn. They talked together a little longer, and then gradually fell asleep. Joywind opened her eyes, smiled, and slumbered again. End of chapter 7
of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus, Chapter Eight, The Lusian Plain. Maskell awoke before the others. He got up, stretched himself, and walked out into the sunlight. Brantspell was already declining. He climbed to the top of the crater edge and looked away toward Ifdon. The afterglow of Alpine had by now completely disappeared. The mountain stood up wild and grand. They impressed him like a simple musical theme, the notes of which are widely separated in the scale. A spirit of rashness, daring, and adventure seemed to call to him from them. It was at that moment that the determination flashed into his heart to walk to the Marist and explore its dangers. He returned to the cavern to say good-bye to his hosts. Joy Wynne looked at him with her brave and honest eyes. "'Is this selfishness, Maskell?' she asked. "'Or are you drawn by something stronger than yourself?' "'We must be reasonable,' he answered, smiling. I can't settle down in pooling dread before I found out something about this surprising new planet of yours. Remember what a long way I have come, but very likely I shall come back here." "'Will you make me a promise?' Maskell hesitated. "'Ask nothing difficult, for I hardly know my powers yet. It is not hard, and I wish it. Promise this, never to raise your hand against a living creature, either to strike pluck or eat, without first recollecting its mother who suffered for it." "'Perhaps I won't promise that,' said Maskell slowly. "'But I'll undertake something more tangible. I will never lift my hand against a living creature without first recollecting you, Joywind.' She turned a little pale. "'Now, if Panaw knew that Panaw existed, he might be jealous.' Panaw put his hand on her gently. "'You would not talk like that in Shaping's presence,' he said. "'No, forgive me. I am not quite myself. Perhaps it is Maskell's blood in my veins. Now let us bid him adieu. Let us pray that he will do only honorable deeds, wherever he may be.' "'I'll set Maskell on his way,' said Panaw. "'There's no need,' replied Maskell. "'The way is plain.' But talking shortens the road. Maskell turned to go. Joy Wind pulled him around toward her softly. You won't think badly of other women on my account? You are a blessed spirit, answered he. She trod quietly to the inner extremity of the cave and stood there thinking. Panaw and Maskell emerged into the open air. Halfway down the cliff face a little spring was encountered. Its water was colorless, transparent, but gaseous. As soon as Maskell had satisfied his thirst, he felt himself different. His surroundings were so real to him in their vividness and color, so unreal in their phantom-like mystery, that he scrambled downhill like one in a winter's dream. When they reached the plain, he saw in front of them an interminable forest of tall trees, the shapes of which were extraordinarily foreign-looking. The leaves were crystalline, and, looking upward, it was as if he were gazing through a roof of glass. The moment they got underneath the trees, the light rays of the sun continued to come through, white, savage, and blazing. But they were gilded of heat. Then it was not hard to imagine that they were wandering through cool, bright elfin glades. Through the forest, beginning at their very feet, an avenue perfectly straight and not very wide, went forward as far as the eye could see. Maskell wanted to talk to his traveling companion, but was somehow unable to find words. Panaw glanced at him with an inscrutable smile, stern yet enchanting and half-feminine. He then broke the silence, but strangely enough Maskell could not make out whether he was singing or speaking. From his lips issued a slow, musical restative, exactly like a bewitching adagio from a low-toned stringed instrument. But there was a difference. Instead of the repetition and variation of one or two short themes, as in music, Panaw's theme was prolonged, it never came to an end, 
but rather resembled a conversation in rhythm and melody. And, at the same time, it was no restative, for it was not declamatory. It was a long, quiet stream of lovely emotion. Maskell listened, entranced, yet agitated. The song, if it might be termed a song, seemed to be always just on the point of becoming clear and intelligible, not with the intelligibility of words, but in the way one sympathizes with another's moods and feelings, and Maskell felt that something important was about to be uttered, which would explain all that had gone before. But it was invariably postponed. He never understood, and yet, somehow, he did understand. Late in the afternoon they came to a clearing, and there Panos ceased his restative. He slowed his pace and stopped, in the fashion of a man who wishes to convey that he intends to go no farther. "'What is the name of this country?' asked Maskell. "'It is the Lusian Plain.' "'Was that music in the nature of a temptation? Do you wish me not to go on?' "'Your work lies before you, and not behind you. What was it, then? What work do you allude to? It must have seemed like something to you, Maskell. It seemed like shaping music to me." The instant he had absently uttered these words, Maskell wondered why he had done so, as they now appeared meaningless to him. Panna, however, showed no surprise. "'Shaping will find you everywhere.' "'Am I dreaming or awake?' You are awake." Maskell fell into deep thought. "'So be it,' he said, rousing himself. "'Now I will go on. But where must I sleep to-night?' "'You will reach a broad river. On that you can travel to the foot of the Maris to-morrow. But to-night you had better sleep where the forest and river meet.' "'Adieu, then, Panaw. But do you wish to say anything more to me?' "'Only this, Maskell. Wherever you go, help to make the world beautiful, and not ugly. That's more than any of us can undertake. I am a simple man, and have no ambitions in the way of beautifying life. But tell Joywind I will try to keep myself pure." They parted rather coldly. Maskell stood erect where they had stopped, and watched Panna out of sight. He sighed more than once he became aware that something was about to happen. The air was breathless. The late afternoon sunshine, unobstructed, wrapped his frame in voluptuous heat. A solitary cloud, immensely high, raced through the sky overhead. A single trumpet note sounded in the far distance from somewhere behind him. It gave him an impression of being several miles away at first, but then it slowly swelled and came nearer and nearer, at the same time that it increased in volume. Still the same note sounded, but now it was as if blown by a giant trumpeter immediately over his head. Then it gradually diminished in force and traveled away in front of him. It ended very faintly and distantly. He felt himself alone with nature. A sacred stillness came over his heart past and future were forgotten. The forest, the sun, the day did not exist for him. He was unconscious of himself. He had no thoughts and no feelings. Yet never had life had such an altitude for him. A man stood with crossed arms right in his path. He was so clothed that his limbs were exposed, while his body was covered. He was young rather than old. Maskell observed that his countenance possessed none of the special organs of torments, to which he had not even yet become reconciled. He was smooth-faced. His whole person seemed to radiate an excess of life, like the trembling of air on a hot day. His eyes had such force that Maskell could not meet them. He addressed Maskell by name, in an extraordinary voice. It had a double tone. The primary one sounded far away, the second was an undertone, like a sympathetic tanging string. Maskell felt a rising joy, as he continued standing in the presence of this individual. 
he believed that something good was happening to him. He found it physically difficult to bring any words out. Why do you stop me? Maskell, look well at me. Who am I? I think you are shaping. I am Surtur. Maskell again attempted to meet his eyes, but felt as if he were being stabbed. You know that this is my world. Why do you think I have brought you here? I wish you to serve me. Maskell could no longer speak. Those who joke at my world, continued the vision, those who make a mock of its stern, eternal rhythm, its beauty and sublimity, which are not skin-deep, but proceed from fathomless roots, they shall not escape. I do not mock it. Ask me your questions, and I will answer them. I have nothing. It is necessary for you to serve me, Maskell. Do you not understand? You are my servant and helper. I shall not fail. This is for my sake, and not for yours." These last words had no sooner left Surtur's mouth than Maskell saw him spring suddenly upward and outward. Looking up at the vault of the sky, he saw the whole expanse of vision filled by Surtur's form. Not as a concrete man, but as a vast, concave cloud image, looking down and frowning at him. Then the spectacle vanished as a light goes out. Maskell stood inactive, with a thumping heart. Now he again heard the solitary trumpet note. The sound began this time faintly in the far distance in front of him, traveled slowly toward him with regularly increasing intensity, passed overhead at its loudest, and then grew more and more quiet, wonderful, and solemn, as it fell away in the rear, until the note was merged in the death-like silence of the forest. It appeared to Maskell like the closing of a marvelous and important chapter. Simultaneously with the fading away of the sound, the heavens seemed to open up with the rapidity of lightning into a blue vault of immeasurable height. He breathed a great breath, stretched all his limbs, and looked around him with a slow smile. After a while he resumed his journey. His brain was all dark and confused but one idea was already beginning to stand out from the rest, huge, shapeless, and grand, like the growing image in the soul of a creative artist, the staggering thought that he was a man of destiny. The more he reflected upon all that had occurred since his arrival in this new world, and even before leaving Earth, the clearer and more indisputable it became that he could not be here for his own purposes, but must be here for an end but what that end was he could not imagine. Through the forest he saw Branch Spell at last sinking in the west. It looked a stupendous ball of red fire. Now he could realize at his ease what a sun it was. The avenue took an abrupt turn to the left and began to descend steeply. A wide rolling river of clear and dark water was visible in front of him, no great way off. It flowed from north to south. The forest path led him straight to its banks. Maskell stood there and regarded the lapping, gurgling waters pensively. On the opposite bank, the forest continued. Miles to the south, pooling dread could just be distinguished. On the northern skyline, the Ifdon Mountains loomed up, high, wild, beautiful, and dangerous. They were not a dozen miles away. Like the first mutterings of a thunderstorm, the first faint breaths of cool wind, Maskell felt the stirrings of passion in his heart. In spite of his bodily fatigue, he wished to test his strength against something. This craving he identified with the crags of the Marist. They seemed to have the same magical attraction for his will as the lodestone for iron. He kept biting his nails as he turned his eyes in that direction wondering if it would not be possible to conquer the heights that evening. But when he glanced back at Pooling Dread, he remembered Joy Wind and Panaw, and grew more tranquil. He decided to make his bed at this spot, and to set off as soon after daybreak as he should awake. 
He drank at the river, washed himself, and lay down on the bank to sleep. By this time, so far had his idea progressed that he cared nothing for the possible dangers of the night. He confided in his star. Branch spell set, the day faded, night with its terrible weight came on, and through it all Maskell slept. Long before midnight, however, he was awakened by a crimson glow in the sky. He opened his eyes and wondered where he was. He felt heaviness and pain. The red glow was a terrestrial phenomenon. It came from among the trees. He got up and went toward the source of the light. Away from the river, not a hundred feet off, he nearly stumbled across the form of a sleeping woman. The object which admitted the crimson rays was lying on the ground, several yards away from her. It was like a small jewel, throwing off sparks of red light. He barely threw a glance at that, however. The woman was clothed in the large skin of an animal. She had big, smooth, shapely limbs, rather muscular than fat. Her magen was not a thin tentacle, but a third arm, terminating in a hand. Her face, which was upturned, was wild, powerful, and exceedingly handsome. But he saw with surprise that in place of a breve on her forehead she possessed another eye. All three were closed. The color of her skin in the crimson glow he could not distinguish. He touched her gently with his hand. She awoke calmly and looked up at him without stirring a muscle. All three eyes stared at him, but the two lower ones were dull and vacant, mere carriers of vision. The middle upper one alone expressed her inner nature. Its haughty, unflinching glare had yet something seductive and alluring in it. Maskell felt a challenge in that look of lordly, feminine will, and his manner instinctively stiffened. She sat up. "'Can you speak my language?' he asked. I wouldn't put such a question, but others have been able to. Why should you imagine that I can't read your mind? Is it so extremely complex?" She spoke in a rich, lingering, musical voice, which delighted him to listen to. No, but you have no breve. Well, but haven't I a sorb which is better? And she pointed to the eye on her brow. What is your name? Oshiax. And where do you come from? If dawn. These contemptuous replies began to irritate him, and yet the mere sound of her voice was fascinating. I am going there tomorrow, he remarked. She laughed, as if against her will, but made no comment. My name is Maskell, he went on. I am a stranger, from another world. So I should judge from your absurd appearance." "'Perhaps it would be as well to say at once,' said Maskell bluntly. "'Are we, or are we not, to be friends?' She yawned and stretched her arms, without rising. "'Why should we be friends? If I thought you were a man, I might accept you as a lover.' "'You must look elsewhere for that.' "'So be it, Maskell. Now go away and leave me in peace." She dropped her head again to the ground, but did not at once close her eyes. "'What are you doing here?' he interrogated. "'Oh, we if dawn folk occasionally come here to sleep, for there, often enough, it is a night for us which has no next morning.' Being such a terrible place, and seeing that I am a total stranger, it would be merely courteous if he were to warn me what I have to expect in the way of dangers. I am perfectly and utterly indifferent to what becomes of you," retorted Oshiax. "'Are you returning in the morning?' persisted Maskell. "'If I wish. Then we will go together.' She got up again on her elbow. "'Instead of making plans for other people, I would do a very necessary thing. Pray, tell me." Well, there's no reason why I should, but I will. I would try to convert my women's organs into men's organs. It is a man's country. 
Speak more plainly. Oh, it's plain enough. If you attempt to pass through Ifdon without a sorb, you are simply committing suicide. And that Magan, too, is worse than useless. You probably know what you are talking about, Oshiax. But what do you advise me to do? She negligently pointed to the light-emitting stone lying on the ground. There is the solution. If you hold that drew to your organs for a good while, perhaps it will start the change, and perhaps nature will do the rest during the night. I promise nothing." Oshiax now really turned her back on Maskell. He considered for a few minutes, and then walked over and to where the stone was lying, and took it in his hand. It was a pebble the size of a hen's egg radiant with crimson light, as though red-hot, and throwing out a continuous shower of small, blood-red sparks. Finally deciding that Oshiax's advice was good, he applied the drood first to his magan and then to his breve. He experienced a cauterizing sensation, a feeling of healing pain. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus. Chapter 9 Oceax. Maskell's second day on Tormance dawned. Brantspell was already above the horizon when he awoke. He was instantly aware that his organs had changed during the night. His fleshy breve was altered into an eye-like sorb. His magan had swelled and developed into a third arm, springing from the breast. The arm gave him at once a sense of greater physical security, but with the sorb he was obliged to experiment, before he could grasp its function. As he lay there in the white sunlight, opening and shutting each of his three eyes in turn, he found that the two lower ones served his understanding the upper one, his will. That is to say, with the lower eyes he saw things in clear detail, but without personal interest. With the sorb he saw nothing as self-existent. Everything appeared as an object of importance or non-importance to his own needs. Rather puzzled as to how this would turn out, he got up and looked about him. He had slept out of sight of Oshiax. He was anxious to learn if she were still on the spot but before going to ascertain he made up his mind to bathe in the river. It was a glorious morning, the hot white sun already began to glare, but its heat was tempered by a strong wind which whistled through the trees. A host of fantastic clouds filled the sky. They looked like animals and were always changing shape. The ground, as well as the leaves and branches of the forest trees, still held traces of heavy dew or rain during the night. A poignantly sweet smell of nature entered his nostrils. His pain was quiescent, and his spirits were high. Before he bathed, he viewed the mountains of the Ifdon Marist. In the morning sunlight they stood out pictorially. He guessed that they were from five to six thousand feet high. The lofty, irregular, castellated lines seemed like the walls of a magic city. The cliffs fronting him were composed of gaudy rocks vermilion, emerald, yellow, ulfire, and black. As he gazed at them his heart began to beat like a slow, heavy drum, and he thrilled all over. Indescribable hopes, aspirations, and emotions came over him. It was more than the conquest of a new world which he felt, it was something different. He bathed and drank, and as he was reclothing himself Oshiak strolled indolently up. He could now perceive the color of her skin. It was a vivid, yet delicate mixture of carmen, white, and jail. The effect was startlingly unearthly. With these new colors she looked like a genuine representative of a strange planet. Her frame also had something curious about it. The curves were womanly, the bones were characteristically female, yet all seemed somehow to express a daring, masculine, underlying will. The commanding eye on her forehead set the same puzzle in plainer language. 
its bold, domineering egotism was shot with undergleams of sex and softness. She came to the river's edge and reviewed him from top to toe. "'Now you are built more like a man,' she said in her lovely, lingering voice. "'You see, the experiment was successful,' he answered, smiling gaily. Oshax continued to look him over. "'Did some woman give you that ridiculous robe?' A woman did give it to me," dropping his smile. But I saw nothing ridiculous in the gift at the time, and I don't now. I think I'd look better in it. As she drawled the words, she began stripping off the skin, which suited her form so well, and motioned to him to exchange garments. He obeyed, rather shamefacedly, for he realized that the proposed exchange was in fact more appropriate to his sex he found the skin a freer dress. Oshiax in her drapery appeared more dangerously feminine to him. "'I don't want you to receive gifts at all from other women,' she remarked slowly. "'Why not? What can I be to you?' "'I have been thinking about you during the night.' Her voice was retarded, scornful, viola-like. She sat down on the trunk of a fallen tree and looked away. In what way? She returned no answer to his question, but began to pull off pieces of the bark. Last night you were so contemptuous. Last night is not today. Do you always walk through the world with your head over your shoulder? It was now Maskell's turn to be silent. Still, if you have male instincts, as I suppose you have, you can't go on resisting me forever. But this is preposterous," said Maskell, opening his eyes wide. Granted that you are a beautiful woman, we can't be quite so primeval. Oshiak sighed and rose to her feet. It doesn't matter. I can wait. From that I gather that you intend to make the journey in my society. I have no objection. In fact, I shall be glad, but only on condition that you drop this language. Yet you do think me beautiful. Why shouldn't I think so, if it is the fact? I fail to see what that has to do with my feelings. Bring it to an end, Oshiax. You will find plenty of men to admire and love you. At that she blazed up. Does love pick and choose, you fool? Do you imagine I am so hard put to it that I have to hunt for lovers? Is not Crim Typhon waiting for me at this very moment? Very well, I am sorry to have hurt your feelings. Now carry the temptation no farther, for it is a temptation where a lovely woman is concerned. I am not my own master. I'm not proposing anything so very hateful, am I? Why do you humiliate me so? Masco put his hands behind his back. I repeat, I am not my own master. Then who is your master? Yesterday I saw Surtur, and from today I am serving him. Did you speak with him? she asked curiously. I did. Tell me what he said. No, I can't. I won't. But whatever he said, his beauty was more tormenting than yours, Oshiax, and that's why I can look at you in cold blood. Did Surtur forbid you to be a man? Maskell frowned. Is love such a manly sport, then? I should have thought it effeminate. It doesn't matter. You won't always be so boyish. But don't try my patience too far. Let's talk about something else. And, above all, let us get on the road." She suddenly broke into a laugh, so rich, sweet, and enchanting, that he grew half inflamed, and half wished to catch her body in his arms. Oh, Maskell, Maskell, what a fool you are! In what way am I a fool? he demanded, scowling not at her words, but at his own weakness. Isn't the whole world the handiwork of innumerable pairs of lovers? And yet you think yourself above all that. You try to fly away from nature, but where will you find a hole to hide yourself in? Besides beauty, I now credit you with a second quality persistence. 
read me well, and then it is natural law that you'll think twice and three times before throwing me away. And now, before we go, we had better eat." "'Eat?' said Maskell, thoughtfully. "'Don't you eat? Is food in the same category as love?' "'What food is it?' "'Fish from the river.' Maskell recollected his promise to Joywind. At the same time, he felt hungry. "'Is there nothing milder?' She pulled her mouth scornfully. "'You came through pulling dread, didn't you? All the people there are the same. They think life is to be looked at and not lived. Now that you are visiting Ifdon, you will have to change your notions.' "'Go catch your fish,' he returned, pulling down his brows. The broad, clear waters flowed past them with swelling undulations, from the direction of the mountains. Oshiaks knelt down on the bank and peered into the depths. Presently her look became tense and concentrated. She dipped her hand in and pulled out some sort of little monster. It was more like a reptile than a fish, with its scaly plates and teeth. She threw it on the ground, and it started crawling about. Suddenly she darted all her will into her sorb. The creature leaped into the air and fell down dead. She picked up a sharp-edged slate and with it removed the scales and entrails. During this operation her hands and garment became stained with the light scarlet blood. "'Find me the druid, Maskell,' she said with a lazy smile. "'You had it last night.' He searched for it. It was hard to locate, for its rays had grown dull and feeble in the sunlight. But at last he found it. Oshiax placed it in the interior of the monster and then left the body lying on the ground. While it's cooking, I'll wash some of this blood away, which frightens you so much. Have you never seen blood before?" Maskell gazed at her in perplexity. The old paradox came back, the contrasting sexual characteristics in her person. Her bold, masterful, masculine egotism of manner seemed quite incongruous with the fascinating and disturbing femininity of her voice. A startling idea flashed into his mind. "'In your country I am told there is an act of will called absorbing. What is that?' She held her red, dripping hands away from her draperies, and uttered a delicious, clashing laugh. "'You think I am half a man? Answer my question.' I am a woman through and through, Maskell, to the marrow-bone, and that's not to say I have never absorbed males. And that means new strings for my harp, Maskell, and a wider range of passions, a stormier heart. For you, yes, but for them? I don't know. The victims don't describe their experiences. Probably unhappiness of some sort, if they still know anything. This is a fearful business," he exclaimed, regarding her gloomily. One would think Ifdon a land of devils! Oshax gave a beautiful sneer as she took a step toward the river. Better men than you, better in every sense of the word, are walking about with foreign wills inside them. You may be as moral as you like, Maskell, but the fact remains, animals were made to be eaten, and simple natures were made to be absorbed and human rights count for nothing." She had bent over the river's edge to wash her arms and hands, but glanced up over her shoulder to answer his remark. "'They do count, but we only regard a man as human for just as long as he's able to hold his own with others.' The flesh was soon cooked, and they breakfasted in silence. Maskell cast heavy, doubtful glances from time to time towards his companion. Whether it was due to the strange quality of the food, or to his long abstention, he did not know, but the meal tasted nauseous, and even cannibalistic. He ate little, and the moment he got up he felt defiled. "'Let me bury this drood, where I can find it some other time,' said Oshiax. "'On the next occasion, though, I shall have no maskal with me to shock. Now we have to take to the river.' They stepped off the land onto the water. It flowed against them with a sluggish current, but the opposition, instead of hindering them, had the contrary effect, 
It caused them to exert themselves, and they moved faster. They climbed the river in this way for several miles. The exercise gradually improved the circulation of Maskell's blood, and he began to look at things in a far more way. The hot sunshine, the diminished wind, the cheerful, marvelous cloud scenery, the quiet crystal forests, all was soothing and delightful. They approached nearer and nearer to the gaily painted heights of Ifdon. There was something enigmatic to him in those bright walls. He was attracted by them, yet felt a sort of awe. They looked real, but at the same time very supernatural. If one could see the portrait of a ghost painted with a hard, firm outline in substantial colors, the feelings produced by such a sight would be exactly similar to Maskell's impressions as he studied the Ifdon precipices. He broke the long silence. Those mountains have most extraordinary shapes. All the lines are straight and perpendicular, no slopes or curves. She walked backward on the water in order to face him. That's typical of Ifdon. Nature is all hammer blows with us, nothing soft and gradual. I hear you, but I don't understand you. All over the Marist you'll find patches of ground plunging down or rushing up. Trees grow fast. Women and men don't think twice before acting. One may call Ifdon a place of quick decisions." Maskell was impressed. A fresh, wild, primitive land. "'How is it where you come from?' asked Oshiax. Oh, mine is a decrepit world, where nature takes a hundred years to move a foot of solid land. Men and animals go about in flocks. Originality is a lost habit. Are there women there? As with you, and not very differently formed. Do they love? He laughed. So much so that it has changed the dress, speech, and thoughts of the whole sex. Probably they are more beautiful than I. No, I think not," said Maskell. There was another rather long silence as they travelled unsteadily onward. "'What is your business in Ifdon?' demanded Oshiak suddenly. He hesitated over his answer. "'Can you grasp that it's possible to have an aim right in front of one, so big that one can't see it as a whole?' She stole a long, inquisitive look at him. What sort of aim? A moral aim. Are you proposing to set the world right? I propose nothing. I am waiting. Don't wait too long, for time doesn't wait, especially in if dawn. Something will happen, said Maskell. Oshiax drew a subtle smile. So you have no special destination in the Marist? No, and if you'll permit me, I will come home with you. Singular man, she said with a short, thrilling laugh. That's what I've been offering all the time. Of course you will come home with me. As for Krim Typhon, you mentioned that name before. Who is he? Oh, my lover, or as you would say, my husband. This doesn't improve matters, said Maskell. It leaves them exactly where they were. We merely have to remove him. We are certainly misunderstanding each other," said Maskell, quite startled. Do you by any chance imagine that I am making a compact with you? You will do nothing against your will, but you have promised to come home with me. Tell me, how do you remove husbands in Ifdon? Either you or I must kill them. He eyed her for a full minute. Now we are passing from folly to insanity. Not at all," replied Oshiax. It is the too sad truth, and when you have seen Krim Typhon, you will realize it. I am aware I am on a strange planet," said Maskell slowly, where all sorts of unheard-of things may happen, and where the very laws of morality may be different. Still, as far as I am concerned, murder is murder, and I'll have no more to do with a woman who wants to make use of me to get rid of her husband. You think me wicked?" demanded Oshiak steadily. Or mad. Then you had better leave me, Maskell. Only—only what? 
You wish to be consistent, don't you? Leave all other mad and wicked people as well. Then you'll find it easier to reform the rest." Maskell frowned, but said nothing. "'Well?' demanded Oshax, with a half-smile. "'I'll come with you, and I'll see Krim Typhon, if only to warn him.' Oshax broke into a cascade of rich, feminine laughter, but whether at the image conjured up by Maska's last words, or from some other cause, he did not know. The conversation dropped. At a distance of a couple of miles from the now towering cliffs, the river made a sharp right-angled turn to the west, and was no longer of use to them on their journey. Maskell stared up doubtfully. "'It's a stiff climb for a hot morning.' "'Let's rest here a little,' said she, indicating a smooth flat island of black rock, standing up just out of the water in the middle of the river. They accordingly went to it, and Maskell sat down. Oshiax, however, standing gracefully and erect, turned her face toward the cliffs opposite, and uttered a piercing and peculiar call. "'What is that for?' She did not answer. After waiting a minute, she repeated the call. Maskell now saw a large bird detach itself from the top of one of the precipices, and sail slowly down toward them. It was followed by two others. The flight of these birds was exceedingly slow and clumsy. "'What are they?' he asked. She still returned no answer, but smiled rather peculiarly and sat down beside him. Before many minutes he was able to distinguish the shapes and colors of the flying monsters. They were not birds, but creatures with long, snake-like bodies, and ten reptilian legs apiece, terminating in fins which acted as wings. The bodies were of bright blue, the legs and fins were yellow. They were flying, without haste, but in a somewhat ominous fashion, straight toward them. He could make out a long, thin spiking projection from each of the heads. They are shrouks, explained Oshiax at last. If you want to know their intention, I'll tell you. To make a meal of us. First all of their spikes will pierce us, and then their mouths, which are really suckers, will drain us dry of blood. Pretty thoroughly, too. There are no half-measures with shrouks. They are toothless beasts, so don't eat flesh." "'As you show such admirable sang-froid,' said Maskell dryly, "'I take it there is no particular danger.' Nevertheless, he instinctively tried to get on to his feet, and failed. A new form of paralysis was chaining him to the ground. "'Are you trying to get up?' asked Oshiak smoothly. "'Well, yes, but those cursed reptiles seem to be nailing me down to the rock with their wills. May I ask if you had any special object in view in waking them up?' "'I assure you the danger is quite real, Maskell. Instead of talking and asking questions, you had much better see what you can do with your will.' I seem to have no will, unfortunately." Oshiax was seized with a paroxysm of laughter, but it was still rich and beautiful. It's obvious you aren't a very heroic protector, Maskell. It seems I must play the man and you the woman. I expected better things of your big body. Why, my husband would send those creatures dancing all around the sky by way of a joke before disposing of them. Now watch me. Two of the three I'll kill, the third we will ride home on. Which one shall we keep?" The shrouks continued their slow, wobbling flight toward them. Their bodies were of huge size. They produced in Maskell the same sensation of loathing as insects did. He instinctively understood that as they hunted with their wills there was no necessity for them to possess a swift motion. "'Choose which you please,' he said shortly. "'They are equally objectionable to me.' "'Then I'll choose the leader, as it is presumably the most energetic animal. Watch now.' She stood upright, and her sorb suddenly blazed with fire. Maskell felt something snap inside his brain. His limbs were free once more. The two monsters in the rear staggered and darted head foremost toward the earth, one after the other. 
he watched them crash on the ground and then lie motionless. The leader still came toward them, but he fancied that its flight was altered in character. It was no longer menacing, but tame and unwilling. Oshax guided it with her will to the mainland shore opposite their island rock. Its vast bulk lay there extended, awaiting her pleasure. They immediately crossed the water. Maskell viewed the shrouk at close quarters. It was about thirty feet long. Its bright-colored skin was shining, slippery, and leathery. A mane of black hair covered its long neck. Its face was awesome and unnatural, with its carnivorous eyes, frightful stiletto, and blood-sucking cavity. There were true fins on its back and tail. "'Have you a good seat?' asked Oshiax, patting the creature's flank. "'As I have to steer, let me jump on first. She pulled up her gown, then climbed up and sat astride the animal's back, just behind the mane, which she clutched. Between her and the fin there was just room for Maskell. He grasped the two flanks with his outer hands, his third, new arm, pressed against Oshiax's back, and for additional security he was compelled to encircle her waist with it. Directly he did so, he realized that he had been tricked, and that this ride had been planned for one purpose only, to inflame his desires. The third arm possessed a function of its own, of which hitherto he had been ignorant. It was a developed magan, but the stream of love which was communicated to it was no longer pure and noble. It was boiling, passionate, and torturing. He gritted his teeth and kept quiet but Oshiax had not plotted the adventure to remain unconscious of his feelings. She looked around with a golden, triumphant smile. "'The ride will last some time, so hold on well.' Her voice was soft like a flute, but rather malicious. Maskell grinned and said nothing. He dared not remove his arm. The shrouk straddled onto its legs. It jerked itself forward and rose slowly and uncouthly in the air. They began to paddle upward toward the painted cliffs. The motion was swaying, rocking, and sickening. The contact of the brute's slimy skin was disgusting. All this, however, was merely background to Maskell, as he sat there with closed eyes, holding on to Oshiax. In the front and center of his consciousness was the knowledge that he was gripping a fair woman and that her flesh was responding to his touch like a lovely harp. They climbed up and up. He opened his eyes and ventured to look around him. By this time they were already level with the top of the outer rampart of the precipices. There now came in sight a wild archipelago of islands, with jagged outlines emerging from a sea of air. The islands were mountain summits or, more accurately speaking, the country was a high tableland, fissured everywhere by narrow and apparently bottomless cracks. These cracks were in some cases like canals, in others like lakes, in others merely holes in the ground, closed in all round. The perpendicular sides of the islands, that is, the upper, visible parts of the innumerable cliff faces, were of bare rock, gaudily colored but the level surfaces were a tangle of wild plant life. The taller trees alone were distinguishable from the shrouk's back. They were of different shapes and did not look ancient. They were slender and swaying, but did not appear very graceful. They looked tough, wiry, and savage. As Maskell continued to explore the landscape, he forgot Oshiax and his passion. Other strange feelings came to the front. The morning was gay and bright. The sun scorched down, quickly changing clouds sailed across the sky, and the earth was vivid, wild, and lonely. Yet he experienced no aesthetic sensations. He felt nothing but an intense longing for action and possession. When he looked at anything, he immediately wanted to deal with it. The atmosphere of the land seemed not free, but sticky. Attraction and repulsion were its constituents. Apart from his wish to play a personal part in what was going on around and beneath him, the scenery had no significance for him. So preoccupied was he that his arm partly released its clasp. 
Oshaks turned around to gaze at him. Whether or not she was satisfied with what she saw, she uttered a low laugh, like a peculiar chord. "'Cold again so quickly, Maskell?' "'What do you want?' he asked absently, still looking over the side. "'It's extraordinary how drawn I feel to all this.' "'You wish to take a hand?' "'I wish to get down. Oh, we have a good way to go yet. So you really feel different?' "'Different from what? What are you talking about?' said Maskell, still lost in abstraction. Oshiaks laughed again. "'It would be strange if we couldn't make a man of you, for the material is excellent.' After that she turned her back once more. The air islands differ from water islands in another way. They were not on a plain surface, but sloped upward, like a succession of broken terraces, as the journey progressed. The Shrouk had hitherto been flying well above the ground, but now, when a new line of towering cliffs confronted them, Oshiaks did not urge the beast upward, but caused it to enter a narrow canyon, which intersected the mountains like a channel. They were instantly plunged into deep shade. The canal was not above thirty feet wide. The wall stretched upward on both sides for many hundred feet. It was as cool as an ice chamber. When Maskell attempted to plumb the chasm with his eyes, he saw nothing but black obscurity. "'What is at the bottom?' he asked. "'Death for you, if you go to look for it.' "'We know that. I mean, is there any kind of life down there?' "'Not that I have ever heard of,' said Oshiaks. "'But, of course, all things are possible.' "'I think very likely there is life,' he returned thoughtfully. Her ironic laugh sounded out of the gloom. "'Shall we go down and see?' "'You find that amusing?' "'No, not that. What I do find amusing is the big stranger with the beard, who is so keenly interested in everything except himself.' Maskell then laughed, too. "'I happen to be the only thing in torments which is not a novelty for me.' "'Yes but I am a novelty for you." The channel went zigzagging its way through the belly of the mountain, and all the time they were gradually rising. "'At least I have heard nothing like your voice before,' said Maskell, who, since he had no longer anything to look at, was at last ready for conversation. "'What's the matter with my voice?' "'It's all that I can distinguish of you now. That's why I mentioned it. Isn't it clear? Don't I speak distinctly? Oh, it's clear enough, but it's inappropriate. Inappropriate? I won't explain further, said Maskell, but whether you are speaking or laughing, your voice is by far the loveliest and strangest instrument I have ever listened to. And yet, I repeat, it is inappropriate. You mean that my nature doesn't correspond? He was just considering his reply when their talk was abruptly broke off by a huge and terrifying, but not very loud, sound rising up from the gulf directly underneath them. It was a low, grinding, roaring thunder. "'The ground is rising under us!' cried Oshiaks. "'Shall we escape?' She made no answer, but urged the Shrouk's flight upward, at such a steep gradient that they retained their seats with difficulty. The floor of the canyon, upheaved by some mighty subterranean force, could be heard and almost felt coming up after them, like a gigantic landslip in the wrong direction. The cliffs cracked and fragments began to fall. A hundred awful noises filled the air, growing louder and louder each second, splitting, hissing, cracking, grinding, booming, exploding, roaring. When they still had fifty feet or so to go to reach the top, a sort of dark, indefinite sea of broken rocks and soil appeared under their feet, ascending rapidly with irresistible might, accompanied by the most horrible noises. The canal was filled up for two hundred yards before and behind them. Millions of tons of solid matter seemed to be raised. The shrouk in its ascent was caught by the uplifted debris. Beast and riders experienced in that moment all the horrors of an earthquake. 
they were rolled violently over and thrown among the rocks and dirt. All was thunder, instability, motion, confusion. Before they had time to realize their position, they were in the sunlight. The upheaval still continued. In another minute or two the valley floor had formed a new mountain, a hundred feet or more higher than the old. Then its movement ceased suddenly. Every noise stopped, as if by magic. Not a rock moved. Oshiax and Maskell picked themselves up and examined themselves for cuts and bruises. The Shrouk lay on its side, panting violently and sweating with fright. "'That was a nasty affair,' said Maskell, flicking the dirt off his person. Oshiax staunched a cut on her chin with a corner of her robe. "'It might have been far worse. I mean, it's bad enough to come up with, but it's death to go down, and that happens just as often.' Whatever induces you to live in such a country? I don't know, Maskell. Habit, I suppose. I have often thought of moving out of it. A good deal must be forgiven you for having to spend your life in a place like this, where one is obviously never safe from one minute to another. You will learn by degrees, she answered, smiling. She looked hard at the monster, and got it heavily to its feet. Get on again, Maskell she directed, climbing back to her perch. We haven't too much time to waste. He obeyed. They resumed their interrupted flight, this time over the mountains, and in full sunlight. Maskell settled down again to his thoughts. The peculiar atmosphere of the country continued to soak into his brain. His will became so restless and uneasy that merely to sit there in inactivity was a torture he could scarcely endure not to be doing something. "'How secretive you are, Maskell,' said Oshiax quietly, without turning her head. "'What secrets? What do you mean?' "'Oh, I know perfectly well what's passing inside you. Now I think it wouldn't be amiss to ask you, is friendship still enough?' "'Oh, don't ask me anything,' growled Maskell. I far too many problems in my head already. I only wish I could answer some of them." He stared stonily at the landscape. The beast was winging its way toward a distant mountain of singular shape. It was an enormous natural quadrilateral pyramid, rising in great terraces and terminating in a broad flat top, on which what looked like green snow still lingered. "'What mountain is that?' he asked. Discorn the highest point in Ifdon. Are we going there? Why should we go there? But if you are going on farther, it might be worth your while to pay a visit to the top. It commands the whole land as far as the sinking sea and Swaylone's island, and beyond. You can also see Alpine from it. That's a sight I mean to see before I have finished. Do you, Maskell? She turned around and put her hand on his wrist. "'Stay with me, and one day we'll go to Discorn together.' He grunted unintelligibly. There were no signs of human existence in the country under their feet. While Maskell was still grimly regarding it, a large tract of forest, not far ahead, bearing many trees and rocks, suddenly subsided with an awful roar and crashed down into an invisible gulf. What was solid land one minute became a clean-cut chasm the next. He jumped violently up with the shock. This is frightful! Oshiax remained unmoved. Why, life here must be absolutely impossible, he went on, when he had somewhat recovered himself. A man would need nerves of steel. Is there no means at all of foreseeing a catastrophe like this? Oh, I suppose we wouldn't be alive if there weren't," replied Oshiax, with composure. We are more or less clever at it, but that doesn't prevent our often getting caught. You had better teach me the signs. We'll have many things to go over together, and among them, I expect, will be whether we are to stay in the land at all. But first, let us get home. How far is it now? It is right in front of you said Oshiax, pointing with her forefinger. You can see it. 
he followed the direction of her finger, and after a few questions, made out the spot she was indicating. It was a broad peninsula, about two miles distant. Three of its sides rose sheer out of a lake of air, the bottom of which was invisible. Its fourth was a bottleneck, joining it to the mainland. It was overgrown with bright vegetation, distinct in the brilliant atmosphere. A single tall tree, shooting up in the middle of the peninsula, dwarfed everything else. It was wide and shady, with sea-green leaves. "'I wonder if Crim Typhon is there,' remarked Oceax. "'Can I see two figures, or am I mistaken?' "'I also see something,' said Maskell. In twenty minutes they were directly above the peninsula, at a height of about fifty feet. The Shrouk slackened speed and came to earth on the mainland, exactly at the gateway of the isthmus. They both descended, Maskell with aching thighs. "'What shall we do with the monster?' asked Oceax. Without waiting for a suggestion, she patted its hideous face with her hand. "'Fly away home. I may want you some other time.' It gave a stupid grunt, elevated itself on its legs again, and after half running, half flying for a few yards, rose awkwardly into the air and paddled away in the same direction from which they had come. They watched it out of sight, and then Oceac started to cross the neck of the land, followed by Maskell. Branch Spell's white rays beat down on them with pitiless force. The sky had by degrees become cloudless and the wind had dropped entirely. The ground was a rich riot of vividly colored ferns, shrubs, and grasses. Through these could be seen here and there the golden chalky soil, and occasionally a glittering white metallic boulder. Everything looked extraordinary and barbaric. Maskell was at last walking in the weird Ifdon Marist, which had created such strange feelings in him when seen from a distance and now he felt no wonder or curiosity at all, but only desired to meet human beings. So intense had grown his will. He longed to test his powers on his fellow creatures, and nothing else seemed of the least importance to him. On the peninsula all was coolness and delicate shade. It resembled a large copse, about two acres in extent. In the heart of the tangle of small trees and undergrowth was a partially cleared space, perhaps the roots of the giant tree growing in the center had killed off the smaller fry all around it. By the side of the tree sparkled a little bubbling fountain, whose water was iron-red. The precipices on all sides, overhung with thorns, flowers, and creepers, invested the enclosure with an air of wild and charming seclusion. A mythological mountain god might have dwelt here. Maskell's restless eye left everything to fall on the two men who formed the center of the picture. One was reclining, in the ancient Grecian fashion of banqueters on a tall couch of mosses, sprinkled with flowers. He rested on one arm and was eating a kind of plum with calm enjoyment. A pile of these plums lay on the couch beside him. The overspreading branches of the tree completely sheltered him from the sun. His small boyish form was clad in a rough skin, leaving his limbs naked. Maskell could not tell from his face whether he were a young boy or a grown man. The features were smooth, soft, and childish. Their expression was seraphically tranquil. But his violet upper eye was sinister and adult. His skin was of the color of yellow ivory. His long curling hair matched his sorb. It was violet. The second man was standing erect before the other, a few feet away from him. He was short and muscular, his face was broad, bearded, and rather commonplace, but there was something terrible about his appearance. The features were distorted by a deep-seated look of pain, despair, and horror. Oceax, without pausing, strolled lightly and lazily up to the outermost shadows of the tree, some distance from the couch. "'We have met with an uplift,' she remarked carelessly, looking toward the youth. He eyed her, but said nothing. "'How is your plant-man getting on?' Her tone was artificial, 
but extremely beautiful. While waiting for an answer, she sat down on the ground, her legs gracefully thrust under her body, and pulled down the skirt of her robe. Maskell remained standing just behind her, with crossed arms. There was silence for a minute. "'Why don't you answer your mistress, Satcher? said the boy on the couch, in a calm, treble voice. The man addressed did not alter his expression, but replied in a strangled tone, "'I am getting on very well, Oshiaks. There are already buds on my feet. Tomorrow I hope to take root.' Masco felt a rising storm inside him. He was perfectly aware that although these words were uttered by Satcher, they were being dictated by the boy. "'What he says is quite true,' remarked the latter. "'Tomorrow roots will reach the ground, and in a few days they ought to be well established. Then I shall set to work to convert his arms into branches, and his fingers into leaves.' It will take longer to transform his head into a crown, but still, I hope, in fact, I can almost promise that within a month you and I, Oshiaks, will be plucking and enjoying fruit from this new and remarkable tree. I love these natural experiments, he concluded, putting out his hand for another plum. They thrill me. This must be a joke, said Maskell, taking a step forward. The youth looked at him serenely. He made no reply, but Maskell felt as if he were being thrust backward by an iron hand on his throat. "'The morning's work is now concluded, Satcher. Come here again after blood somber. After tonight you will remain here permanently, I expect, so you had better set to work to clear a patch of ground for your roots. Never forget, however fresh and charming these plants appear to you now, in the future they will be your deadliest rivals and enemies. Now you may go." The man limped painfully away, across the isthmus, out of sight. Oshiaks yawned. Maskell pushed his way forward, as if against a wall. "'Are you joking, or are you a devil?' "'I am Krim Typhon. I never joke. For that epithet of yours, I will devise a new punishment for you. The duel of wills commenced without ceremony. Oshiaks got up, stretched her beautiful limbs, smiled, and prepared herself to witness the struggle between her old lover and her new. Krim Typhon smiled, too. He reached out his hand for more fruit, but did not eat it. Maskell's self-control broke down, and he dashed at the boy, choking with red fury. His beard wagged, and his face was crimson. When he realized with whom he had to deal, Crimp Typhon left off smiling, slipped off the couch, and threw a terrible and malignant glare into his sorb. Maskell staggered. He gathered together all the brute force of his will, and by sheer weight continued his advance. The boy shrieked and ran behind the couch, trying to get away. His opposition suddenly collapsed. Maskell stumbled forward, recovered himself, and then vaulted clear over the high pile of mosses to get at his antagonist. He fell on top of him with all his bulk. Grasping his throat, he pulled his little head completely around so that the neck was broken. Krim Typhon immediately died. The corpse lay underneath the tree with its face upturned. Maskell viewed it attentively, and as he did so, an expression of awe and wonder came into his own countenance. In the moment of death, Krim Typhon's face had undergone a startling and even shocking alteration. Its personal character had wholly vanished, giving place to a vulgar, grinning mask which expressed nothing. He did not have to search his mind long to remember where he had seen the brother of that expression. It was identical with that on the face of the apparition at the seance, after Cragg had dealt with it. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus. Chapter 10. Tidomon. 
Oshiak sat down carelessly on the couch of mosses and began eating the plums. "'You see, you had to kill him, Maskell,' she said in a rather quizzical voice. He came away from the corpse and regarded her, still red and still breathing hard. "'It's no joking matter. You especially ought to keep quiet.' "'Why? Because he was your husband.' You think I ought to show grief when I feel none? Don't pretend, woman." Oshiak smiled. From your manner one would think you were accusing me of some crime. Maskell literally snorted at her words. What? You live with filth, you live in the arms of a morbid monstrosity, and then—oh, now I grasp it," she said in a tone of perfect detachment. I'm glad. Well, Maskell, she proceeded after a pause, and who gave you the right to rule my conduct? Am I not mistress of my own person?" He looked at her with disgust, but said nothing. There was another long interval of silence. I never loved him, said Oshiax at last, looking at the ground. That makes it all the worse. What does all this mean? What do you want?" Nothing from you, absolutely nothing, thank heaven. She gave a hard laugh. You come here with your foreign preconceptions and expect us all to bow down to them. What preconceptions? Just because Krim Typhon's sports are strange to you, you murder him, and you would like to murder me. Sports? That diabolical cruelty! Oh, you're sentimental," said Oshiax contemptuously. Why do you need to make such a fuss over that man? Life is life, all the world over, and one form is as good as another. He was only to be made a tree, like a million other trees. If they can endure the life, why can't he? And this is if dawn morality. Oshiax began to grow angry. It's you who have peculiar ideas. You rave about the beauty of flowers and trees. You think them divine. But when it's a question of taking on this divine, fresh, pure, enchanting loveliness yourself, in your own person, it immediately becomes a cruel and wicked degradation. Here we have a strange riddle, in my opinion. Oshiax, you're a beautiful, heartless, wild beast, nothing more. If you weren't a woman—" Well, curling her lip, let us hear what would happen if I weren't a woman. Maskell bit his nails. It doesn't matter. I can't touch you, though there's certainly not the difference of a hair between you and your boy husband. For this you may well thank my foreign preconceptions. Farewell." He turned to go. Oshiax's eyes slanted at him through their long lashes. Where are you off to, Maskell? That's a matter of no importance, for wherever I go it must be a change for the better. You walking whirlpools of crime!" Wait a minute. I only want to say this. Bloodsomber is just starting, and you had better stay here till the afternoon. We can quickly put that body out of sight, and as you seem to detest me so much, the place is big enough, we needn't talk or even see each other. I don't wish to breathe the same air. Singular man! She was sitting erect and motionless, like a beautiful statue. And what of your wonderful interview with Surtur, and all the undone things which you set out to do? You aren't the one I shall speak to about that. But— He eyed her meditatively. While I'm still here, you can tell me this. What's the meaning of the expression on that corpse's face? Is that another crime, Maskell? All dead people look like that. Ought they not to? I once heard it called Crystalman's face. Why not? We are all daughters and sons of Crystalman. It is doubtless the family resemblance. It has also been told me that Surtur and Crystalman are one and the same. 
you have wise and truthful acquaintances. Then how could it have been Surtur whom I saw? said Maskell, more to himself than to her. That apparition was something quite different. She dropped her mocking manner, and, sliding imperceptibly toward him, gently pulled his arm. You see, we have to talk. Sit down beside me, and ask me your questions. I'm not excessively smart, but I'll try to be of assistance." Maskell permitted himself to be dragged down with soft violence. She bent toward him, as if confidentially, and contrived that her sweet, cool, feminine breath should fan his cheek. "'Aren't you here to alter the evil to the good, Maskell? Then what does it matter who sent you?' "'What can you possibly know of good and evil?' Are you only instructing the initiated? Who am I to instruct anybody? However, you're quite right. I wish to do what I can, not because I am qualified, but because I am here." Oshiax's voice dropped to a whisper. You're a giant, both in body and soul. What you want to do, you can do. Is that your honest opinion? or are you flattering me for your own ends?" She sighed. "'Don't you see how difficult you are making the conversation? Let's talk about your work, not about ourselves.' Maskell suddenly noticed a strange blue light glowing in the northern sky. It was from Alpane, but Alpane itself was behind the hills. While he was observing it, a peculiar wave of self-denial of a disquieting nature passed through him. He looked at Oshiax, and it struck him for the first time that he was being unnecessarily brutal to her. He had forgotten that she was a woman and defenseless. "'Won't you stay?' she asked all of a sudden, quite openly and frankly. "'Yes, I think I'll stay,' he replied slowly. "'And another thing, Oshiax. If I've misjudged your character, pray forgive me. I'm a hasty, passionate man." There are enough easy-going men. Hard knocks are a good medicine for vicious hearts. And you didn't misjudge my character, as far as you went, only every woman has more than one character. Don't you know that?" During the pause that followed, a snapping of twigs was heard, and both looked around, startled they saw a woman stepping slowly across the neck that separated them from the mainland. Tidamon, muttered Oshiax, in a vexed, frightened voice. She immediately moved away from Maskell and stood up. The newcomer was of middle height, very slight and graceful. She was no longer quite young. Her face wore the composure of a woman who knows her way about the world. It was intensely pale and under its quiescence there was just a glimpse of something strange and dangerous. It was curiously alluring, though not exactly beautiful. Her hair was clustering and boyish, reaching only to the neck. She was of a strange indigo color. She was quaintly attired in a tunic and breeches, pieced together from the square blue-green plates of some reptile. Her small ivory-white breasts were exposed. Her sorb was black and sad, rather contemplative. Without once glancing up at Oshiax and Maskell, she quietly glided straight toward Kremtyphon's corpse. When she arrived within a few feet of it, she stopped and looked down, with arms folded. Oshiax drew Maskell a little away, and whispered, "'It's Kremtyphon's other wife, who lives under Discorn. She's a most dangerous woman. Be careful what you say.' If she asks you to do anything, refuse it outright." The poor soul looks harmless enough. Yes, she does, but the poor soul is quite capable of swallowing up Craig himself. Now play the man." The murmur of their voices seemed to attract Tidaman's notice, for she now slowly turned her eyes toward them. "'Who killed him?' she demanded. Her voice was so soft, low, and refined that Maskell hardly was able to catch the words. The sounds, however, lingered in his ears, 
and curiously enough seemed to grow stronger instead of fainter. Oshiax whispered, "'Don't say a word. Leave it all to me.' Then she swung her body around to face Tidaman squarely, and said aloud, "'I killed him.' Tidaman's words by this time were ringing in Maskell's head like an actual physical sound. There was no question of being able to ignore them. He had to make an open confession of his act, whatever the consequences might be. Quietly taking Oshiax by the shoulder and putting her behind him, he said in a low but perfectly distinct voice, "'It was I that killed Crimtyphon.' Oshiax looked both haughty and frightened. Maskell says that, so as to shield me, as he thinks, I require no shield, Maskell. I killed him, Tidaman. I believe you, Oshiax. You did murder him. Not with your own strength, for you brought this man along for the purpose. Maskell took a couple of steps toward Tidaman. It's of little consequence who killed him, for he's better dead than alive, in my opinion. Still, I did it. Oshiax had no hand in the affair. Tidaman appeared not to hear him. She looked beyond him at Oshiax musingly. "'When you murdered him, didn't it occur to you that I would come here to find out?' "'I never once thought of you,' replied Oshiax, with an angry laugh. "'Do you really imagine that I carry your image with me wherever I go?' If someone were to murder your lover here, what would you do?" "'Lying hypocrite!' Oshiax spat out. "'You never were in love with Crimtyphon. You always hated me, and now you think it an excellent opportunity to make it good, now that Crimtyphon's gone, for we both know he would have made a footstool of you, if I had asked him. He worshipped me, but he laughed at you. He thought you ugly. Tidaman flashed a quick, gentle smile at Maskell. "'Is it necessary for you to listen to all this?' Without question, and feeling it the right thing to do, he walked away out of earshot. Tidaman approached Oshiax. "'Perhaps, because my beauty fades and I'm no longer young, I needed him all the more.' Oshiax gave a kind of snarl. "'Well, he's dead, and that's the end of it. What are you going to do now, Tidaman? The other woman smiled faintly and rather pathetically. There's nothing left to do except mourn the dead. You won't grudge me that last office. Do you want to stay here? demanded Oshiax suspiciously. Yes, Oshiax, dear, I wish to be alone. Then what is to become of us? I thought that you and your lover, what is his name? Maskell. I thought that perhaps you two would go to Discorn and spend blood somber at my home. Oshiax called out aloud to Maskell. Will you come with me now to Discorn? If you wish, returned Maskell. Go first, Oshiax. I must question your friend about Crimtyphon's death. I won't keep him. Why don't you question me, rather?" demanded Oshiax, looking up sharply. Tidaman gave a shadow of a smile. We know each other too well. Play no tricks, said Oshiax, and she turned to go. Surely you must be dreaming, said Tidaman. That's the way, unless you want to walk over the cliffside. The path Oshiax had chosen led across the isthmus. The direction which Tidaman proposed for her was over the edge of the precipice, into empty space. "'Shaping! I must be mad!' cried Oshiax with a laugh, and she obediently followed the other's finger. She walked straight on toward the edge of the abyss, twenty paces away. Maskell pulled his beard around and wondered what she was doing. Tidaman remained standing with outstretched finger, watching her. Without hesitation, Without slackening her step once, Oshiax strolled on, and when she had reached the extreme end of the land, she still took one more step. Maskell saw her limbs wrench as she stumbled over the edge. Her body disappeared, 
and as it did so an awful shriek sounded. Disillusionment had come to her an instant too late. He tore himself out of his stupor, rushed to the edge of the cliff, threw himself on the ground recklessly, and looked over. Oshiax had vanished. He continued staring wildly down for several minutes, and then began to sob. Tidaman came up to him, and he got to his feet. The blood kept rushing to his face and leaving it again. It was some time before he could speak at all. Then he brought out the words with difficulty. "'You shall pay for this, Tidaman. But first I want to hear why you did it.' "'Hadn't I cause?' she asked, standing with downcast eyes. "'Was it pure fiendishness?' It was for Crimtyphon's sake. She had nothing to do with that death. I told you so. You are loyal to her, and I am loyal to him. Loyal? You've made a terrible blunder. She wasn't my mistress. I killed Crimtyphon for quite another reason. She had absolutely no part in it. Wasn't she your lover? asked Tidaman slowly. You've made a terrible mistake repeated Maskell. I killed him because he was a wild beast. She was as innocent of his death as you are." Tidaman's face took on a hard look. So you are guilty of two deaths. There was a dreadful silence. "'Why couldn't you believe me?' asked Maskell, who was pale and sweating painfully. "'Who gave you the right to kill him?' demanded Tidaman sternly. He said nothing, and perhaps did not hear her question. She sighed two or three times and began to stir restlessly. "'Since you murdered him, you must help me bury him.' "'What's to be done? This is a most fearful crime.' "'You are a most fearful man. Why did you come here to do all this? What are we to you?' Unfortunately, you are right." Another pause ensued. "'It's no use standing here,' said Tidaman. "'Nothing can be done. You must come with me.' "'Come with you? Where to?' "'To Discorn. There's a burning lake on the far side of it. He always wished to be cast there after death. We can do that after Bloodsomber. In the meantime, we must take him home.' You're a callous, heartless woman. Why should he be buried, when that poor girl must remain unburied?" "'You know that's out of the question,' replied Tidaman quietly. Maskell's eyes roamed about agitatedly, apparently seeing nothing. "'We must do something,' she continued. "'I shall go. You can't wish to stay here alone.' "'No, I couldn't stay here. And why should I want to?' You want me to carry the corpse?" He can't carry himself, and you murdered him. Perhaps it will ease your mind to carry it." "'Ease my mind?' said Maskell, rather stupidly. "'There's only one relief for remorse, and that's voluntary pain.' "'And you have no remorse?' he asked, fixing her with a heavy eye. "'These crimes are yours, Maskell she said in a low but incisive voice. They walked over to Crim Typhon's body, and Maskell hoisted it onto his shoulders. It weighed heavier than he had thought. Tidaman did not offer to assist him to adjust the ghastly burden. She crossed the isthmus, followed by Maskell. Their path lay through sunshine and shadow. Brantspell was blazing in a cloudless sky. The heat was insufferable. Streams of sweat coursed down his face, and the corpse seemed to grow heavier and heavier. Tidaman always walked in front of him. His eyes were fastened in an unseeing stare on her white, womanish calves. He looked neither to right nor left. His features grew sullen. At the end of ten minutes he suddenly allowed his burden to slip off his shoulders onto the ground, where it lay sprawled every which way. He called out to Tidaman. She quickly looked around. "'Come here. It has just occurred to me,' he laughed. 
Why should I be carrying this corpse? And why should I be following you at all? What surprises me is, why this has never struck me before." She at once came back to him. "'I suppose you're tired, Masco. Let us sit down. Perhaps you have come a long way this morning?' "'Oh, it's not tiredness, but a sudden gleam of sense. Do you know of any reason why I should be acting as your porter?' He laughed again, but nevertheless sat down on the ground beside her. Tidaman neither looked at him nor answered. Her head was half bent, so as to face the northern sky, where the alpine light was still glowing. Maskell followed her gaze, and also watched the glow for a moment or two in silence. "'Why don't you speak?' he asked at last. "'What does that light suggest to you, Maskell?' "'I'm not speaking of that light.' "'Doesn't it suggest anything at all?' "'Perhaps it doesn't. What does it matter?' Not sacrifice? Maskell grew sullen again. Sacrifice of what? What do you mean? Hasn't it entered your head yet? said Tidaman, looking straight in front of her, and speaking in her delicate, hard manner. That this adventure of yours will scarcely come to an end until you have made some sort of sacrifice? He returned no answer, and she said nothing more. In a few minutes' time, Masco got up of his own accord, and irreverently, and almost angrily, threw Crimtyphon's corpse over his shoulder again. "'How far do we have to go?' he asked in a surly tone. "'An hour's walk.' "'Lead on.' "'Still, this isn't the sacrifice I mean,' said Tidaman quietly, as she went on in front. Almost immediately they reached more difficult ground. They had to pass from peak to peak, as from island to island. In some cases they were able to stride or jump across, but in others they had to make use of rude bridges of fallen timber. It appeared to be a frequented path. Underneath were the black, impenetrable abysses. On the surface were the glaring sunshine, the gay painted rocks, the chaotic tangle of strange plants. There were countless reptiles and insects. The latter were thicker built than those of earth, consequently still more disgusting, and some of them were of enormous size. One monstrous insect, as large as a horse, stood right in the center of their path without budging. It was armor-plated, had jaws like scimitars, and underneath its body was a forest of legs. Tidaman gave one malignant look at it and sent it crashing into the gulf. What have I to offer except my life?" Maskell suddenly broke out. And what good is that? It won't bring that poor girl back into the world. Sacrifice is not for utility, it's a penalty which we pay. I know that. The point is whether you can go on enjoying life after what has happened. She waited for Maskell to come even with her. Perhaps you imagine I'm not man enough. You imagine that because I allowed poor Oshiax to die for me." "'She did die for you,' said Tidaman, in a quiet, emphatic voice. "'That would be a second blunder of yours,' returned Maskell, just as firmly. "'I was not in love with Oshiax, and I'm not in love with life.' "'Your life is not required.' "'Then I don't understand what you want or what you are speaking about.' It's not for me to ask a sacrifice from you, Maskell. That would be compliance on your part, but not sacrifice. You must wait until you feel there's nothing else for you to do." It's all very mysterious. The conversation was abruptly cut short by a prolonged and frightful crashing, roaring sound, coming from a short distance ahead. It was accompanied by a violent oscillation of the ground on which they stood. They looked up, startled, just in time to witness the final disappearance of a huge mass of forest land, not two hundred yards in front of them. Several acres of trees, plants, rocks, and soil, with all its teeming animal life, vanished before their eyes, like a magic story. The new chasm was cut, as if by a knife. 
Beyond its farther edge the alpine glow burned blue just over the horizon. "'Now we shall have to make a detour,' said Tidaman, halting. Maskell caught hold of her with his third hand. "'Listen to me while I try to describe what I'm feeling. When I saw that landslip, everything I have heard about the last destruction of the world came into my mind. It seemed to me as if I were actually witnessing it, and that the world were really falling to pieces. Then, where the land was, we now have this empty, awful gulf, that's to say, nothing, and it seems to me as if our life will come to the same condition, where there was something, there will be nothing. But that terrible blue glare on the opposite side is exactly like the eye of fate. It accuses us and demands what we have made of our life, which is no more. At the same time it is grand and joyful. The joy consists in this, that it is in our power to give freely what will later on be taken from us by force." Tidaman watched him attentively. "'Then your feeling is that your life is worthless, and you make a present of it to the first one who asks?' No, it goes beyond that. I feel that the only thing worth living for is to be so magnanimous that fate itself will be astonished at us. Understand me, it isn't cynicism or bitterness or despair, but heroism. It's hard to explain. Now you shall hear what sacrifice I offer you, Maskell. It's a heavy one, but that's what you seem to wish. That is so. In my present mood it can't be too heavy. Then, if you are in earnest, resign your body to me. Now that Crim Typhon's dead, I'm tired of being a woman. I fail to comprehend. Listen, then. I wish to start a new existence in your body. I wish to be a male. I see it isn't worth while being a woman. I mean to dedicate my own body to Crim Typhon. I shall tie his body and mine together and give them a common funeral in the burning lake. That's the sacrifice I offer you. As I said, it's a hard one. So you do ask me to die. Though how you can make use of my body is difficult to understand. No, I don't ask you to die. You will go on living. How is that possible without a body? Tidaman gazed at him earnestly. There are many such beings, even in your world. There you call them spirits, apparitions, phantoms. They are in reality living wills, deprived of material bodies, always longing to act and enjoy, but quite unable to do so. Are you noble-minded enough to accept such a state, do you think? If it's possible, I accept it," replied Maskell quietly. Not in spite of its heaviness, but because of it. But how is it possible? Undoubtedly there are many things possible in our world of which you have no conception. Now let us wait till we get home. I don't hold you to your word, for unless it's a free sacrifice I will have nothing to do with it. I am not a man who speaks lightly. If you can perform this miracle, you have my consent, once and for all." "'Then we'll leave it like that for the present,' said Tidaman sadly. They proceeded on their way. Owing to the subsidence, Tidaman seemed rather doubtful at first as to the right road, but by making a long divergence they eventually got around to the other side of the newly formed chasm. A little later on, in a narrow copse crowning in a miniature, insulated peak, they fell in with a man. He was resting himself against a tree, and looked tired, overheated, and despondent. He was young. His beardless expression bore an expression of unusual sincerity, and in other respects he seemed a hardy, hard-working youth, of an intellectual type. His hair was thick, short, and flaxen. He possessed neither a sorb nor a third arm, so presumably he was not a native of Ifdon. His forehead, however, was disfigured by what looked like a haphazard assortment of eyes, eight in number, of different sizes and shapes.
they went in pairs, and whenever two were in use it was indicated by a peculiar shining. The rest remained dull until their turn came. In addition to the upper eyes he had the two lower ones, but they were vacant and lifeless. This extraordinary battery of eyes, alternatively alive and dead, gave the young man an appearance of almost alarming mental activity. He was wearing nothing but a sort of skin kilt. Maskell seemed somehow to recognize the face, though he had certainly never set eyes on it before. Tydamon suggested to him to set down the corpse, and both sat down to rest in the shade. "'Question him, Maskell,' she said, rather carelessly, jerking her head toward the stranger. Maskell sighed, and asked aloud, from his seat on the ground, "'What's your name, and where do you come from?' The man studied him for a few moments, first with one pair of eyes, then with another, then with a third. He next turned his attention to Tydamon, who occupied him a still longer time. He replied at last in a dry, manly, nervous voice, "'I am Digrung. I have arrived here from Matraplay. His color kept changing, and Maskell suddenly realized of whom he reminded him. It was of Joywind. "'Perhaps you are going to pooling dread, Digrung?' he inquired, interested. "'As a matter of fact, I am, if I can find my way out of this accursed country. Possibly you are acquainted with Joywind there? She's my sister. I'm on my way to see her now. Why do you know her? I met her yesterday. What is your name, then? Maskell. I shall tell her I met you. This will be our first meeting for four years. Is she well and happy? Both, as far as I could judge. You know Panaw? Her husband, yes. But where do you come from? I've seen nothing like you before. From another world. Where is Matterplay? It's the first country one comes to beyond the sinking sea. What is it like there? How do you amuse yourselves? The same old murders and sudden deaths? Are you ill? asked Digrung. Who is this woman? Why are you following at her heels like a slave? She looks insane to me. What's that corpse? Why are you dragging it around the country with you? Tydamon smiled. I've already heard it said about Matterplay that if one sows an answer there, a rich crop of questions immediately springs up. But why do you make this unprovoked attack on me, Digrung? I don't attack you, woman, but I know you. I see into you, and I see insanity. That wouldn't matter, but I don't like to see a man of intelligence like Maskell caught in your filthy meshes. I suppose even you clever matter-play people sometimes misjudge character. However, I don't mind. Your opinion's nothing to me, Digrung. You'd better answer his questions, Maskell. Not for his own sake, but your feminine friend is sure to be curious about your having been seen carrying a dead man. Maskell's underlip shot out. Tell your sister nothing, Digrung. Don't mention my name at all. I don't want her to know about this meeting of ours. Why not? I don't wish it. Isn't that enough? Digrung looked impassive. Thoughts and words, he said, which don't correspond with the real events of the world, are considered most shameful in matter play. I'm not asking you to lie, only to keep silent. To hide the truth is a special branch of lying. I can't accede to your wish. I must tell Joywind everything, as far as I know it." Maskell got up, and Tydamon followed his example. She touched Digrung on the arm and gave him a strange look. "'The dead man is my husband, and Maskell murdered him. Now you'll understand why he wishes you to hold your tongue.' "'I guess there was some foul play,' said Digrung. "'It doesn't matter. I can't falsify facts. Joywin must know.' "'You refuse to consider her feelings?' said Maskell, turning pale. 
feelings which flourish on illusions and sicken and die on realities aren't worth considering. But joywinds are not of that kind. If you decline to do what I ask, at least return home without seeing her. Your sister will get very little pleasure out of the meeting when she hears your news." "'What are these strange relations between you?' demanded Digrung, eyeing him with sudden aroused suspicion. Maskell stared back in a sort of bewilderment. "'Good God! You don't doubt your own sister? That pure angel?' Tidaman caught hold of him delicately. "'I don't know, Joy Wind, but whoever she is, and whatever she's like, I know this. She's more fortunate in her friend than in her brother. Now, if you really value her happiness, Maskell, you will have to take some firm step or other. I mean to. Digrung, I shall stop your journey. If you intend a second murder, no doubt you are big enough." Maskell turned around to Tidoman and laughed. I seem to be leaving a wake of corpses behind me on this journey." "'Why a corpse? There's no need to kill him.' "'Thanks for that,' said Digrung, dryly. "'All the same, some crime is about to burst. I feel it.' "'What must I do, then?' asked Maskell. "'It is not my business, and to tell the truth, I am not very interested. If I were in your place, Maskell, I would not hesitate long. Don't you understand how to absorb these creatures who set their feeble, obstinate wills against yours?" "'That is a worse crime,' said Maskell. "'Who knows? He will live, but he will tell no tales.' Digrung laughed, but changed color. "'I was right, then. The monster has sprung into the light of day.' Maskell laid a hand on his shoulder. You have the choice, and we are not joking. Do as I ask." "'You have fallen low, Maskell. But you are walking in a dream, and I can't talk to you. As for you, woman, sin must be like a pleasant bath to you. There are strange ties between Maskell and myself, but you are a passer-by, a foreigner. I care nothing for you. Nevertheless. I shall not be frightened out of my plans, which are legitimate and right." "'Do as you please,' said Tidaman. "'If you come to grief, your thoughts will hardly have corresponded with the real events of the world, which is what you boast about. It is no affair of mine.' "'I shall go on, and not back!' exclaimed Digrung, with angry emphasis. Tidaman threw a swift, evil smile at Maskell. Bear witness that I have tried to persuade this young man. Now you must come to a quick decision in your own mind as to which is of the greatest importance, Digrung's happiness or Joywind's. Digrung won't allow you to preserve them both." "'It won't take me long to decide. Digrung, I give you a last chance to change your mind. As long as it's in my power, I shall go on and warn my sister against her criminal friends." Maskell again clutched at him, but this time with violence. Instructed in his actions by some new and horrible instinct, he pressed the young man tightly to his body with all three arms. A feeling of wild, sweet delight immediately passed through him. Then, for the first time, he comprehended the triumphant joys of absorbing. It satisfied the hunger of the will, exactly as food satisfies the hunger of the body. Digrung proved feeble. He made little opposition. His personality passed slowly and evenly into Maskell's. The latter became strong and gorged. The victim gradually became paler and limper, until Maskell held a corpse in his arms. He dropped the body and stood trembling. He had committed his second crime. He felt no immediate difference in his soul, but— Tidaman shed a sad smile on him, like winter sunshine. He half expected her to speak, but she said nothing. Instead, she made a sign to him to pick up Crimtyphon's corpse. As he obeyed, 
he wondered why Digrung's dead face did not wear the frightful Crystalman mask. "'Why hasn't he altered?' he muttered to himself. Tidaman heard him. She kicked Digrung lightly with her little foot. "'He isn't dead, that's why. The expression you mean is waiting for your death.' "'Then is that my real character?' She laughed softly. "'You came here to carve a strange world, and now it appears you are carved yourself. Oh, there's no doubt about it, Masco. You needn't stand there gaping. You belong to shaping, like the rest of us. You are not a king or a god.' "'Since when have I belonged to him?' "'What does that matter? Perhaps since you first breathed the air of torments, or perhaps since five minutes ago.' Without waiting for his response, she set off through the copse and strode on to the next island. Maskell followed, physically distressed and looking very grave. The journey continued for half an hour longer, without incident. The character of the scenery slowly changed. The mountain tops became loftier and more widely separated from one another. The gaps were filled with rolling, white clouds which bathed the shores of the peaks like a mysterious sea. To pass from island to island was hard work, the intervening spaces were so wide. Tidaman, however, knew the way. The intense light, the violet-blue sky, the patches of vivid landscape emerging from the white vapor ocean made a profound impression on Maskell's mind. The glow of Alpine was hidden by the huge mass of Discorn, which loomed up straight in front of them. The green snow on the top of the gigantic pyramid had by now completely melted away. The black, gold, and crimson of its mighty cliffs stood out with terrific brilliance. They were directly beneath the bulk of the mountain, which was not a mile away. It did not appear dangerous to climb, but he was unaware on which side of it their destination lay. It was split from top to bottom by numerous straight fissures. A few pale green waterfalls descended here and there, like narrow, motionless threads. The face of the mountain was rugged and bare. It was strewn with detached boulders, and great jagged rocks projected everywhere like iron teeth. Tidaman pointed to a small black hole near the base, which might be a cave. "'That is where I live.' "'You live here alone?' "'Yes.' It's an odd choice for a woman, and you're not unbeautiful, either." "'A woman's life is over at twenty-five, she replied, sighing. "'And I am far older than that. Ten years ago it would have been I who lived yonder, and not Oshiak's. Then all this wouldn't have happened.' A quarter of an hour later they stood within the mouth of the cave. It was ten feet high, and its interior was impenetrably black. "'Put down the body in the entrance, out of the sun,' directed Tidaman. He did so. She cast a keenly scrutinizing glance at him. "'Does your resolution still hold, Maskell?' "'Why shouldn't it hold? My brains are not feathers.' "'Follow me, then.' They both stepped into the cave. At that very moment a sickening crash like heavy thunder just over their heads, set Maskell's weakened heart thumping violently. An avalanche of boulders, stones, and dust swept past the cave entrance from above. If their going in had been delayed by a single minute, they would have been killed. Tidaman did not even look up. She took his hand in hers and started walking with him into the darkness. The temperature became as cold as ice. At the first bend the light from the outer world disappeared, leaving them in absolute blackness. Maskell kept stumbling over the uneven ground, but she kept tight hold of him and hurried him along. The tunnel seemed of interminable length. Presently, however, the atmosphere changed, or such was his impression. He was somehow led to imagine that they had come to a larger chamber. Here Tidaman stopped and then forced him down with quiet pressure. His groping hand encountered stone, and, by feeling it all over, he discovered that it was a sort of stone slab, or couch, 
raised a foot or eighteen inches from the ground. She told him to lie down. "'Has the time come?' asked Maskell. "'Yes.' He lay there, waiting in the darkness, ignorant of what was going to happen. She felt her hand clasping his. Without perceiving any gradation, he lost all consciousness of his body. He was no longer able to feel his limbs or internal organs. His mind remained active and alert. Nothing particular appeared to be taking place. Then the chamber began to grow light, like very early morning. He could see nothing, but the retina of his eyes was affected. He fancied that he heard music, but while he was listening for it, it stopped. The light grew stronger, the air grew warmer. He heard the confused sound of distant voices. Suddenly, Tidaman gave his hand a powerful squeeze. He heard someone scream faintly, and then the light leaped up, and he saw everything clearly. He was lying on a wooden couch, in a strangely decorated room, lighted by electricity. His hand was being squeezed, not by Tidaman, but by a man dressed in the garments of civilization, with whose face he was certainly familiar, but under what circumstances he could not recall. Other people stood in the background. They too were vaguely known to him. He sat up and began to smile, without any especial reason, and then stood upright. Everybody seemed to be watching him with anxiety and emotion. He wondered why. Yet he felt that they were all acquaintances. Two in particular he knew. The man at the farther end of the room, who paced restlessly backward and forward, his face transfigured by stern, holy grandeur. And that other big bearded man, who was himself. Yes, he was looking at his own double. But it was just as if a crime-riddled man of middle age were suddenly confronted with his own photograph as an earnest, idealistic youth. His other self spoke to him. He heard the sounds, but did not comprehend the sense. Then the door was abruptly flung open, and a short, brutish-looking individual leaped in. He began to behave in an extraordinary manner to everyone around him, and after that he came straight up to him, Maskell. He spoke some words, but they were incomprehensible. A terrible expression came over the newcomer's face and he grasped his neck with a pair of hairy hands. Maskell felt his bones bending and breaking. Excruciating pains passed through all the nerves of his body, and he experienced a sense of impending death. He cried out and sank helplessly on the floor in a heap. The chamber and the company vanished. The light went out. Once more he found himself in the blackness of the cave. He was this time lying on the ground, but Tidaman was still with him, holding his hand. He was in horrible bodily agony, but this was only a setting for the despairing anguish that filled his mind. Tidaman addressed him in tones of gentle reproach. "'Why are you back so soon? I have not had time yet. You must return.' He caught hold of her and pulled himself up to his feet. She gave a low scream, as though in pain. "'What does this mean? What are you doing, Maskell?' "'Crag,' began Maskell, but the effort to produce his words choked him, so that he was obliged to stop. "'Crag? What of Crag? Tell me quickly what has happened. Free my arm.' He gripped her arm tighter. "'Yes. I've seen Crag. I'm awake.' "'Oh!' You are awake, awake. And you must die, said Maskell in an awful voice. But why? What has happened? You must die, and I must kill you, because I am awake, and for no other reason, you blood-stained dancing mistress. Tidaman breathed hard for a little time. Then she seemed suddenly to regain her self-possession. You won't offer me violence, surely, in this black cave. No, the sun shall look on, for it is not a murder. But rest assured 
that you must die. You must expiate your fearful crimes." You have already said so, and I see you have the power. You have escaped me. It is very curious. Well then, Masco, let us come outside. I am not afraid. But kill me courteously, for I have also been courteous to you. I make no other supplication. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus. Chapter Eleven On Discorn. By the time they had regained the mouth of the cavern, Blood Somber was at its height. In front of them, the scenery sloped downward, a long succession of mountain islands in a sea of clouds. Behind them, the bright, stupendous crags of Discorn loomed up for a thousand feet or more. Maskell's eyes were red, and his face looked stupid. He was still holding the woman by the arm. She made no attempt to speak or to get away. She seemed perfectly gentle and composed. After gazing at the country for a long time in silence, he turned toward her. Whereabouts is the fiery lake you spoke of? It lies on the other side of the mountain. But why do you ask? It is just as well if we have some way to walk. I shall grow calmer, and that's what I want. I wish you to understand that what is going to happen is not a murder, but an execution." It will taste the same," said Tidaman. When I have gone out of this country, I don't wish to feel that I have left a demon behind me, wandering at large. That would not be fair to others. So we will go to the lake, which promises an easy death for you." She shrugged her shoulders. "'We must wait till blood somber is over. Is this a time for luxurious feelings? However hot it is now, we will both be cool by evening. We must start at once." "'Without doubt, you are the master, Masco. May I not carry Crimtyphon? Maskell looked at her strangely. I grudge no man his funeral. She painfully hoisted the body on her narrow shoulders, and they stepped out into the sunlight. The heat struck them like a blow on the head. Maskell moved aside to allow her to precede him, but no compassion entered his heart. He brooded over the wrongs the woman had done him. The way went along the south side of the Great Pyramid, near its base. It was a rough road, clogged with boulders and crossed by cracks and water gullies. They could see the water, but could not get at it. There was no shade. Blisters formed on their skin, while all the water in their blood seemed to dry up. Maskell forgot his own tortures in his devil's delight at Tydamon's. "'Sing me a song,' he called out presently. "'A characteristic one.' She turned her head and gave him a long, peculiar look, then, without any sort of expostulation, started singing. Her voice was low and weird. The song was so extraordinary that he had to rub his eyes to ascertain whether he was awake or dreaming. The slow surprises of the grotesque melody began to agitate him in a horrible fashion. The words were pure nonsense, or else their significance was too deep for him. Where in the name of all unholy things did you acquire that stuff, woman?" Tydamon shed a sickly smile, while the corpse swayed about with ghastly jerks over her left shoulder. She held it in position with her two left arms. It's a pity we could not have met as friends, Maskell. I could have shown you a side of torments which now perhaps you will never see. The wild, mad side. But now it's too late, and it doesn't matter. They turned the angle of the mountain and started to traverse the western base. "'Which is the quickest way out of this miserable land?' asked Maskell. "'It is easiest to go to Sant.' "'Will we see it from anywhere?' "'Yes, though it is a long way off.' "'Have you been there?' "'I am a woman and interdicted.' "'True, I have heard something of the sort.' 
But don't ask me any more questions," said Tidaman, who was becoming faint. Maskell stopped at a little spring. He himself drank, and then made a cup of his hand for the woman, so that she might not have to lay down her burden. The knoll water acted like magic. It seemed to replenish all the cells of his body, as though they had been thirsty sponge pores, sucking up liquid. Tidaman recovered her self-possession. About three-quarters of an hour later they worked around the second corner and entered into full view of the north aspect of Discorn. A hundred yards lower down the slope on which they were walking the mountain ended abruptly in a chasm. The air above it was filled with a sort of green haze, which trembled violently like the atmosphere immediately over a furnace. "'The lake is underneath,' said Tidaman. Maskell looked curiously about him. Beyond the crater the country sloped away in a continuous descent to the skyline. Behind them a narrow path channeled its way up through the rocks toward the towering summit of the pyramid. Miles away, in the northeast quarter, a long, flat-topped plateau raised its head far above all the surrounding country. It was Sant, and there and then he made up his mind that that should be his destination that day. Tidaman, meanwhile, had walked straight to the gulf and set down Krim Typhon's body on the edge. In a minute or two Maskell joined her. Arrived at the brink, he immediately flung himself at full length on his chest to see what could be seen of the lake of fire. A gust of hot, asphyxiating air smote his face and set him coughing, but he did not get up until he had stared his fill at the huge sea of green molten lava tossing and swirling at no great distance below, like a living will. A faint sound of drumming came up. He listened intently, and as he did so, his heart quickened and the black cares rolled away from his soul. All the world and its accident seemed at the moment false and without meaning. He climbed abstractedly to his feet. Tidaman was talking to her dead husband. She was peering into the hideous face of Ivory and fondling his violet hair. When she perceived Maskell, she hastily kissed the withered lips and got up from her knees. Lifting the corpse with all three arms, she staggered with it to the extreme edge of the gulf and, after an instant's hesitation, allowed it to drop into the lava. It disappeared immediately, without sound. A metallic splash came up. That was Krim Typhon's funeral. Now I am ready, Maskell." He did not answer, but stared past her. Another figure was standing, erect and mournful, not far behind her. It was Joywind. Her face was wan, and there was an accusing look in her eyes. Maskell knew that it was a phantasm, and that the real Joywind was miles away at Pooling Dread. "'Turn around, Tidaman,' he said oddly and tell me what you see behind you." "'I don't see anything,' she answered, looking around. "'But I see Joywind.' Just as he was speaking the apparition vanished. "'Now I present you with your life, Tidaman. She wishes it.' The woman fingered her chin thoughtfully. "'I little expected I should ever be beholden for my life to one of my own sex, but so be it. What really happened to you in my cavern?" I really saw a crag. Yes, some miracle must have taken place. She suddenly shivered. Come, let us leave this horrible spot. I shall never come here again. Yes, said Maskell, it stinks of death and dying. But where are we to go? What are we to do? Take me to Sant. I must get away from this hellish land. Tidaman remained standing, dull and hollow-eyed. Then she gave an abrupt, bitter little laugh. "'We make our journey together in singular stages. Rather than be alone, I'll come with you. But you know that if I set foot in Sant they will kill me. At least set me on the way. I wish to get there before night. Is it possible? If you are willing to take risks with nature. And why should you not take risks today? Your luck holds. But some day or other it won't hold. Your luck." "'Let us start,' said Maskell. 
the luck I've had so far is nothing to brag about." Bloodsomber was over when they set off. It was early afternoon, but the heat seemed more stifling than ever. They made no more pretense at conversation. Both were buried in their own painful thoughts. The land fell away from Discorn in all other directions, but towards Sant there was a gentle, persistent rise. Its dark, distant plateau continued to dominate the landscape, and after walking for an hour they seemed none the nearer to it. The air was stale and stagnant. By and by an upright object, apparently the work of man, attracted Maskell's notice. It was a slender tree-stem, with the bark still on, embedded in the stony ground. From the upper end three branches sprang out, pointing aloft at a sharp angle. They were stripped to twigs and leaves, and getting closer he saw that they had been artificially fastened on, at equal distances from each other. As he stared at the object a strange sudden flush of confident vanity and self-sufficiency seemed to pass through him, but it was so momentary that he could be sure of nothing. "'What may that be, Tydamon?' "'It is Hator's trifork.' "'And what is its purpose?' It's a guide to Sant. But who or what is Hator? Hator is the founder of Sant, many thousands of years ago. He laid down the principles they all live by, and that trifork is his symbol. When I was a little child, my father told me the legends, but I've forgotten most of them. Maskell regarded it attentively. Does it affect you in any way? And why should it do that? she said, dropping her lips scornfully. I am only a woman, and these are masculine mysteries." "'A sort of gladness came over me,' said Maskell. "'But perhaps I am mistaken.' They passed on. The scenery gradually changed in character. The solid parts of the land grew more continuous, the fissures became narrower and more infrequent. There were now no more subsidences or upheavals. The peculiar nature of the Ifdon Marist appeared to be giving place to a different order of things. Later on they encountered a flock of pale blue jellies floating in the air. They were miniature animals. Tydamon caught one in her hand and began to eat it, just as one eats a luscious pear plucked from a tree. Maskell, who had fasted since early morning, was not slow in following her example. A sort of electric vigor at once entered his limbs and body. His muscles regained their elasticity. His heart began to beat with hard, slow, strong throbs. "'Food and body seem to agree well in this world,' he remarked, smiling. She glanced toward him. "'Perhaps the explanation is not in the food, but in your body.' "'I brought my body with me. You brought your soul with you but that's altering fast, too." In a copse they came across a short, wide tree, without leaves, but possessing a multitude of thin, flexible branches, like the tentacles of a cuttlefish. Some of these branches were moving rapidly. A furry animal, somewhat resembling a wildcat, leaped about among them in the most extraordinary way. But the next minute Maskell was shocked to realize that the beast was not leaping at all but was being thrown from branch to branch by the volition of the tree, exactly as an imprisoned mouse is thrown by a cat from paw to paw. He watched the spectacle a while with morbid interest. "'That's a gruesome reversal of roles, Tydamon.' "'One can see you are disgusted,' she replied, stifling a yawn. "'But that is because you are a slave to words.' If you called that plant an animal, you would find its occupation perfectly natural and pleasing. And why should you not call it an animal?" "'I am quite aware that, as long as I remain in the Ifdon Marist, I shall go on listening to this sort of language.' They trudged along for an hour or more without talking. The day became overcast. A thin mist began to shroud the landscape, and the sun changed into an immense ruddy disk which could be stared at without flinching. A chill, damp wind blew against them. Presently it grew still darker, the sun disappeared, and glancing first at his companion and then at himself, 
Maskell noticed that their skin and clothing were coated by a kind of green hoar-frost. The land was now completely solid. About half a mile in front of them, against a background of dark fog, a moving forest of tall water-spouts gyrated slowly and gracefully hither and thither. They were green and self-luminous, and looked terrifying. Tydamon explained that they were not water-spouts at all, but mobile columns of lightning. "'Then they are dangerous?' "'So we think,' she answered, watching them closely. "'Someone is wandering there who appears to have a different opinion.' Among the spouts, and entirely encompassed by them, a man was walking with a slow, calm, composed gait, his back turned toward Maskell and Tydamon. There was something unusual in his appearance. His form looked extraordinarily distinct, solid, and real. If there's danger, he ought to be warned," said Maskell. "'He who is always anxious to teach will learn nothing,' returned the woman coolly. She restrained Maskell by a pressure of the arm and continued to watch. The base of one of the columns touched the man. He remained unharmed, but turned sharply around, as if for the first time made aware of the proximity of these deadly waltzers. Then he raised himself to his full height and stretched out both arms aloft above his head, like a diver. He seemed to be addressing the columns. While they looked on, the electric spouts discharged themselves with a series of loud explosions. The stranger stood alone, uninjured. He dropped his arms. The next moment he caught sight of the two and stood still, waiting for them to come up. The pictorial clarity of his person grew more and more noticeable as they approached. His body seemed to be composed of some substance heavier and denser than solid matter. Tydamon looked perplexed. He must be a sand man. I have seen no one quite like him before. This is a day of days for me. He must be an individual of great importance, murmured Maskell. They now came up to him. He was tall, strong, and bearded, and was clothed in a shirt and breeches of skin. Since turning his back to the wind, the green deposit on his face and limbs had changed to a streaming moisture, through which his natural color was visible. It was that of pale iron. There was no third arm. His face was harsh and frowning, and a projecting chin pushed the beard forward. On his forehead there were two flat membranes, like rudimentary eyes, but no sorb. These membranes were expressionless, but in some strange way seemed to add vigor to the stern eyes underneath. When his glance rested on Maskell, the latter felt as though his brain were being thoroughly traveled through. The man was middle-aged. His physical distinctness transcended nature. By contrast with him, every object in the neighborhood looked vague and blurred. Tydamon's person suddenly appeared faint, sketch-like, without significance, and Maskell realized that it was no better with himself. A queer, quickening fire began running through his veins. He turned to the woman. "'If this man is going to Sant, I shall bear him company. We can now part. No doubt you will think it high time.' "'Let Tydamon come, too.' The words were delivered in a rough foreign tongue, but were as intelligible to Maskell as if spoken in English. "'You who know my name also know my sex,' said Tydamon quietly. "'It is death for me to enter Sant. "'That is the old law. I am the bearer of the new law.' "'Is it so, and will it be accepted?' "'The old skin is cracking. The new skin has been silently forming underneath. The moment of sloughing has arrived." The storm gathered. The green snow drove against them, as they stood talking, and it grew intensely cold. None noticed it. "'What is your name?' asked Maskell, with a beating heart. "'My name, Maskell, is Spade Evil. You, a voyager across the dark ocean of space, shall be my first witness and follower. You, Tydamon, a daughter of the despised sex, shall be my second." "'The new law? But what is it?' 
until I sees, of what use it is for ear to hear. Come, both of you, to me." Tidaman went to him unhesitatingly. Spadeevil pressed his hand on her sorb and kept it there for a few minutes, while he closed his own eyes. When he removed it, Maskell observed that the sorb was transformed into twin membranes like Spadeevil's own. Tidaman looked dazed. She glanced quietly about for a little while, apparently testing her new faculty. Then the tears started to her eyes, and snatching up Spadeevil's hand, she bent over and kissed it hurriedly many times. "'My past has been bad,' she said. "'Numbers have received harm from me, and none good. I have killed, and worse. But now I can throw all that away and laugh. Nothing can now injure me. Oh, Maskell, you and I have been fools together.' "'Don't you repent your crimes?' asked Maskell. "'Leave the past alone,' said Spadeevil. "'It cannot be reshaped. The future alone is ours. It starts fresh and clean from this very minute. Why do you hesitate, Maskell? Are you afraid?' "'What is the name of those organs, and what is their function?' "'They are probes, and they are the gates opening into a new world.' Maskell lingered no longer, but permitted Spadeevil to cover his sorb. While the iron hand was still pressing his forehead, the new law quietly flowed into his consciousness, like a smooth-running stream of clean water, which had hitherto been dammed by his obstructive will. The law was duty. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus, Chapter Twelve, Spade Evil. Maskell found that his new organs had no independent function of their own, but only intensified and altered his other senses. When he used his eyes, ears, or nostrils, the same objects presented themselves to him but his judgment concerning them was different. Previously all external things had existed for him. Now he existed for them. According to whether they served his purpose or were in harmony with his nature, or otherwise, they had been pleasant or painful. Now these words pleasure and pain simply had no meaning. The other two watched him while he was making himself acquainted with his new mental outlook. He smiled at them. "'You are quite right, Tidaman,' he said in a bold, cheerful voice. "'We have been fools. So near the light all the time, and we never guessed it. Always buried in the past or future, systematically ignoring the present, and now it turns out that, apart from the present, we have no life at all.' "'Thank Spadeevil for it,' she answered, more loudly than usual. Maskell looked at the man's dark, concrete form. Spade evil. Now I mean to follow you to the end. I can do nothing less." The severe face showed no sign of gratification, not a muscle relaxed. "'Watch that you don't lose your gift,' he said gruffly. Tidaman spoke. "'You promised that I should enter Sant with you.' "'Attach yourself to the truth, not to me, for I may die before you but the truth will accompany you to your death. However, now let us journey together, all three of us." The words had not left his mouth before he put his face against the fine driving snow and pressed onward toward his destination. He walked with a long stride. Tidaman was obliged to half-run in order to keep up with him. The three travelled abreast, spadeevil in the middle. The fog was so dense that it was impossible to see a hundred yards ahead. The ground was covered by the green snow, the wind blew in gusts from the Sant Highlands, and was piercingly cold. "'Spadeevil, are you a man, or more than a man?' asked Maskell. "'He that is not more than a man is nothing.' "'Where have you now come from?' "'From brooding, Maskell. Out of no other mother can truth be born. I have brooded and rejected, and have brooded again. 
Now, after many months' absence from Saint, the truth at last shines forth for me in its simple splendor, like an upturned diamond." "'I see it shining,' said Maskell. "'But how much does it owe to ancient Hator? Knowledge has its seasons. The blossom was to Hator, the fruit is to me. Hator also was a brooder, but now his followers do not brood. In Sant all is icy selfishness, a living death. They hate pleasure, and this hatred is the greatest pleasure to them." But in what way have they fallen off from Hator's doctrines? For him, in his sullen purity of nature, all the world was a snare, a limed twig. Knowing that pleasure was everywhere, a fierce, mocking enemy, crouching and waiting at every corner of the road of life, in order to kill with its sweet sting the naked grandeur of the soul, he shielded himself behind pain. This also his followers do, but they do not do it for the sake of the soul, but for the sake of vanity and pride. What is the trifork? The stem maskel is hatred of pleasure. The first fork is disentanglement from the sweetness of the world. The second fork is power over those who still writhe in the nets of illusion. The third fork is the healthy glow of one who steps into ice-cold water. From what land did Hator come? It is not said. He lived in Ifdon for a while. There are many legends told of him while there. We have a long way to go, said Tydamon. Relate some of these legends, Spade Evil. The snow had ceased. The day brightened. Brant's bell reappeared like a phantom sun, but bitter blasts of wind still swept over the plain. In those days, said Spade Evil, there existed in Ifdon a mountain island separated by wide spaces from the land around it. A handsome girl, who knew sorcery, caused a bridge to be constructed across which men and women might pass to it. Having by a false tale drawn Hator on to this rock, she pushed at the bridge with her foot until it tumbled into the depths below. You and I, Hator, are now together, and there is no means of separating. I wish to see how long the famous Frostman can withstand the breath, smiles, and perfume of a girl. Hator said no word, either then or all that day. He still stood till sunset like a tree-trunk, and thought of other things. Then the girl grew passionate and shook her curls. She rose from where she was sitting, she looked at him, and touched his arm, but he did not see her. She looked at him, so that all the soul was in her eyes, and then she fell down dead. Hator awoke from his thoughts and saw her lying, still warm at his feet, a corpse. He passed to the mainland. But how, it is not related." Tydomen shuddered. "'You too have met your wicked woman, Spade Evil. But your method is a nobler one.' "'Don't pity other women,' said Spade Evil. "'But love the right. Hator also once conversed with shaping.' "'With the Maker of the World?' said Maskell, thoughtfully. "'With the Maker of Pleasure. It is told how Shaping defended his world, and tried to force Hator to acknowledge loveliness and joy. But Hator, answering all his marvellous speeches in a few concise iron words, showed how this joy in beauty was but another name for the bestiality of souls wallowing in luxury and sloth. Shaping smiled and said, how comes it that your wisdom is greater than that of the Master of Wisdom?" Hator said, My wisdom does not come from you, nor from your world, but from that other world, which you, Shaping, have vainly tried to imitate. Shaping replied, What then do you do in my world? Hator said, I am here falsely, and therefore I am subject to your false pleasures. But I wrap myself in pain not because it is good, but because I wish to keep myself as far from you as possible. For pain is not yours, neither does it belong to the other world, but it is the shadowed cast by your false pleasures." Shaping then said, What is this faraway other world of which you say, 
this is so, this is not so. How happens it that you alone of all my creatures have knowledge of it? But Hator spat at his feet and said, You lie, shaping. All have knowledge of it. You with your pretty toys alone obscure it from our view. Shaping asked, What then am I? Hator answered, You are the dreamer of all impossible dreams. And then the story goes that shaping departed, ill pleased with what had been said. What other world did Hator refer to? asked Maskell. One where grandeur reigns, Maskell, just as pleasure reigns here. Whether grandeur or pleasure, it makes no difference, said Maskell. The individual spirit that lives and wishes to live is mean and corrupt natured. Guard you your pride, returned Spade Evil. Do not make law for the universe and for all time, but for yourself and for this small, false life of yours. In what shape did death come to that hard, unconquerable man? asked Tidaman. He lived to be old, but went upright and free limbed to his last hour. When he saw that death could not be staved off longer, he determined to destroy himself. He gathered his friends around him, not from vanity, but that they might see to what lengths the human soul can go in its perpetual warfare with the voluptuous body. Standing erect, without support, he died by withholding his breath. A silence followed, which lasted for perhaps an hour. Their minds refused to acknowledge the icy winds, but the current of their thoughts became frozen. When Branch Bell, however, shone out again, though with subdued power, Maskell's curiosity rose once more. "'Your fellow-countrymen, then, Spade Evil, are sick with self-love?' "'The men of other countries,' said Spade Evil, "'are the slaves of pleasure and desire, knowing it. But the men of my country are the slaves of pleasure and desire, not knowing it.' And yet that proud pleasure, which rejoices in self-torture, has something noble in it. He who studies himself at all is ignoble. Only by despising soul as well as body can a man enter into true life. On what grounds do they reject women? Inasmuch as woman has ideal love and cannot live for herself, love for another is pleasure for the loved one and therefore injurious to him. "'A forest of false ideas is waiting for your axe,' said Maskell. "'But will they allow it?' "'Spade evil knows, Maskell,' said Tidaman, "'that be it to-day or be it to-morrow, love can't be kept out of a land, even by the disciples of Hator.' "'Beware of love! Beware of emotion!' exclaimed Spade evil. Love is but pleasure once removed. Think not of pleasing others, but of serving them. Forgive me, Spade Evil, if I am still feminine. Right has no sex. So long, Tidoman, as you remember that you are a woman, so long you will not enter into the divine apathy of soul. But where there are no women, there are no children, said Maskell. How came there to be all these generations of Hator men? Life breeds passion, passion breeds suffering, suffering breeds the yearning for relief from suffering. Men throng to Sant from all parts in order to have the scars of their souls healed. In place of hatred of pleasure, which all can understand, what simple formula do you offer? Iron obedience to duty answered Spade Evil. And if they ask, how far is this consistent with hatred of pleasure, what will your pronouncement be? I do not answer them, but I answer you, Maskell, who asked the question. Hatred is passion, and all passion springs from the dark fires of self. Do not hate pleasure at all, but pass it by on one side, calm and undisturbed. What is the criterion of pleasure? How can we always recognize it in order to avoid it? Rigidly follow duty, and such questions will not arise. Later in the afternoon, 
Pydamon timidly placed her fingers on Spadeevil's arm. "'Fearful doubts are in my mind,' she said. "'This expedition to Sant may turn out badly. I have seen a vision of you, Spadeevil, and myself lying dead and covered in blood, but Maskell was not there.' "'We may drop the torch, but it will not be extinguished, and others will raise it.' Show me a sign that you are not as other men, so that I may know that our blood will not be wasted." Spadeevil regarded her sternly. "'I am not a magician. I don't persuade the senses, but the soul. Does your duty call you to Sant, Tidomen? Then go there. Does it not call you to Sant? Then go no farther. Is not this simple? What signs are necessary?' Did I not see you dispel those spouts of lightning? No common man could have done that. Who knows what any man can do? This man can do one thing, that man can do another. But what all men can do is their duty, and to open their eyes to this I must go to Sant, and if necessary lay down my life. Will you not still accompany me? Yes, said Tidamon, I will follow you to the end. It is all the more essential, because I keep on displeasing you with my remarks, and that means I have not yet learned my lesson properly. Do not be humble, for humility is only self-judgment, and while we are thinking of self we must be neglecting some action we could be planning or shaping in our mind." Tidamon continued to be uneasy and preoccupied. "'Why was Maskell not in the picture?' she asked. You dwell on this foreboding because you imagine it is tragical. There is nothing tragical in death, Tidamon, nor in life. There is only right and wrong. What arises from right or wrong action does not matter. We are not gods, constructing a world, but simple men and women, doing our immediate duty. We may die in scent, so you have seen it, but the truth will go on living." Spadeevil. Why do you choose Sant to start your work in?" asked Maskell. These men with fixed ideas seem to me the least likely of any to follow a new light. Where a bad tree thrives, a good tree will flourish. But where no tree at all can be found, nothing will grow." I understand you, said Maskell. Here, perhaps, we are going to martyrdom, but elsewhere we should resemble men preaching to cattle. Shortly before sunset they arrived at the extremity of the upland plain, above which towered the black cliffs of the Sant Levels. A dizzy, artificially constructed staircase of more than a thousand steps of varying depth, twisting and forking in order to conform to the angles of the precipices, led to the world overhead. In the place where they stood they were sheltered from the cutting winds. Brantspell, radiantly shining at last, but on the point of sinking, filled the cloudy sky with violent, lurid colors, some of the combinations of which were new to Maskell. The circle of the horizon was so gigantic that, had he been suddenly carried back to earth, he would by comparison have fancied himself to be moving beneath the dome of some little, closed-in cathedral. He realized that he was on a foreign planet, but he was not stirred or uplifted by the knowledge he was conscious only of moral ideas. Looking backward, he saw the plain, which for several miles past had been without vegetation, stretching back away to Discorn. So regular had been the ascent, and so great was the distance, that the huge pyramid looked nothing more than a slight swelling on the face of the earth. Spadeevil stopped and gazed over the landscape in silence. In the evening sunlight his form looked more dense, dark, and real than ever before. His features were set hard in grimness. He turned around to his companions. "'What is the greatest wonder in all this wonderful scene?' he demanded. "'Acquaint us,' said Maskell. "'All that you see is born from pleasure and moves on from pleasure to pleasure. Nowhere is right to be found. It is Shaping's world." "'There is another wonder,' said Tidamon, 
and she pointed her finger toward the sky overhead. A small cloud, so low down that it was perhaps not more than five hundred feet above them, was sailing along in front of the dark wall of cliff. It was in the exact shape of an open human hand, with downward-pointing fingers. It was stained crimson by the sun, and one or two tiny cloudlets beneath the fingers looked like falling drops of blood. "'Who can doubt now that our death is close at hand?' said Tidaman. "'I have been close to death twice to-day. The first time I was ready, but now I am more ready, for I shall die side by side with the man who has given me my first happiness.' "'Do not think of death, but of right persistence,' replied Spadeevil. "'I am not here to tremble before Shaping's portents, but to snatch men from him.' He at once proceeded to lead the way up the staircase. Tidaman gazed upward after him for a moment, with an odd, worshipping light in her eyes. Then she followed him, the second of the party. Masco climbed last. He was travel-stained, unkempt, and very tired. But his soul was at peace. As they steadily ascended the almost perpendicular stairs, the sun got higher in the sky. Its light dyed their bodies a ruddy gold. They gained the top. There they found rolling in front of them, as far as the eye could see, a barren desert of white sand, broken here and there by large, jagged masses of black rock. Tracks of the sand were reddened by the sinking sun. The vast expanse of sky was filled by evil-shaped clouds and wild colors. The freezing wind, flurrying across the desert, drove the fine particles of sand painfully against their faces. "'Where now do you take us?' asked Maskell. "'He who guards the old wisdom of Sant must give up that wisdom to me, that I may change it. What he says, others will say. I go to find Mulger. And where will you seek him, in this bare country?" Spade Evil struck off toward the north unhesitatingly. "'It is not far,' he said. "'It is his custom to be in that part where Sant overhangs the womb-flash forest. Perhaps he will be there, but I cannot say.' Masco glanced toward Tidaman. Her sunken cheeks and the dark circles beneath her eyes told of her extreme weariness. "'The woman is tired, Spadeevil,' he said. She smiled. "'It's but another step into the land of death. I can manage it. Give me your arm, Maskell.' He put his arm around her waist and supported her along that way. "'The sun is now sinking,' said Maskell. "'Will we get there before dark?' Fear nothing, Maskell and Tidoman. This pain is eating up the evil in your nature. The road you are walking cannot remain unwalked. We shall arrive before dark." The sun then disappeared behind the far distant ridges that formed the western boundary of the Ifdon Marist. The sky blazed up into more vivid colors. The wind grew colder. They passed some pools of colorless knoll water round the banks of which were planted fruit-trees. Maskell ate some of the fruit. It was hard, bitter, and astringent. He could not get rid of the taste, but he felt braced and invigorated by the downward-flowing juices. No other trees or shrubs were to be seen anywhere. No animals appeared, no birds or insects. It was a desolate land. A mile or two passed when they again approached the edge of the plateau. Far down, beneath their feet, the great womb-flash forest began. But daylight had vanished there, Maskell's eyes rested only on a vague darkness. He faintly heard what sounded like the distant sighing of innumerable treetops. In the rapidly darkening twilight they came abruptly on a man. He was standing in a pool on one leg. A pile of boulders had hidden him from their view. The water came as far up as his calf. A trifork, similar to the one Maskell had seen on Discorn, but smaller, had been stuck in the mud close by his hand. They stopped by the side of the pond and waited. Immediately he became aware of their presence, 
the man set down his other leg and waded out of the water toward them, picking up his trifork in doing so. "'That is not Mulger, but Catice,' said Spadeevil. "'Mulger is dead,' said Catice, speaking the same tongue as Spadeevil, but with an even harsher accent, so that the tympanum of Maskell's ear was affected painfully. The latter saw before him a bowed, powerful individual, advanced in years. He wore nothing but a scanty loincloth. His trunk was long and heavy, but his legs were rather short. His face was beardless, lemon-colored, and anxious-looking. It was disfigured by a number of longitudinal ruts, a quarter of an inch deep, the cavities of which seemed clogged with ancient dirt. The hair of his head was black and sparse. Instead of the twin membranous organs of spadeevil, he possessed but one, and this was in the center of his brow. Spadeevil's dark, solid person stood out from the rest like a reality among dreams. "'Has the trifork passed to you?' he demanded. "'Yes. Why have you brought this woman to Sant?' "'I have brought another thing to Sant. I have brought the new faith.' Kedai stood motionless, and looked troubled. "'State it. Shall I speak with many words, or few words? If you wish to say what is not, many words will not suffice. If you wish to say what is, a few words would be enough.' Spadeevil frowned. "'To hate pleasure brings pride with it. Pride is a pleasure. To kill pleasure we must attach ourselves to duty.' While the mind is planning right action, it has no time to think of pleasure." "'Is that the whole?' asked Catice. "'The truth is simple, even for the simplest man.' "'Do you destroy Hathor and all his generations with a single word?' "'I destroy nature and set up law.' A long silence followed. My probe is double, said Spadeevil. Suffer me to double yours, and you will see as I see. Come you here, you big man, said Kedice to Maskell. Maskell advanced a step closer. Do you follow Spadeevil in his new faith? As far as death, exclaimed Maskell. Kedice picked up a flint. With this stone I strike out one of your two probes. When you have but one, you will see with me, and you will recollect with Spadeevil. Choose you, then, the superior faith, and I shall obey your choice. Endure this little pain, Maskell, for the sake of future men, said Spadeevil. The pain is nothing, replied Maskell, but I fear the result. Permit me although I am only a woman, to take his place, Catice," said Tydamon, stretching out her hand. He struck at it violently with the flint, and gashed it from wrist to thumb. The pale carmen blood spouted up. "'What brings this kiss-lover to Sant?' he said. "'How does she presume to make the rules of life for the sons of Hator?' She bit her lip and stepped back. "'Well then, Maskell, accept.' I certainly should not have played false to Spadeevil, but you hardly can." "'If he bids me, I must do it,' said Maskell. "'But who knows what will come of it?' Spadeevil spoke. "'Of all the descendants of Hator, Catice is the most wholehearted and sincere. He will trample my truth underfoot, thinking me a demon sent by shaping, to destroy the work of this land. But a seed will escape and my blood and yours, Tydamon, will wash it. Then men will know that my destroying evil is their greatest good, but none here will live to see that." Maskell now went quite close to Cadice and offered his head. Cadice raised his hand, and after holding the flint poised for a moment, brought it down with adroitness and force upon the left-hand probe. Maskell cried out with the pain. The blood streamed down, and the function of the organ was destroyed. There was a pause, while he walked to and fro, trying to staunch the blood. "'What now do you feel, Maskell? What do you see?' inquired Tydamon anxiously. He stopped and stared hard at her. 
I now see straight," he said slowly. "'What does that mean?' He continued to wipe the blood from his forehead. He looked troubled. "'Henceforward, as long as I live, I shall fight with my nature, and refuse to feel pleasure, and I advise you to do the same.' Spade Evil gazed at him sternly. "'Do you renounce my teaching?' Maskell, however, returned the gaze without dismay. Spade Evil's image-like clearness of form had departed for him, his frowning face he knew to be the deceptive portico of a weak and confused intellect. It is false. Is it false to sacrifice oneself for another? demanded Tidoman. I can't argue as yet, said Maskell. At this moment the world, with its sweetness, seems to me a sort of charnel-house. I feel a loathing for everything in it, including myself. I know no more." "'Is there no duty?' asked Spade Evil in a harsh tone. "'It appears to me but a cloak under which we share the pleasure of other people.' Tidumman pulled at Spade Evil's arm. "'Maskell has betrayed you, as he has so many others. Let us go.' He stood fast. "'You have changed quickly, Maskell.' Maskell, without answering him, turned to Cadice. "'Why do men go on living in this soft, shameful world, when they can kill themselves?' "'Pain is the nature of Surtur's children. To what other heir do you wish to escape?' "'Surtur's children? Is not Surtur shaping?' "'It is the greatest of lies. It is shaping's masterpiece.' "'Answer, Maskell,' said Spade Evil. "'Do you repudiate right action?' "'Leave me alone. Go back. I am not thinking of you and your ideas. I wish you no harm.' The darkness came on fast. There was another prolonged silence. Cadice threw away the flint and picked up his staff. "'The woman must return home,' he said. "'She was persuaded here, and did not come freely.' You, Spade Evil, must die, backslider as you are." Tidoman said quietly, "'He has no power to enforce this. Are you going to allow the truth to fall to the ground, Spade Evil?' "'I will not perish by my death, but by my efforts to escape from death. Catais, I accept your judgment.' Tidoman smiled. "'For my part, I am too tired to walk farther today. So I shall die with him." Kadai said to Maskell, "'Prove your sincerity. Kill this man and his mistress, according to the laws of Hator.' "'I can't do that. I have travelled in friendship with them.' "'You deny duty, and now you must do your duty,' said Spade Evil, calmly stroking his beard. "'Whatever law you accept, you must obey, without turning to right or left. Your law commands that we must be stoned, and it will soon be dark." "'Have you not even this amount of manhood?' exclaimed Tidoman. Maskell moved heavily. "'Be my witness, Cadice, that the thing was forced on me.' "'Hator is looking on and approving,' replied Cadice. Maskell then went apart to the pile of boulders scattered by the side of the pool. He glanced about him and selected two large fragments of rock, the heaviest that he thought he could carry. With these in his arms, he staggered back. He dropped them on the ground and stood, recovering his breath. When he could speak again, he said, "'I have a bad heart for the business. Is there no alternative? Sleep here tonight, Spade Evil, and in the morning go back to where you have come from. No one shall harm you.' Spade Evil's ironic smile was lost in the gloom. "'Shall I brood again, Maskell, for still another year, and after that come back to Sant with other truths? Come, waste no time, but choose the heavier stone for me, for I am stronger than Tidoman.' Maskell lifted one of the rocks and stepped out four full paces. Spade Evil confronted him, erect, and waited tranquilly. The huge stone hurtled through the air. Its flight looked like a dark shadow. It struck Spade Evil full in the face, crushing his features and breaking his neck. 
He died instantaneously. Tidaman looked away from the fallen man. Be very quick, Maskell, and don't let me keep him waiting. He panted and raised the second stone. She placed herself in front of Spade Evil's body and stood there, unsmiling and cold. The blow caught her between breast and chin, and she fell. Maskell went to her, and kneeling on the ground, half raised her in his arms. There she breathed out her last sighs. After that he laid her down again and rested heavily on his hands, while he peered into the dead face. The transition from its heroic, spiritual expression to the vulgar and grinning mask of Crystalman came like a flash, but he saw it. He stood up in the darkness and pulled Cat-Eyes toward him. "'Is that the true likeness of shaping?' "'It is shaping, stripped of illusion.' How comes this horrible world to exist? Cadice did not answer. Who is Surter? You will get nearer to him tomorrow, but not here. I am wading through too much blood, said Maskell. Nothing good can come of it. Do not fear change and destruction, but laughter and joy. Maskell meditated. Tell me, Cadice. If I had elected to follow Spade Evil, would you really have accepted his faith? He was a great-souled man, replied Cadice. I see that the pride of our men is only another sprouting out of pleasure. Tomorrow I too shall leave Sant to reflect on all this. Maskell shuddered. Then these two deaths were not a necessity, but a crime. His part was played, and henceforward the woman would have dragged down his ideas with her soft love and loyalty. Regret nothing, stranger, but go away at once out of the land. Tonight? Where shall I go? To Womblash, where you'll meet the deepest minds. I will put you on the way. He linked his arm in Maskell's, and they walked away into the night. For a mile or more they skirted the edge of the precipice. The wind was searching and drove grit into their faces. Through the rifts of the clouds, stars, faint and brilliant, appeared. Maskell saw no familiar constellations. He wondered if the sun of earth was visible, and if so, which one it was. They came to the head of a rough staircase, leading down the cliffside. It resembled the one by which he had come up but this descended to the womb-flash forest. "'That is your path,' said Cadice. "'I shall not come any farther.' Maskell detained him. "'Say just this, before we part company. Why does pleasure appear so shameful to us?' "'Because, in feeling pleasure, we forget our home.' "'And that is... Muspel,' answered Cadice. Having made his reply, he disengaged himself, and turning his back, disappeared into the darkness. Maskell stumbled down the staircase as best he could. He was tired, but contemptuous of his pains. His uninjured probe began to discharge matter. He lowered himself from step to step during what seemed an interminable time. The rustling and sighing of the trees grew louder as he approached the bottom. The air became still and warm he at last reached level ground. Still attempting to proceed, he began to trip over roots, and to collide with tree-trunks. After this had happened a few times, he determined to go no farther that night. He heaped together some dry leaves for a pillow, and immediately flung himself down to sleep. Deep and heavy unconsciousness seized him almost instantly. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus. Chapter Thirteen The Womb Flash Forest. He awoke to his third day on torments. His limbs ached. 
He lay on his side, looking stupidly at his surroundings. The forest was like night, but that period of the night when the gray dawn is about to break, and objects begin to be guessed at rather than seen. Two or three amazing shadowy shapes as broad as houses loomed up out of the twilight. He did not realize that they were trees until he turned over on his back and followed their course upward. Far overhead, so high up that he dared not calculate the height, he saw their tops glittering in the sunlight against a tiny patch of blue sky. Clouds of mist, rolling over the floor of the forest, kept interrupting his view. In their silent passage they were like phantoms flitting among the trees. The leaves underneath him were sodden, and heavy drops of moisture splashed onto his head from time to time. He continued lying there, trying to reconstruct the events of the preceding day. His brain was lethargic and confused. Something terrible had happened, but what it was he could not for a long time recollect. Then suddenly there came before his eyes that ghastly closing scene at dusk on the sand plateau. Spade evil's crushed and bloody features, and Tydomon's dying sighs. He shuddered convulsively and felt sick. The peculiar moral outlook that had dictated these brutal murders had departed from him during the night, and now he had recognized what he had done. During the whole of the previous day he seemed to have been laboring under a series of heavy enchantments. First Oshiax had enslaved him, then Tydomon, then Spade Evil, and lastly Cadice. They had forced him to murder and violate. He had guessed nothing, but had imagined that he was traveling as a free and enlightened stranger. What was this nightmare journey for, and would it continue in the same way? The silence of the forest was so intense that he heard no sound except the pumping of blood through his arteries. Putting his hand to his face he found that his remaining probe had disappeared, and that he was in possession of three eyes. The third eye was on his forehead, where the old sorb had been. He could not guess its use. He still had his third arm, but it was nerveless. Now he puzzled his head for a long time, trying unsuccessfully to recall that name which had been the last word spoken by Cadice. He got up, with the intention of resuming his journey. He had no toilet to make and no meal to prepare. The forest was tremendous. The nearest tree appeared to him to have a circumference of at least a hundred feet. Other dim boles looked equally large but what gave the scene its aspect of immensity was the vast spaces separating tree from tree. It was like some gigantic supernatural hall in a life after death. The lowest branches were fifty yards or more from the ground. There was no underbrush, the soil was carpeted only by the dead wet leaves. He looked all around him to find his direction but the cliffs of scent which he had descended were invisible. Every way was like every other way. He had no idea which quarter to attack. He grew frightened and muttered to himself. Craning his neck back, he stared upward and tried to discover the points of the compass from the direction of the sunlight, but it was impossible. While he was standing there, anxious and hesitating, he heard the drum taps. The rhythmical beats proceeded from some distance off. The unseen drummer seemed to be marching through the forest away from him. "'Surter,' he said, under his breath. The next moment he marveled at himself for uttering the name. That mysterious being had not been in his thoughts, nor was there any ostensible connection between him and the drumming. He began to reflect but in the meantime the sounds were traveling away. Automatically he started walking in the same direction. The drum beats had this peculiarity. 
though odd and mystical, there was nothing awe-inspiring in them, but on the contrary they reminded him of some place and some life with which he was perfectly familiar. Once again they caused all his other sense impressions to appear false. The sounds were intermittent. They would go on for a minute, or for five minutes, and then cease for perhaps quarter of an hour. Maskell followed them as well as he could. He walked hard among the huge indistinct trees, in the attempt to come up with the origin of the noise, but the same distance always seemed to separate them. The forest from now onward descended. The gradient was mostly gentle, about one foot in ten, but in some places it was much steeper, and in other parts, again, it was practically level ground for quite long stretches. There were great swampy marshes through which Maskell was obliged to splash. It was a matter of indifference to him how wet he became if only he could catch sight of that individual with the drum. Mile after mile was covered, and still he was no nearer to doing so. The gloom of the forest settled down upon his spirits. He felt despondent, tired, and savage. He had not heard the drum beats for some while, and was half inclined to discontinue the pursuit. Passing around a great columnar tree trunk, he almost stumbled against a man who was standing on the farther side. He was leaning against the trunk with one hand in an attitude of repose. His other hand was resting on a staff. Maskell stopped short and started at him. He was nearly naked and of gigantic build. He overtopped Maskell by a head. His face and body were faintly phosphorescent. His eyes, three in number, were pale green and luminous, shining like lamps. His skin was hairless, but the hair of his head was piled up in thick black coils and fastened like a woman's. His features were absolutely tranquil, but a terrible, quiet energy seemed to lie just underneath the surface. Maskell addressed him. Did the drumming come from you? The man shook his head. What is your name? He replied in a strange, strained, twisted voice. Maskell gathered that the name he gave was Dream Center. What was that drumming? Certer, said Dream Center. Is it advisable for me to follow it? Why? Perhaps he intends me to. He brought me here from Earth. Dream Center caught hold of him, bent down, and peered into his face. Not you, but Nightspore. This was the first time that Maskell had heard Nightspore's name since his arrival on the planet. He was so astonished that he could frame no more questions. Eat this, said Dream Center. Then we will chase the sound together. He picked something up from the ground and handed it to Maskell. He could not see distinctly, but it felt like a hard, round nut of the size of a fist. I can't crack it. Dream Center took it between his hands and broke it into pieces. Maskell then ate some of the pulpy interior, which was intensely disagreeable. What am I doing in torments, then? he asked. You came to steer musper fire, to give a deeper life to men, never doubting if your soul could endure that burning. Maskell could hardly decipher the strangled words. Muspel! That's the name I've been trying to remember ever since I awoke. Dream Center suddenly turned his head sideways and appeared to listen for something. He motioned with his hand to Muskell to keep quiet. Is it the drumming? Hush! They come! He was looking toward the upper forest. The now familiar drum rhythm was heard, this time accompanied by the tramp of marching feet. Maskell saw, marching through the trees and heading toward them, 
three men in single file, separated from one another by only a yard or so. They were traveling downhill at a swift pace, and looked neither to left nor right. They were naked, their figures were shining against the black background of the forest with a pale supernatural light, green and ghostly. When they were abreast of him, about twenty feet off, he perceived who they were. The first man was himself, Maskell. The second was Crag. The third man was Knightsbor. Their faces were grim and set. The source of the drumming was out of sight. The sound appeared to come from some point in front of them. Maskell and Dream Center put themselves in motion to keep up with the swiftly moving marchers. At the same time a low, faint music began. Its rhythm stepped with the drumbeats, but, unlike the latter, it did not seem to proceed from any particular quarter of the forest. It resembled the subjective music heard in dreams, which accompanies the dreamer everywhere, as a sort of natural atmosphere, rendering all his experiences emotional. It seemed to issue from an unearthly orchestra, and was strongly troubled, pathetic, and tragic. Maskell marched and listened, and as he listened it grew louder and stormier. But the pulse of the drum interpenetrated all the other sounds like the quiet beating of reality. His emotion deepened. He could not have said if minutes or hours were passing. The spectral procession marched on, a little way ahead, on a path parallel with his own and dream centers. The music pulsated violently. Crag lifted his arm and displayed a long, murderous-looking knife. He sprang forward and, raising it over the phantom Maskell's back, stabbed him twice, leaving the knife in the wound the second time. Maskell threw up his arms and fell down dead. Crag leaped into the forest and vanished from sight. Knightsbor marched on alone, stern and unmoved. The music rose to crescendo. The whole dim, gigantic forest was roaring with sound. The tones came from all sides, from above, from the ground under their feet. It was so grandly passionate that Maskell felt his soul loosening from its bodily envelope. He continued to follow Knightsbor. A strange brightness began to glow in front of them. It was not daylight, but a radiance such as he had never seen before, and such as he could not have imagined to be possible. Knightsbor moved straight toward it. Maskell felt his chest bursting. The light flashed higher. The awful harmonies of the music followed hard one upon another, like the waves of a wild, magic ocean. His body was incapable of enduring such shocks, and all of a sudden he tumbled over in a faint that resembled death. End of chapter 13、14、Of a Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus. Chapter Fourteen, Pole Crab. The morning slowly passed. Maskell made some convulsive movements and opened his eyes. He sat up, blinking. All was nightlike and silent in the forest. The strange light had gone. The music had ceased. Dream Center had vanished. He fingered his beard, clotted with Tydomon's blood, and fell into a deep muse. According to Panaw and Cadice, this forest contains wise men. Perhaps Dream Center was one. Perhaps that vision I have just seen was a specimen of his wisdom. It looked almost like an answer to my question. I ought not to have asked about myself, but about Surtur. Then I would have got a different answer. I might have learned something. I might have seen him. He remained quiet and apathetic for a bit. But I couldn't face that awful glare, he proceeded. It was bursting my body. He warned me, too. And so, Surtur does really exist, 
and my journey stands for something. But why am I here, and what can I do? Who is Surtur? Where is he to be found? Something wild came into his eyes. What did Dream Center mean by his, not you, but Nightspore? Am I a secondary character? Is he regarded as important, and I as unimportant? Where is Nightspore, and what is he doing? Am I to wait for his time and pleasure? Can I originate nothing?" He continued sitting up, with straight extended legs. I must make up my mind that this is a strange journey, and that the strangest things will happen in it. It's no use making plans, for I can't see two steps ahead. Everything is unknown. But one thing's evident, nothing but the wildest audacity will carry me through, and I must sacrifice everything else to that. And therefore, if Surtur shows himself again, I shall go forward to meet him, even if it means death." Through the black, quiet aisles of the forest the drum-beats came again. The sound was a long way off, and very faint. It was like the last mutterings of thunder after a heavy storm. Maskell listened without getting up. The drumming faded into silence and did not return. He smiled queerly and said aloud, "'Thanks, Surtur. I accept the omen.' When he was about to get up he found that the shriveled skin that had been his third arm was flapping disconcertingly with every movement of his body. He made perforations in it all around, as close to his chest as possible with the fingernails of both hands. Then he carefully twisted it off. In that world of rapid growth and ungrowth he judged that the stump would soon disappear. After that he rose and peered into the darkness. The forest at that point sloped rather steeply, and without thinking twice about it he took the downhill direction, never doubting it would bring him somewhere. As soon as he started walking his temper became gloomy and morose. He was shaken, tired, dirty, and languid with hunger. Moreover, he realized that the walk was not going to be a short one. But that as it may, he determined to sit down no more until the whole dismal forest was at his back. One after another, the shadowy, house-like trees were observed, avoided, and passed. Far overhead the little patch of glowing sky was still always visible. Otherwise he had no clue to the time of day. He continued tramping sullenly down the slope for many damp, slippery miles, in some places through bogs. When presently the twilight seemed to thin, he guessed that the open world was not far away. The forest grew more palpable and gray, and now he saw its majesty better. The tree trunks were like round towers, and so wide were the intervals that they resembled natural amphitheaters. He could not make out the color of the bark. Everything he saw amazed him, but his admiration was of the growling, grudging kind. The difference in light between the forest behind him and the forest ahead became so marked that he could no longer doubt that he was on the point of coming out. Real light was in front of him. Looking back he found he had a shadow. The trunks acquired a reddish tint. He quickened his pace. As the minutes went by the bright patch ahead grew luminous and vivid. It had a tinge of blue. He also imagined that he heard the sound of surf. All that part of the forest toward which he was moving became rich with color. The boles of the trees were of a deep, dark red. Their leaves, high above his head, were ulfire-hued. The dead leaves on the ground were of a color he could not name. At the same time he discovered the use of his third eye. By adding a third angle to his sight, every object he looked at stood out in greater relief. The world looked less flat, more realistic, and significant. He had a stronger attraction to his surroundings. He seemed somehow to lose his egotism, and to become free and thoughtful. Now through the last trees he saw full daylight. Less than half a mile separated him from the border of the forest, and eager to discover what lay beyond he broke into a run. He heard the surf louder. It was a peculiar hissing sound that could proceed only from water, yet was unlike the sea. 
Almost immediately he came within sight of an enormous horizon of dancing waves, which he knew must be the sinking sea. He fell back into a quick walk, continuing to stare hard. The wind that met him was hot, fresh, and sweet. When he arrived at the final fringe of forest, which joined the wide sands of the shore without any change of level, he leaned with his back to a great tree and gazed his fill, motionless at what lay in front of him. The sands continued east and west in a straight line, broken only here and there by a few creeks. They were of a brilliant orange color, but there were patches of violet. The forest appeared to stand sentinel over the shore for its entire length. Everything else was sea and sky. He had never seen so much water. The semicircle of the skyline was so vast that he might have imagined himself on a flat world, with a range of vision determined only by the power of his eye. The sea was unlike any sea on earth. It resembled an immense liquid opal. On a body color of rich, magnificent emerald green, flashes of red, yellow, and blue were everywhere shooting up and vanishing. The wave motion was extraordinary. Pinnacles of water were slowly formed until they attained a height of perhaps ten or twenty feet, when they would suddenly sink downward and outward, creating in their descent a series of concentric rings for long distances around them. Quickly moving currents, like rivers in the sea, could be seen racing away from land. They were of a darker green and bore no pinnacles. Where the sea met the shore, the waves rushed over the sands far in, with almost sinister rapidity, accompanied by a weird, hissing, spitting sound, which was what Maskell had heard. The green tongues rolled in without foam. About twenty miles distant, as he judged, directly opposite him a long, low island stood up from the sea, black and not distinguished in outline. It was Swaylone's island. Maskell was less interested in that than in the blue sunset that glowed behind his back. Alpine had set, but the whole northern sky was plunged into the minor key by its afterlight. Branspell in the zenith was white and overpowering. The day was cloudless and terrifically hot, but where the blue sun had sunk, a somber shadow seemed to overhang the world. Maskell had a feeling of disintegration just as if two chemically distinct forces were simultaneously acting upon the cells of his body. Since the afterglow of Alpine affected him like this, he thought it more likely that he would never be able to face that sun itself and go on living. Still, some modification might happen to him that would make it possible. The sea tempted him. He made up his mind to bathe and at once walked toward the shore. The instant he stepped outside the shadow line of the forest trees, the blinding rays of the sun beat down on him so savagely that for a few minutes he felt sick and his head swam. He trod quickly across the sands. The orange-colored parts were nearly hot enough to roast food, he judged, but the violet parts were like fire itself. He stepped on a patch in ignorance and immediately jumped high into the air with a startled yell. The sea was voluptuously warm. It would not bear his weight, so he determined to try swimming. First of all, he stripped off his skin garment, washed it thoroughly with sand and water, and laid it in the sun to dry. Then he scrubbed himself as well as he could and washed out his beard and hair. After that he waded in a long way until the water reached his breast and took to swimming, avoiding the spouts as far as possible. He found it no pastime. The water was everywhere of unequal density. In some places he could swim, in others he could barely save himself from drowning, in others again he could not force himself beneath the surface at all. There were no outward signs to show what the water ahead held in store for him. The whole business was most dangerous. He came out feeling clean and invigorated. For a time he walked up and down the sands, drying himself in the hot sunshine and looking around him. He was a naked stranger in a huge, foreign, mystical world, and whichever way he turned, unknown and threatening forces were glaring at him. The gigantic, white, withering branch spell, the awful, body-changing alpine, 
the beautiful, deadly, treacherous sea, the dark and eerie Swaylone's island, the spirit-crushing forest out of which he had just escaped, to all these mighty powers surrounding him on every side, what resources had he, a feeble, ignorant traveller to oppose, from a tiny planet on the other side of space, to avoid being utterly destroyed? Then he smiled to himself. I've already been here two days, and still I survive. I have luck, and with that one can balance the universe. But what is luck? A verbal expression, or a thing? As he was putting on his skin, which was now dry, the answer came to him, and this time he was grave. Surtur brought me here, and Surtur is watching over me. That is my luck. But what is Surtur in this world? How is he able to protect me against the blind and ungovernable forces of nature? Is he stronger than nature? Hungry as he was for food, he was hungrier still for human society, for he wished to inquire about all these things. He asked himself which way he should turn his steps. There were only two ways, along the shore, either east or west. The nearest creek lay to the east, cutting the sands about a mile away. He walked toward it. The forest face was forbidding and enormously high. It was so squarely turned to the sea that it looked as though it had been planed by tools. Maskell strode along in the shade of the trees, but kept his head constantly turned away from them, toward the sea. There it was more cheerful. The creek, when he reached it, proved to be broad and flat-banked. It was not a river, but an arm of the sea. Its still, dark green water curved around a bend out of sight into the forest. The trees on both banks overhung the water so that it was completely in shadow. He went as far as the bend, beyond which another short beach appeared. A man was sitting on a narrow shelf of bank, with his feet in the water. He was clothed in a coarse, rough hide, which left his limbs bare. He was short, thick, and sturdy, with short legs and long, powerful arms, terminating in hands of an extraordinary size. He was oldish. His face was plain, slab-like, and expressionless. It was full of wrinkles and walnut-colored. Both face and head were bald, and his skin was tough and leathery. He seemed to be some sort of peasant or fisherman. There was no trace in his face of thought for others, or delicacy of feeling. He possessed three eyes of different colors, jade-green, blue, and ulfire. In front of him, riding on the water, moored to the bank, was an elementary raft, consisting of the branches of trees, clumsily corded together. Maskell addressed him. "'Are you another of the wise men of the Womb-Flash Forest?' The man answered him in a gruff, husky voice, looking up as he did so. I'm a fisherman. I know nothing about wisdom. What name do you go by? Pole Crab. What's yours? Maskell. If you're a fisherman, you ought to have fish. I'm famishing. Pole Crab grunted and paused a minute before answering. There's fish enough. My dinner is cooking in the sands now. It's easy enough to get you some more. Maskell found this a pleasant speech. But how long will it take? he asked. The man slid the palms of his hands together, producing a shrill, screeching noise. He lifted his feet from the water and clambered onto the bank. In a minute or two a curious little beast came crawling up to his feet, turning its face and eyes up affectionately, like a dog. It was about two feet long and somewhat resembled a small seal, but had six legs, ending in strong claws. Arg, go fish, said Pole Crab hoarsely. The animal immediately tumbled off the bank into the water. It swam gracefully to the middle of the creek and made a pivotal dive beneath the surface, where it remained a great while. Simple fishing, remarked Maskell. But what's the raft for? To go to sea with. The best fish are out at sea. These are eatable. That Arg seems a highly intelligent creature. Polecrab grunted again. 
I've trained close on a hundred of them. The big heads learn best, but they're slow swimmers. The narrow heads swim like eels, but can't be taught. Now I've started interbreeding them. He's one of them. Do you live here alone? No, I've got a wife and three boys. My wife's sleeping somewhere, but where my lads are, shaping knows. Maskell began to feel very much at home with this unsophisticated being. The raft's all crazy, he remarked, staring at it. If you go far out in that, you've got more pluck than I have. I've been to matter play on it, said Pole Crab. The Arg reappeared and started swimming to shore, but this time clumsily, as if it were bearing a heavy weight under the surface. When it landed at its master's feet, they saw that each set of claws was clutching a fish, six in all. Pole Crab took them from it. He proceeded to cut off the heads and tails with a sharp-edged stone which he picked up. These he threw to the arg, which devoured them without any fuss. Pole Crab beckoned to Maskell to follow him, and, carrying the fish, walked toward the open shore by the same way that he had come. When they reached the sands, he sliced the fish, removed the entrails, and, digging a shallow hole in a patch of violet sand, placed the remainder of the carcasses in it, and covered them over again. Then he dug up his own dinner. Maskell's nostrils quivered at the savory smell, but he was not yet to dine. Polecrab, turning to go with the cooked fish in his hand, said, These are mine, not yours. When yours are done, you can come back and join me, supposing you want company. How soon will that be? About twenty minutes, replied the fisherman over his shoulder. Maskell sheltered himself in the shadows of the forest and waited. When the time had approximately elapsed, he disinterred his meal, scorching his fingers in the operation, although it was only the surface of the sand which was so intensely hot. Then he returned to Pole Crab. In the warm, still air and cheerful shade of the inlet, they munched in silence, looking from their food to the sluggish water and back again. With every mouthful, Maskell felt his strength returning. He finished before Pole Crab, who ate like a man for whom time has no value. When he had done, he stood up. "'Come and drink,' he said in his husky voice. Maskell looked at him inquiringly. The man led him a little way into the forest and walked straight up to a certain tree. At a convenient height in its trunk a hole had been tapped and plugged. Pole Crab removed the plug and put his mouth to the aperture, sucking for quite a long time, like a child at its mother's breast. Masco, watching him, imagined that he saw his eyes growing brighter. When his own turn came to drink, he found the juice of the tree somewhat like coconut milk in flavor, but intoxicating. It was a new sort of intoxication, however, for neither his will nor his emotions were excited, but only his intellect and that only in a certain way. His thoughts and images were not freed and loosened, but on the contrary, kept laboring and swelling painfully, until they reached the full beauty of an aperçu, which would then flame up in his consciousness, burst and vanish. After that the whole process started over again, but there was never a moment when he was not perfectly cool and master of his senses. When each had drunk twice, Pole Crab replugged the hole and they returned to their bank. Is it blood somber yet? asked Maskell, sprawling on the ground, well content. Pole Crab resumed his old upright sitting posture with his feet in the water. Just beginning, was his hoarse response. Then I must stay here till it's over. Shall we talk? We can, said the other, without enthusiasm. Maskell glanced at him through half-closed lids, wondering if he were exactly what he seemed to be. In his eyes he thought he detected a wise light. "'Have you travelled much, Pole Crab? "'Not what you would call travelling. "'You tell me you've been to Matterplay. What kind of country is that?' "'I don't know. I went there to pick up flints.' "'What countries lie beyond it?' Threel comes next, as you go north. They say it's a land of mystics. I don't know. Mystics? 
So I'm told. Still farther north there's Lichstorm. Now we're going far afield. There are mountains there, and altogether it must be a very dangerous place, especially for a full-blooded man like you. Take care of yourself. This is rather premature, Pole Crab. How do you know I'm going there? As you've come from the south, I suppose you'll go north. Well, that's right enough, said Maskell, staring hard at him. But how do you know I've come from the south? Well, then, perhaps you haven't. But there's a look of if-dawn about you. What kind of look? A tragical look, said Pole Crab. He never even glanced at Maskell, but was gazing at a thick spot on the water with unblinking eyes. "'What lies beyond Lichstorm?' asked Maskell, after a minute or two. "'Barry, where you have two sons instead of one, but beyond that fact I know nothing about it. Then comes the ocean.' "'And what's on the other side of the ocean?' "'That you must find out for yourself, for I doubt if anybody has ever crossed it and come back.' Maskell was silent for a little while. "'How is it that your people are so unadventurous? I seem to be the only one travelling from curiosity.' "'What do you mean by your people? True, you don't know that I don't belong to your planet at all. I've come from another world, Pole Crab. "'What to find?' "'I came here with Crag and Nightspore, to follow Surtur. I must have fainted the moment I arrived. When I sat up it was night and the others had vanished. Since then I've been traveling at random." Polecrab scratched his nose. "'You haven't found Surtur yet?' "'I've heard his drum taps frequently. In the forest this morning I came quite close to him. Then two days ago, in the Lusian Plain, I saw a vision, a being in man's shape, who called himself Surtur. Well, maybe it was Surtur. No, that's impossible, replied Maskell reflectively. It was Crystalman. And it isn't a question of my suspecting it. I know it. How? Because this is Crystalman's world, and Surtur's world is something quite different. That's queer, then, said Pole Crab. Since I've come out of the forest, proceeded Maskell, talking half to himself. A change has come over me, and I see things differently. Everything here looks much more solid and real in my eyes than in other places, so much so that I can't entertain the least doubt of its existence. It not only looks real, it is real, and on that I would stake my life. But at the same time that it's real, it is false. Like a dream? No, not at all like a dream, and that's just what I want to explain. This world of yours, and perhaps of mine too, for that matter, doesn't give me the slightest impression of a dream, or an illusion, or anything of that sort. I know it's really here at this moment, and it's exactly as we're seeing it, you and I. Yet it's false. It's false in this sense, Paul Crab. Side by side with it another world exists, and that other world is the true one, and this one is all false and deceitful to the very core. And so it occurs to me that reality and falseness are two words for the same thing." "'Perhaps there is such another world,' said Pole Crab huskily. "'But did that vision also seem real and false to you?' "'Very real, but not false, then for then I didn't understand all this. But just because it was real, it couldn't have been Surtur, who has no connection with reality. Didn't those drum-taps sound real to you? I had to hear them with my ears, so they sounded real to me. Still, they were somehow different, and they certainly came from Surtur. If I didn't hear them correctly, that was my fault and not his. Pole Crab growled a little. If Surtur chooses to speak to you in that fashion, it appears he's trying to say something. What else can I think? But, Pole Crab, what's your opinion? Is he calling me to the life after death? 
The old man stirred uneasily. "'I'm a fisherman,' he said after a minute or two. "'I live by killing, and so does everybody. This life seems to me all wrong. So maybe life of any kind is wrong, and Surtur's world is not life at all, but something else.' "'Yes, but will death lead me to it, whatever it is?' "'Ask the dead,' said Polecrab, and not a living man. Maskell continued. "'In the forest I heard music and saw a light, which could not have belonged to this world. They were too strong for my senses, and I must have fainted for a long time. There was a vision as well, in which I saw myself killed, while Nightspore walked on toward the light alone.' Polecrab uttered his grunt. You have enough to think over." A short silence ensued which was broken by Maskell. "'So strong is my sense of the untruth of this present life, that it may come to my putting an end to myself.' The fisherman remained quiet and immobile. Maskell lay on his stomach, propped his face on his hands, and stared at him. "'What do you think, Polecrab? Is it possible for any man, while in the body, to gain a closer view of that other world than I have done?" "'I am an ignorant man, stranger, so I can't say. Perhaps there are many others like you who would gladly know. Where? I should like to meet them. Do you think you are made of one stuff and the rest of mankind of another stuff? I can't be so presumptuous. Possibly all men are reaching out toward Muspel in most cases, without being aware of it. "'In the wrong direction,' said Polecrab. Maskell gave him a strange look. "'How so?' "'I don't speak for my own wisdom,' said Polecrab, "'for I have none. But I have just now recalled what Broodviolt once told me, when I was a young man and he was an old one. He said that Crystalman tries to turn all things into one and that whichever way his shapes march in order to escape from him, they find themselves again face to face with Crystalman, and are changed into new crystals, and that this marching of shapes, which we call forking, springs from the unconscious desire to find Surtur, but is in the opposite direction to the right one. For Surtur's world does not lie on this side of the one, which is the beginning of life, but on the other side and to get to it we must repass through the One. But this can only be by renouncing our self-life, and reuniting ourselves to the whole of Crystalman's world. And when this has been done, it is only the first stage of the journey, though many good men imagine it to be the whole journey. As far as I can remember, that is what Broodviol said, but perhaps, as I was then a young and ignorant man, I may have left out words which would explain his meaning better. Maskell, who had listened attentively to all this, remained thoughtful at the end. "'It's plain enough,' he said. "'But what did he mean by our reuniting ourselves to Crystalman's world? If it is false, are we to make ourselves false as well?' "'I didn't ask him that question, and you are as well qualified to answer it as I am.' "'He must have meant that, as it is, we are each of us living in a false, private world of our own, a world of dreams and appetites and distorted perceptions. By embracing the great world, we certainly lose nothing in truth and reality." Polecrab withdrew his feet from the water, stood up, yawned, and stretched his limbs. "'I have told you all I know,' he said in a surly voice. "'Now let me go to sleep.' Maskell kept his eyes fixed on him, but made no reply. The old man let himself down stiffly onto the ground and prepared to rest. While he was still arranging his position to his liking, a footfall sounded behind the two men, coming from the direction of the forest. Maskell twisted his neck and saw a woman approaching them. He at once guessed that it was Paul Crabb's wife. He sat up, but the fisherman did not stir. The woman came and stood in front of them, looking down from what appeared a great height. Her dress was similar to her husband's, but covered her limbs more. She was young, tall, slender, and strikingly erect. Her skin was lightly tanned, and she looked strong, 
but not at all peasant-like. Refinement was stamped all over her. Her face had too much energy of expression for a woman, and she was not beautiful. Her three great eyes kept flashing and glowing. She had great masses of fine yellow hair, coiled up and fastened, but so carelessly that some of the strands were flowing down her back. When she spoke, it was in a rather weak voice, but full of lights and shades, and somehow intense passionateness never seemed to be far away from it. "'Forgiveness is asked for listening to your conversation,' she said, addressing Maskell. "'I was resting behind the tree and heard it all.' He got up slowly. "'Are you Polecrab's wife?' "'She is my wife,' said Polecrab, "'and her name is Glemiel. Sit down again, stranger, and you too, wife, since you are here.' They both obeyed. "'I heard everything,' repeated Glemiel. But what I did not hear was where you were going to, Maskell, after you have left us. I know no more than you do. Listen, then. There is only one place for you to go, and that is Swaylone's Island. I will ferry you across myself before sunset. What shall I find there? He may go, wife, put in the old man hoarsely, but I won't allow you to go. I will take him over myself. No, you have always put me off," said Glemio, with some emotion. This time I mean to go. When Tyrgeld shines at night and I sit on the shore here, listening to Earthred's music traveling faintly across the sea, I am tortured, I can't endure it. I have long since made up my mind to go to the island to see what this music is. If it's bad, if it kills me, well. "'What have I to do with the man and his music, Glemio?' demanded Maskell. "'I think the music will answer all your questions better than Polecrab has done, and possibly in a way that will surprise you. "'What kind of music can it be to travel all those miles across the sea? "'A peculiar kind, so we are told, not pleasant, but painful.' and the man that can play the instrument of Earthrid would be able to conjure up the most astonishing forms, which are not phantasms, but realities." "'That may be so,' growled Polecrab. "'But I have been to the island by daylight, and what did I find there? Human bones, new and ancient. Those are Earthrid's victims, and you, wife, shall not go.' "'But will that music play tonight?' asked Maskell. Yes, replied Glemiel, gazing at him intently. When Tyrgeld rises, which is our moon? If Earthred plays men to death, it appears to me that his own death is due. In any case, I should like to hear those sounds for myself. But as for taking you with me, Glemiel, women die too easily in torments. I have only just now washed myself clean of the death blood of another woman. Glemio laughed, but said nothing. "'Now go to sleep,' said Pole Crab. "'When the time comes, I will take you across myself.' He laid down again and closed his eyes. Maskell followed his example, but Glemio remained sitting erect, with their legs under her. "'Who was that other woman, Maskell?' she asked presently. He did not answer, but pretended to sleep. End of chapter 14。Chapter 15 of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to Arcturus. Chapter 15. Swaylone's Island. When he awoke, the day was not so bright, and he guessed it was late afternoon. Polecrab and his wife were both on their feet, and another meal of fish had been cooked and was waiting for him. "'Is it decided who is to go with me?' he asked before sitting down. "'I go,' said Glemiel. "'Do you agree, Polecrab?' The fisherman growled a little in his throat and motioned to the others to take their seats. He took a mouthful before answering. 
Something strong is attracting her, and I can't hold her back. I don't think I shall see you again, wife, but the lads are now nearly old enough to fend for themselves." "'Don't take dejected views,' replied Glemiel sternly. She was not eating. "'I shall come back and make amends to you. It's only for a night.' Maskell gazed from one to the other in perplexity. "'Let me go alone. I would be sorry if anything happened.' Glemiel shook her head. "'Don't regard this as a woman's caprice,' she said. "'Even if you hadn't passed this way, I would have heard that music soon. I have a hunger for it.' "'Haven't you any such feeling, Pole Crab? "'No. A woman is a noble and sensitive creature, and there are attractions in nature too subtle for males. Take her with you, since she is set on it. Maybe she is right.' Perhaps Earthrid's music will answer your questions, and hers too. What are your questions, Glemiel? The woman shed a strange smile. You may be sure that a question which requires music for an answer can't be put into words. If you are not back by the morning, remarked her husband, I will know you are dead. The meal was finished in a constrained silence. Pole Crab wiped his mouth and produced a seashell from a kind of pocket. Will you say goodbye to the boys? Shall I call them? She considered a moment. Yes, yes, I must see them. He put the shell to his mouth and blew. A loud, mournful noise passed through the air. A few minutes later there was a sound of scurrying footsteps, and the boys were seen emerging from the forest. Maskell looked with curiosity at the first children he had seen on Tormance. The oldest boy was carrying the youngest on his back, while the third trotted some distance behind. The child was let down, and all the three formed a semicircle in front of Maskell, standing staring up at him with wide open eyes. Polecrab looked on stolidly, but Glemiel glanced away from them, with proudly raised head and a baffling expression. Maskell put the ages of the boys at about nine, seven, and five years, respectively. But he was calculating according to earth time. The eldest was tall, slim, but strongly built. He, like his brothers, was naked, and his skin from top to toe was all-fire colored. His facial muscles indicated a wild and daring nature, and his eyes were like green fires. The second showed promise of being a broad, powerful man. His head was large and heavy, and drooped. His face and skin were reddish. His eyes were almost too somber and penetrating for a child's. "'That one,' said Pole Crab, pinching the boy's ear, "'may perhaps grow up to be a second brood vial.' "'Who was that?' demanded the boy, bending his head forward to hear the answer. A big old man of marvelous wisdom. He became wise by making up his mind never to ask questions, but to find things out for himself. If I had not asked this question, I should not have known about him. That would not have mattered, replied the father. The youngest child was paler and slighter than his brother's. His face was most tranquil and expressionless but it had this peculiarity about it that every few minutes, without any apparent cause, it would wrinkle up and look perplexed. At these times his eyes, which were of a tawny gold, seemed to contain secrets difficult to associate with one of his age. "'He puzzles me,' said Pole Crab. "'He has a soul like sap, and he's interested in nothing. He may turn out to be the most remarkable of the bunch.' Maskell took the child in one hand and lifted him as high as his head. He took a good look at him and set him down again. The boy never changed countenance. "'What do you make of him?' asked the fisherman. "'It's on the tip of my tongue to say, but it just escapes me. Let me drink again, and then I shall have it.' "'Go and drink, then.' Maskell strode over to the tree, drank and returned. In ages to come, he said, speaking deliberately, 
he will be a grand and awful tradition. A seer, possibly, or even a divinity. Watch over him well." The eldest boy looked scornful. "'I want to be none of those things. I would like to be like that big fellow,' and he pointed his finger at Maskell. He laughed and showed his white teeth through his beard. "'Thanks for the compliments, old warrior,' he said. "'He's great and brawny,' continued the boy, "'and can hold his own with other men. Can you hold me up with one arm as you did that child?' Maskell complied. "'That is being a man!' exclaimed the boy. "'Enough!' said Pole Crab impatiently. "'I called you lads here to say good-bye to your mother. She is going away with this man. I think she may not return, but we don't know.' The second boy's face became suddenly inflamed. "'Is she going of her own choice?' he inquired. "'Yes,' replied the father. "'Then she is bad.' He brought the words out with such force and emphasis that they sounded like the crack of a whip. The old man cuffed him twice. "'Is it your mother you are speaking of?' The boy stood his ground, without change of expression, but said nothing. The youngest child spoke for the first time. "'My mother will not come back, but she will die dancing.' Pole Crab and his wife looked at one another. "'Where are you going to, mother?' asked the eldest lad. Glamiel bent down and kissed him. "'To the island?' "'Well, then, if you don't come back by tomorrow morning, I will go and look for you.' Maskell grew more and more uneasy in his mind. "'This seems to me to be a man's journey,' he said. "'I think it would be better for you not to come, Glamiel.' "'I will not be dissuaded,' she replied. He stroked his beard in perplexity. "'Is it time to start?' "'It wants four hours to sunset. We shall need all that.' Maskell sighed. "'I'll go to the mouth of the creek and wait there for you and the raft. You will wish to make your farewells, Glamiel.' He then clasped Pole Crab by the hand. "'Adieu, fisherman.' "'You have repaid me well for my answers,' said the old man gruffly but it's not your fault, and in Shaping's world the worst things happen." The eldest boy came close to Maskell and frowned at him. "'Farewell, big man,' he said, "'but guard my mother well, as well as you are able to, or I shall follow you and kill you.' Maskell walked slowly along the creek bank till he came to the bend. The glorious sunshine and the sparkling, brilliant sea then met his eyes again and all melancholy was swept out of his mind. He continued as far as the seashore, and issuing out of the shadows of the forest, strolled on to the sands and sat down in the full sunlight. The radiance of Alpine had long since disappeared. He drank in the hot, invigorating wind, listened to the hissing waves, and stared over the colored sea with its pinnacles and currents at Swalone's Island. What music can that be, which tears a wife and mother away from all she loves the most?" he meditated. It sounds unholy. Will it tell me what I want to know? Can it? In a little while he became aware of a movement behind him, and, turning his head, he saw the raft floating along the creek toward the open sea. Pole Crab was standing upright, propelling it with a rude pole. He passed by Maskell without looking at him, or making any salutation, and proceeded out to sea. While he was wondering at this strange behavior, Glamiel and the boys came in sight, walking along the bank of the inlet. The eldest-born was holding her hand and talking, and the other two were behind. She was calm and smiling, but seemed abstracted. "'What is your husband doing with the raft?' asked Maskell. He's putting it in position, and we shall wade out and join it," she answered in her low-toned voice. "'But how shall we make the island, without oars or sails?' "'Don't you see that current running away from land? See, he is approaching it. That will take us straight there.' "'But how can you get back?' 
There is a way, but we need not think of that to-day. Why shouldn't I come too? demanded the eldest boy. Because the raft won't carry three. Maskell is a heavy man. It doesn't matter, said the boy. I know where there is wood for another raft. As soon as you have gone, I shall set to work." Polecrab had by this time maneuvered his flimsy craft to the position he desired, within a few yards of the current, which at that point made a sharp bend from the east. He shouted out some words to his wife and Maskell. Glemiel kissed her children convulsively, and broke down a little. The eldest boy bit his lip till it bled, and tears glistened in his eyes, but the younger children stared wide-eyed and displayed no emotion. Glemiel now walked into the sea, followed by Maskell. The water covered first their ankles, then their knees, but when it came high as their waists they were close on the raft. Polecrab let himself down into the water and assisted his wife to climb over the side. When she was up she bent down and kissed him. No words were exchanged. Maskell scrambled up onto the front part of the raft. The woman sat cross-legged in the stern and seized the pole. Polecrab shoved them off toward the current, while she worked her pole until they got within its power. The raft immediately began to travel swiftly away from land with a smooth, swaying motion. The boys waved from the shore. Glemiel responded, but Maskell turned his back squarely to land and gazed ahead. Polecrab was wading back to the shore. For upward of an hour Maskell did not change his position by an inch. No sound was heard but the splashing of the strange waves all around them, and the stream-like gurgle of the current, which threaded its way smoothly through the tossing, tumultuous sea. From their pathway of safety the beautiful danger surrounding them were an exhilarating experience. The air was fresh and clean, and the heat from Branspell, now low in the west, was at last endurable. The riot of sea-colors had long since banished all sadness and anxiety from his heart. Yet he felt such a grudge against the woman for selfishly forsaking those who should have been dear to her that he could not bring himself to begin a conversation. But when, over the now enlarged shape of the dark island, he caught sight of a long chain of lofty, distant mountains, glowing salmon-pink in the evening sunlight, he felt constrained to break the silence by inquiring what they were. "'It is Lichstorm,' said Glemiel. Maskell asked no questions about it, but in turning to address her, his eyes had rested on the rapidly receding womb-flash forest and he continued to stare at that. They had travelled about eight miles, and now he could better estimate the enormous height of the trees. Overtopping them, far away, he saw Sat, and he fancied, but was not quite sure, that he could distinguish Discorn as well. "'Now that we are alone in a strange place,' said Glemiel, averting her head, and looking down over the side of the raft into the water, "'tell me what you thought of Pole Crab. Maskell paused before answering. He seemed to me like a mountain wrapped in a cloud. You see the lower buttresses and think that is all. But then, high up, far above the clouds, you suddenly catch sight of more mountain, and even then it is not the top. You read character well and have great perception, remarked Glemiel quietly. Now, say what I am. In place of a human heart, you have a wild harp, and that's all I know about you. What was that you said to my husband about two worlds? You heard. Yes, I heard, and I also am conscious of two worlds. My husband and boys are real to me, and I love them fondly. But there is another world for me, as there is for you, Maskell, and it makes my real world appear all false and vulgar. Perhaps we are seeking the same thing. But can it be right to satisfy our self-nature at the expense of other people? No, it's not right. It is wrong and base. But in that other world these words have no meaning." There was a silence. 
"'It's useless to discuss such topics,' said Maskell. "'The choice is now out of our hands, and we must go where we are taken. What I would rather speak about is what awaits us on the island. I am ignorant, except that we shall find Earthrid there. Who is Earthrid, and why is it called Swaylone's Island? They say Earthrid came from Threel, but I know nothing else about him. As for Swaylone, if you like, I will tell you his legend. If you please, said Maskell. In a far back age, began Glemiel, when the seas were hot and clouds hung heavily over the earth, and life was rich with transformations, Swaylone came to this island, of which men had never before set foot, and began to play his music, the first music in torments. Nightly, when the moon shone, people used to gather on this shore behind us and listen to the faint, sweet strains floating from over the sea. One night, Shaping, whom you call Crystalman, was passing this way in company with Crag. They listened a while to the music, and Shaping said, Have you heard more beautiful sounds? This is my world and my music. Crag stamped with his foot and laughed. You must do better than that if I am to admire it. Let us pass over and see this bungler at work. Shaping consented, and they passed over to the island. Swaylone was not able to see their presence. Shaping stood behind him and breathed thoughts into his soul, so that his music became ten times lovelier, and people listening on that shore went mad with sick delight. "'Can any strains be nobler?' demanded Shaping. Crag grinned and said, "'You are naturally effeminate. Now let me try.' Then he stood behind Swaylone and shot ugly discords fast into his head. His instrument was so cracked that never since has it played right. From that time forth Swaylone could utter only distorted music. Yet it called to folk more than the other sort. Many men crossed over to the island during his lifetime to listen to the amazing tones, but none could endure them. All died. After Swaylone's death another musician took up the tale, and so the light has passed down from torch to torch, till now Earthrid bears it." "'An interesting legend,' commented Maskell. "'But who is Crag?" "'They say that when the world was born Crag was born with it, a spirit compounded of those vestiges of muspel which Shaping did not know how to transform. Thereafter nothing has gone right with the world, for he dogs Shaping's footsteps everywhere, and whatever the latter does, he undoes. To love he joins death, to sex shame, to intellect madness, to virtue cruelty, and to fair exteriors bloody entrails. These are Crag's actions, so the lovers of the world call him devil. They don't understand, Maskell, that without him the world would lose its beauty." "'Crag and beauty!' exclaimed he with a cynical smile. "'Even so. That same beauty which you and I are now voyaging to discover, that beauty for whose sake I am renouncing husband, children, and happiness, did you imagine beauty to be so pleasant?' "'Surely. That pleasant beauty is an insipid compound of shaping. To see beauty in its terrible purity you must tear away the pleasure from it." "'Did you say I am going to seek beauty, Glemiel? Such an idea is far from my mind.' She did not respond to his remark. After waiting for a few minutes to hear if she would speak again, he turned his back on her once more. There was no more talk until they reached the island. The air had grown chill and damp by the time they approached its shores. Branspell was on the point of touching the sea. The island appeared to be some three or four miles in length. There were first of all broad sands, then low dark cliffs, and behind these 
a wilderness of insignificant, swelling hills, entirely devoid of vegetation. The current bore them to within a hundred yards of the coast, when it made a sharp angle and proceeded to skirt the length of the island. Glamil jumped overboard and began swimming to shore. Masco followed her example, and the raft, abandoned, was rapidly borne away by the current. They soon touched ground and were able to wade the rest of the way. By the time they reached dry land, the sun had set. Glamil made straight for the hills, and Masco, after casting a single glance at the low, dim outline of the womb flash forest, followed her. The cliffs were soon scrambled up. Then the ascent was gentle and easy, while the rich, dry brown mold was good to walk upon. A little way off, on their left, something white was shining. "'You need not go to it,' said the woman. "'It can be nothing else than one of those skeletons Pole Crab talked about. And look, there is another one over there.' "'This brings it home,' remarked Maskell, smiling. "'There is nothing comical in having died for beauty.' said Glamil, bending her brows at him. And when in the course of their walk he saw the innumerable human bones, from gleaming white to dirty yellow, lying scattered about, as if it were a naked graveyard among the hills, he agreed with her, and fell into a somber mood. It was still light when they reached the highest point, and could set eyes on the other side. The sea to the north of the island was in no way different from that which they had crossed but its lively colors were fast becoming invisible. "'That is matter-play,' said the woman, pointing her finger toward some low land on the horizon, which seemed to be even farther off than womb-flash. "'I wonder how Digrung passed over,' meditated Maskell. Not far away, in a hollow enclosed by a circle of little hills, they saw a small circular lake, not more than half a mile in diameter. The sunset colors of the sky were reflected in its waters. "'That must be Iron Tick,' remarked Glemio. "'What is that?' "'I have heard that it's the instrument Earthrid plays on.' "'We are getting close,' responded he. "'Let us go and investigate.' When they drew nearer, they observed that a man was reclining on the farther side in an attitude of sleep. "'If that's not the man himself, who can it be?' said Maskell. Let's get across the water, if it will bear us. It will save us time." He now assumed the lead and took running strides down the slope which bounded the lake on that side. Glemio followed him with greater dignity, keeping her eyes fixed on the recumbent man as if fascinated. When Maskell reached the water's edge he tried it with one foot, to discover if it would carry his weight. Something unusual in its appearance led him to have doubts. It was a tranquil, dark, and beautifully reflecting sheet of water. It resembled a mirror of liquid metal. Finding that it would bear him and that nothing happened, he placed his second foot on its surface. Instantly he sustained a violent shock throughout his body, as from a powerful electric current, and he was hurled in a tumbled heap back onto the bank. He picked himself up brushed the dirt off his person, and started walking around the lake. Glemiel joined him, and they completed the half-circuit together. They came to the man, and Masco prodded him with his foot. He woke up and blinked at them. His face was pale, weak, and vacant-looking, and had a disagreeable expression. There were thin sprouts of black hair on his chin and head. On his forehead, in place of a third eye, he possessed a perfectly circular organ, with elaborate convolutions, like an ear. He had an unpleasant smell. He appeared to be of young middle age. "'Wake up, man,' said Maskell sharply, "'and tell us if you are Earthred.' "'What time is it?' counter-questioned the man. "'Does it want long to moonrise?' Without appearing to care about an answer, he sat up and, turning away from them, began to scoop up the loose soil with his hand and to eat it half-heartedly. "'Now how can you eat that filth?' demanded Muskell in disgust. "'Don't be angry, Maskell,' said Glemiel, laying hold of his arm and flushing a little. "'It is Earthrid, the man who is to help us.' "'He has not said so.' 
"'I am Earthrid,' said the other, in his weak and muffled voice, which, however, suddenly struck Maskell as being autocratic. "'What do you want here? Or rather, you had better get away as quickly as you can, for it will be too late when Tiergeld rises.' "'You need not explain,' exclaimed Maskell. "'We know your reputation, and we have come to hear your music. But what's that organ for on your forehead?' Earthred glared and smiled and glared again. "'That is for rhythm, which is what changes noise into music. Don't stand and argue, but go away. It is no pleasure to me to people the island with corpses. They corrupt the air and do nothing else.' Darkness now crept swiftly on over the landscape. "'You are rather big-mouthed,' said Maskell coolly. But after we have heard you play, perhaps I shall adventure a tune myself. You, are you a musician, then? Do you even know what music is?" A flame danced in Glemiel's eyes. "'Masco thinks music reposes in the instrument,' she said in her intense way. "'But it is the soul of the master.' "'Yes,' said Earthred, "'but that is not all. I will tell you what it is. In Thriel, where I was born and brought up, we learn the mystery of the three in nature. This world, which lies extended before us, has three directions. Length is the line which shuts off what is, from what is not. Breadth is the surface which shows us in what manner one thing of what is lies with another thing. Depth is the path which leads from what is to our own body. In music it is not otherwise. Tone is existence without which nothing at all can be. Symmetry and numbers are the manner in which tones exist, one with another. Emotion is the movement of our soul toward the wonderful world that is being created. Now men, when they make music, are accustomed to build beautiful tones, because of the delight they cause. Therefore their music world is based on pleasure. Its symmetry is regular and charming, its emotion is sweet and lovely. But my music is founded on painful tones, and thus its symmetry is wild and difficult to discover, its emotion is bitter and terrible. If I had not anticipated its being original, I would not have come here," said Maskell. Still, explain. Why can't harsh tones have simple symmetry of form, and why must they necessarily cause more profound emotions in us who listen? Pleasures may harmonize, pains must clash, and in the order of their clashing lies the symmetry. The emotions follow the music, which is rough and earnest. You may call it music," remarked Maskell thoughtfully, but to me it bears a closer resemblance to actual life. If Shaping's plans had gone straight, life would have been like that other sort of music. He who seeks can find traces of that intention in the world of nature. But as it has turned out, real life resembles my music, and mine is the true music. Shall we see living shapes?" "'I don't know what my mood will be,' returned Earthrid. "'But when I have finished, you shall adventure your tune, and produce whatever shapes you please. Unless, indeed, the tune is out of your own big body.' "'The shocks you are preparing may kill us,' said Glemiel in a low, taut voice. "'But we shall die seeing beauty. Earthred looked at her with a dignified expression. Neither you nor any other person can endure the thoughts which I put into my music. Still, you must have it your own way. It needed a woman to call it beauty. But if this is beauty, what is ugliness? That I can tell you, master, replied Glemiel, smiling at him. Ugliness is old, stale life while yours every night issues fresh from the womb of nature." Earthred stared at her, without response. "'Tyrgeld is rising,' 
he said at last, and now you shall see, though not for long." As the words left his mouth, the full moon peeped over the hills in the dark eastern sky. They watched it in silence, and soon it was wholly up. It was larger than the moon of earth, and seemed nearer. Its shadowy part stood out in just as strong relief, but somehow it did not give Maskell the impression of being a dead world. Brantspell shone on the whole of it, but Alpine only on a part. The broad crescent that reflected Brantspell's rays alone was white and brilliant, but the part that was illuminated by both suns shone with a greenish radiance that had almost solar power, and yet was cold and cheerless. On gazing in that combined light, he felt the same sense of disintegration that the afterglow of Alpine had always caused in him, but now the feeling was not physical, but merely aesthetic. The moon did not appear romantic to him, but disturbing and mystical. Earthrid rose and stood quietly for a minute. In the bright moonlight his face seemed to have undergone a change. It lost its loose, weak, disagreeable look, and acquired a sort of crafty grandeur. He clapped his hands together meditatively two or three times, and walked up and down. The others stood together, watching him. Then he sat down by the side of the lake, and, leaning on his side, placed his right hand, open palm downward, on the ground, at the same time stretching out his right leg, so that the foot was in contact with the water. While Maskell was in the act of staring at him and at the lake, he felt a stabbing sensation right through his heart, as though he had been pierced by a rapier. He barely recovered himself from falling, and as he did so, he saw that a spout had formed on the water and was now subsiding again. The next moment he was knocked down by a violent blow in the mouth, delivered by an invisible hand. He picked himself up, and observed that a second spout had formed. No sooner was he on his legs than a hideous pain hammered away inside his brain, as if caused by a malignant tumor. In his agony he stumbled and fell again, this time on the arm Cragg had wounded. All his other mishaps were forgotten in this one, which half stunned him. It lasted only a moment, and then sudden relief came, and he found that Earthrid's rough music had lost its power over him. He saw him still stretched out in the same position. Spouts were coming thick and fast on the lake, which was full of lively motion. But Glemiel was not on her legs. She was lying on the ground, in a heap, without moving. Her attitude was ugly, and he guessed she was dead. When he reached her, he discovered that she was dead. In what state of mind she had died, he did not know, for her face wore the vulgar Crystalman grin. The whole tragedy had not lasted five minutes. He went over to Earthrid and dragged him forcibly away from his playing. "'You have been as good as your word, musician,' he said. "'Glemiel is dead.' Earthrid tried to collect his scattered senses. "'I warned her,' he replied, sitting up. Did I not beg her to go away? But she died very easily. She did not wait for the beauty she spoke about. She heard nothing of the passion, nor even of the rhythm. Neither have you." Maska looked down at him in indignation, but said nothing. "'You should not have interrupted me,' went on Earthrid. "'When I am playing, nothing else is of importance. I might have lost the thread of my ideas. Fortunately, I never forget. I shall start over again." If music is to continue, in the presence of the dead, I play next. The man glanced up quickly. That can't be. It must be, said Maskell decisively. I prefer playing to listening. Another reason is that you will have every night but I have only tonight." Earthred clenched and unclenched his fist, and began to turn pale. "'With your recklessness you are likely to kill us both. Iron Tick belongs to me, and until you have learned how to play you would only break the instrument.' 
Well, then, I will break it. But I am going to try." The musician jumped to his feet and confronted him. "'Do you intend to take it from me by violence?' "'Keep calm. You will have the same choice that you offered us. I shall give you time to go away somewhere.' "'How will that serve me if you spoil my lake? You don't understand what you are doing.' "'Go or stay.' responded Maskell. I give you till the water gets smooth again. After that, I begin playing." Earthrid kept swallowing. He glanced at the lake and back to Maskell. "'Do you swear it?' "'How long that will take, you know better than I. But till then, you are safe.' Earthrid cast him a look of malice, hesitated for an instant, and then moved away and started to climb the nearest hill. Halfway up he glanced over his shoulder apprehensively, as if to see what was happening. In another minute or so he had disappeared over the crest, travelling in the direction of the shore that faced Matterplay. Later, when the water was once more tranquil, Maskell sat down by its edge, in imitation of Earthrid's attitude. He knew neither how to set about producing his music nor what would come of it. But audacious projects entered his brain and he willed to create physical shapes, and above all one shape, that of Surtur. Before putting his foot to the water, he turned things over a little in his mind. He said, What themes are in common music, shapes are in this music. The composer does not find his theme by picking out single notes but the whole theme flashes into his mind by inspiration. So it must be with shapes. When I start playing, if I am worth anything, the undivided ideas will pass from my unconscious mind to this lake, and then, reflected back in the dimensions of reality, I shall be, for the first time, made acquainted with them. So it must be. The instant his foot touched the water, he felt his thoughts flowing from him. He did not know what they were, but the mere act of flowing created a sensation of joyful mastery. With this was curiosity to learn what they would prove to be. Spouts formed on the lake in increasing numbers, but he experienced no pain. His thoughts, which he knew to be music, did not issue from him in a steady, unbroken stream, but in great, rough gushes, succeeding intervals of quiescence. When these gushes came, the whole lake broke out in an eruption of spouts. He realized that the ideas passing from him did not arise in his intellect, but had their source in the fathomless depths of his will. He could not decide what character they should have, but he was able to force them out or retard them by the exercise of his volition. At first nothing changed around him. Then the moon grew dimmer, and a strange new radiance began to illuminate the landscape. It increased so imperceptibly that it was some time before he recognized it as the muspel light which he had seen in the womb-flash forest. He could not give it a color or a name but it filled him with a sort of stern and sacred awe. He called up the resources of his powerful will. The spouts thickened like a forest, and many of them were twenty feet high. Tyrgel looked faint and pale. The radiance became intense, but it cast no shadows. The wind got up, but where Maskell was sitting it was calm. Shortly afterward it began to shriek and whistle like a full gale. He saw no shapes and redoubled his efforts. His ideas were now rushing out onto the lake so furiously that his whole soul was possessed by exhilaration and defiance. But still he did not know their nature. A huge spout shot up, and at the same moment the hills began to crack and break. Great masses of loose soil were erupted from their bowels and in the next period of quietness he saw that the landscape had altered. Still the mysterious light intensified. The moon disappeared entirely. The noise of the unseen tempest was terrifying, 
but Maskell played heroically on, trying to urge out ideas which would take shape. The hillsides were cleft with chasms. The water escaping from the tops of the spouts swamped the land, but where he was it was dry. The radiance grew terrible. It was everywhere, but Maskell fancied that it was far brighter in one particular quarter. He thought that it was becoming localized, preparatory to contracting into a solid form. He strained and strained. Immediately afterward the bottom of the lake subsided. Its waters fell through, and his instrument was broken. The muspel light vanished. The moon shone out again, but Maskell could not see it. After that unearthly shining he seemed to himself to be in total blackness. The screaming wind ceased. There was a dead silence. His thoughts finished flowing toward the lake, and his foot no longer touched water, but hung in space. He was too stunned by the suddenness of the change to either think or feel. While he was still lying dazed, a vast explosion occurred in the newly opened depths beneath the lake-bed. The water in its descent had met fire. Maskell was lifted bodily in the air, many yards high, and came down heavily. He lost consciousness. When he came to his senses again, he saw everything. Tiergeld was gleaming brilliantly. He was lying by the side of the old lake, but it was now a crater, to the bottom of which his eyes could not penetrate. The hills encircling it were torn, as if by heavy gunfire. A few thunderclouds were floating in the air at no great height, from which branched lightning descended to the earth incessantly, accompanied by alarming and singular crashes. He got on his legs and tested his actions. Finding that he was uninjured, he first of all viewed the crater at closer quarters, and then started to walk painfully toward the northern shore. When he had attained the crest above the lake, the landscape sloped gently down for two miles to the sea. Everywhere he passed through traces of his rough work. The country was carved into scarps, grooves, channels, and craters. He arrived at the line of low cliffs overlooking the beach, and found that these also were partly broken down by landslips. He got down onto the sand and stood looking over the moonlit, agitated sea wondering how he could contrive to escape from this island of failure. Then he saw Earthrid's body, lying quite close to him. It was on its back. Both legs had been violently torn off and he could not see them anywhere. Earthrid's teeth were buried in the flesh of his right forearm, indicating that the man had died in unreasoning physical agony. The skin gleamed green in the moonlight, but it was stained by darker discolorations which were wounds. The sand about him was dyed by the pool of blood which had long since filtered through. Maskell left the corpse in dismay and walked a long way along the sweet-smelling shore. Sitting down on a rock, he waited for daybreak. End of chapter 15